Chapter fourteen of a short life of Abraham Lincoln. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Allison Hester of Athens, Georgia. A short life of Abraham Lincoln by John G. Nicolay. Chapter fourteen president's proclamation calling for seventy-five regiments responses of the governors maryland and virginia the baltimore riot washington isolated lincoln takes the responsibility robert e lee arrival of the new york seventh suspension of habeas corpus the annapolis route butler in baltimore taney on the merriman case kentucky missouri Lyon Captures Camp Jackson, Boonville Skirmish, The Missouri Convention, Gamble Made Governor, The Border States. The bombardment of Fort Sumter changed the political situation as if by magic. There was no longer room for doubt, hesitation, concession, or compromise. Without awaiting the arrival of the ships that were bringing provisions to Anderson's starving garrison, the hostile Charleston batteries had opened their fire on the fort by the formal order of the Confederate government, and peaceable secession was, without provocation, changed to active war. The rebels gained possession of the Charleston Harbor, but their mode of obtaining it awakened the patriotism of the American people to a stern determination that the insult to the national authority and flag should be redressed, and the unrighteous experiment of a rival government founded on slavery as its cornerstone should never succeed. Under the conflict, thus began the long-tolerated barbarous institution itself was destined ignobly to perish on his journey from springfield to washington mr lincoln had said that devoted as he was to peace he might find it necessary quote, to put the foot down firmly end quote. that time had now come on the morning of April 15, 1861, the leading newspapers of the country printed the President's proclamation, reciting that, whereas the laws of the United States were opposed and the execution thereof obstructed in the states of South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Florida, Mississippi, Louisiana, and Texas, by combinations too powerful to be suppressed by the ordinary course of judicial proceedings, the militia of the several states of the Union, to the aggregate number of 75,000, was called forth to suppress said combinations and cause the laws to be duly executed. The orders of the War Department specify that the period of service under this call should be for three months and to further conform to the provisions of the act of 1795 under which the call was issued the president's proclamation also convened the congress in special session on the coming fourth of july public opinion in the free states which had been sadly demoralized by the long discussions over slavery and by the existence of four factions in the late presidential campaign was instantly crystallized and consolidated by the sumter bombardment and the president's proclamation into a sentiment of united support to the government for the suppression of rebellion the several free state governors sent loyal and enthusiastic responses to the call for militia and tendered double the numbers asked for the people of the slave states which had not yet joined the montgomery confederacy namely virginia north carolina tennessee arkansas missouri kentucky maryland and delaware remained however more or less divided on the issue as it now presented itself the governors of the first six of these were already so much engaged in the secret intrigues of the secession movement that they sent the secretary of war contumacious and insulting replies and distinct refusals to the president's call for troops the governor of delaware answered that there was no organized militia in his state which he had legal authority to command 
but that the officers of organized volunteer regiments might, at their own option, offer their services to the United States, while the governor of Maryland, in complying with the requisition, stipulated that the regiments from his state should not be required to serve outside its limits except to defend the District of Columbia. A swift almost bewildering rush of events, however, quickly compelled most of them to take sides. Secession feeling was rampant in Baltimore, and when the first armed and equipped northern regiment, the Massachusetts 6th, passed through that city on the morning of April 19th on its way to Washington, the last four of its companies were assailed by street mobs with missiles and firearms while marching from one depot to the other and in the running fight which ensued four of its soldiers were killed and about thirty wounded while the mob probably lost two or three times as many this tragedy instantly threw the whole city into a wild frenzy of insurrection that same afternoon an immense secession meeting in monument square listened to a torrent of treasonable protest and denunciation in which governor hicks himself was made momentarily to join the militia was called out preparations were made to arm the city and that night the railroad bridges were burned between baltimore and the pennsylvania line to prevent the further transit of union regiments the revolutionary furor spread to the country towns, and for a whole week the Union flag practically disappeared from Maryland. While these events were taking place to the north, equally threatening incidents were occurring to the south of Washington. The state of Virginia had been, for many weeks, balancing uneasily between loyalty and succession. In the new revolutionary stress, her weak remnant of conditional unionism gave way and on april seventeenth two days after the president's call her state convention secretly passed a secession ordinance while governor letcher ordered a military seizure of the united states navy yard at norfolk and the united states armory at harper's ferry under orders from washington both establishments were burned to prevent their falling into insurrectionary hands but the destruction in each case was only partial and much valuable war material thus passed to rebel uses all these hostile occurrences put the national capital in the greatest danger for three days it was entirely cut off from communication with the north by either telegraph or mail under the orders of general scott the city was hastily prepared for a possible siege the flour at the mills and other stores of provisions were taken possession of. The capital and other public buildings were barricaded, and detachments of troops stationed in them. Business was suspended by a common impulse. Streets were almost deserted except by squads of military patrol. Shutters of stores, and even many residences, remained unopened throughout the day. The signs were none too reassuring. In addition to the public rumors whispered about by serious faces on the streets, General Scott reported in writing to President Lincoln on the evening of April 22nd, Of rumors, the following are probable. First, that from 1,500 to 2,000 troops are at the White House, four miles below Mount Vernon, a narrow point in the Potomac engaged in erecting a battery second that an equal force is collected or in progress of assemblage on the two sides of the river to attack fort washington and third that extra cars went up yesterday to bring down from harper's ferry about two thousand other troops to join in a general attack on this capital that is on many of its fronts at once I feel confident that with our present forces we can defend the Capitol, the Arsenal, and all the executive buildings, seven, against 10,000 troops not better than our district volunteers. Throughout this crisis, President Lincoln not only maintained his composure, but promptly assumed the high responsibilities the occasion demanded. On Sunday, April 21st, 
he summoned his cabinet to meet at the navy department and with their unanimous concurrence issued a number of emergency orders relating to the purchase of ships the transportation of troops and munitions of war the advance of two million dollars of money to a union safety committee in new york and other military and naval measures which were dispatched in duplicate by private messengers over unusual and circuitous routes in a message to congress in which he afterward explained these extraordinary transactions he said quote, it became necessary for me to choose whether using only the existing means agencies and processes which congress had provided i should let the government fall at once into ruin or whether availing myself on the broader powers conferred by the constitution in cases of insurrection i would make an effort to save it with all its blessings for the present age and for posterity End quote. Unwelcome as was the thought of a possible capture of Washington City, President Lincoln's mind was much more disturbed by many suspicious indications of disloyalty in public officials, and especially in officers of the Army and Navy. Hundreds of clerks of Southern birth employed in the various departments suddenly left their desks and went south. The commandment of the Washington Navy Yard and the quartermaster general of the army resigned their positions to take service under jefferson davis one morning the captain of a light battery on which general scott had placed special reliance for the defense of washington came to the president at the white house to asseverate and protest his loyalty and fidelity and that same night secretly left his post and went to richmond to become a confederate officer the most prominent case, however, was that of Colonel Robert E. Lee, the officer who captured John Brown at Harper's Ferry and who afterward became the leader of the Confederate armies. As a lieutenant, he had served on the staff of General Scott in the war with Mexico. Personally knowing his ability, Scott recommended him to Lincoln as the most suitable officer to command the Union Army about to be assembled under the President's call for 75 regiments, and this command was informally tendered him through a friend. Lee, however, declined the offer, explaining that, quote, Though opposed to secession and deprecating war, I could take no part in an invasion of the southern states, end quote. He resigned his commission in a letter written on April 20th, and without waiting for notice of its acceptance, which alone could discharge him from his military obligation, proceeded to Richmond, where he was formally and publicly invested with the command of the Virginia military and naval forces on April 22nd. While two days later, the rebel vice president, Alexander H. Stevens, and a committee of the Richmond Convention signed a formal military league, making Virginia an immediate member of the Confederate States, and placing her armies under the command of Jefferson Davis. The sudden uprising in Maryland and the insurrectionary activity in Virginia had been largely stimulated by the dream of the leading conspirators that their new confederacy would combine all the slave states, and that by the adhesion of both Maryland and Virginia, they would fall heir to a ready-made seat of government. While the bombardment of Sumter was in progress, the rebel secretary of war, announcing the news in a jubilant speech at Montgomery, in the presence of Jefferson Davis and his colleagues, confidently predicted that the rebel flag would, before the end of May, quote, float over the dome of the Capitol at Washington, end quote. The disloyal demonstrations in Maryland and Virginia rendered such a hope so plausible that Jefferson Davis telegraphed to Governor Letcher at Richmond that he was preparing to send him 13 regiments, and added, quote, Sustain Baltimore if practicable. We reinforce you, end quote, while Senator Mason hurried to that city personally to furnish advice and military assistance. But the flattering expectation was not realized. The requisite preparation and concert of action were both wanting. The Union troops from New York and New England, pouring into Philadelphia, 
flanked the obstructions of the Baltimore route by devising a new one by way of Chesapeake Bay and Annapolis. And the opportune arrival of the 7th Regiment of New York in Washington on April 25th rendered that city entirely safe against surprise or attack, relieved the apprehension of officials and citizens, and renewed its business and public activity. The mob frenzy of Baltimore and the Maryland towns subsided almost as quickly as it had risen. The Union leaders and newspapers asserted themselves and soon demonstrated their superiority in numbers and activity. Serious embarrassment had been created by the timidity of Governor Hicks, who, while Baltimore remained under mob terrorism, officially protested against the landing of Union troops at Annapolis. And, still worse, summoned the Maryland legislature to meet on April 26, a step which he had theretofore stubbornly refused to take. This event had become doubly dangerous because a Baltimore City election held during the same terror week had reinforced the legislature with ten secession members, creating a majority eager to pass a secession ordinance at the first opportunity. The question of either arresting or dispersing the body by military force was one of the problems which the crisis forced upon President Lincoln. On full reflection, he decided against either measure. I think it would not be justifiable, he wrote to General Scott, nor efficient for the desired object. First, they have a clearly legal right to assemble and we cannot know in advance that their action will not be lawful and peaceful, and if we wait until they shall have acted, their arrest or dispersion will not lessen the effect of their action. Secondly, we cannot permanently prevent their action. If we arrest them, we cannot long hold them as prisoners, and when liberated, they will immediately reassemble and take their action and precisely the same if we simply disperse them. They will immediately reassemble in some other place. I therefore conclude that it is only left to the commanding general to watch and await their action, which, if it shall be to arm their people against the United States, he is to adopt the most prompt and efficient means to counteract, even if necessary, to the bombardment of their cities, and, in the extremest necessity, the suspension of the writ of habeas corpus. End quote. Two days later, the President formally authorized General Scott to suspend the writ of habeas corpus along his military lines or in their vicinity. If resistance should render it necessary, Arrivals of additional troops enabled the general to strengthen his military hold on Annapolis and the railroads, and on May 13th, General B. F. Butler, with about 1,000 men, moved into Baltimore and established a fortified camp on Federal Hill, the bulk of his force being the 6th Massachusetts, which had been mobbed in that city on April 19th. Already on the previous day, the bridges and railroad had been repaired, and the regular transit of troops through the city reestablished. Under these changing conditions, the secession majority of the Maryland legislature did not venture on any official treason. They sent a committee to interview the president, vented their hostility in spiteful reports and remonstrances, and prolonged their session by a recess. Nevertheless, so inveterate was their disloyalty and plotting against the authority of the Union that four months later it became necessary to place the leaders under arrest, finally to head off their darling project of a Maryland secession ordinance. One additional incidence of this insurrectionary period remains to be noticed. One John Merriman, claiming to be a Confederate lieutenant, was arrested in Baltimore for enlisting men for the rebellion, and Chief Justice Taney of the United States Supreme Court, the famous author of the Dred Scott decision, issued a writ of habeas corpus to obtain his release from Fort McHenry. Under the President's orders, General Cadwallader, of course, declined to obey the writ. Upon this, 
the chief justice ordered the general's arrest for contempt but the officer sent to serve the writ was refused entrance to the fort in turn the indignant chief justice taking counsel of his passion instead of his patriotism announced dogmatically that quote, the president under the constitution and laws of the united states cannot suspend the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus nor authorize any military officer to do so End quote. and some weeks afterward filed a long written opinion in support of this dictum it is unnecessary here to quote the opinions of several eminent jurists who successfully refuted his labored argument nor to repeat the vigorous analysis with which in his special message to congress of july fourth president lincoln vindicated his own authority while these events were occurring in maryland and virginia the remaining slave states were gradually taking sides some for others against rebellion under radical and revolutionary leadership similar to that of the cotton states the governors and state officials of north carolina tennessee and arkansas placed their states in an attitude of insurrection and before the middle of may practically joined them to the confederate government by the formalities of military leagues and secession ordinances but in the border slave states that is those contiguous to the free states the eventual result was different in these though secession intrigue and sympathy were strong and though their governors and state officials favored the rebellion the underlying loyalty and unionism of the people thwarted their revolutionary schemes this happened even in the northwestern part of virginia itself the 48 counties of that state lying north of the alleghanies and adjoining pennsylvania and ohio repudiated the action at richmond seceded from secession and established a loyal provisional state government president lincoln recognized them and sustained them with military aid and in due time they became organized and admitted to the union as the state of west virginia in delaware though some degree of secession feeling existed it was too insignificant to produce any noteworthy public demonstration in kentucky the political struggle was deep and prolonged the governor twice called the legislature together to initiate secession proceedings but that body refused compliance and warded off his scheme by voting to maintain the state neutrality next the governor sought to utilize the military organization known as the state guard to effect his object the union leaders offset this movement by enlisting several volunteer union regiments at the june election nine union congressmen were chosen and only one secessionist while in august a new legislature was elected with a three-fourths union majority in each branch other secession intrigues proved equally abortive and when finally in september confederate armies invaded kentucky at three different points the kentucky legislature invited the union armies of the west into the state to expel them and voted to place forty thousand union volunteers at the service of president lincoln in missouri the struggle was more fierce but also more brief as far back as january the conspirators had perfected a scheme to obtain possession through the treachery of the officer in charge of the important jefferson barracks arsenal at st louis with its store of sixty thousand stand of arms and a million and a half cartridges the project however failed rumors of the danger came to general scott who ordered thither a company of regulars under the command of captain nathaniel lyon an officer not only loyal by nature and habit but also imbued with strong anti-slavery convictions lyon found valuable support in the watchfulness of a union safety committee composed of leading st louis citizens who secretly organized a number of union regiments recruited largely from the heavy german population and from these sources lyon was enabled to make such a show of available military force 
as effectively to deter any mere popular uprising to seize the arsenal. A state convention, elected to pass a secession ordinance, resulted, unexpectedly to the conspirators, in the return of a majority of Union delegates, who voted down the secession program and adjourned to the following December. Thereupon, the secession governor ordered his state militia into temporary camps of instruction, with the idea of taking Missouri out of the Union by a concerted military movement. One of these encampments, established at St. Louis and named Camp Jackson in honor of the governor, furnished such unquestionable evidences of intended treason that Captain Lyon, whom President Lincoln had meanwhile authorized to enlist 10,000 Union volunteers, and if necessary, to proclaim martial law, made a sudden march upon Camp Jackson with his regulars and six of his newly enlisted regiments, stationed his force in commanding positions around the camp, and demanded its surrender. The demand was complied with, after but slight hesitation, and the captured militia regiments were, on the following day, disbanded under parole. Unfortunately, as the prisoners were being marched away, a secession mob insulted and attacked some of Lyon's regiments and provoked a return fire, in which about twenty persons, mainly lookers-on, were killed or wounded and for a day or two the city was thrown into the panic and lawlessness of a reign of terror upon this the legislature in session at jefferson city the capital of the state with a three-fourths secession majority rushed through the forms of legislation a military bill placing the military and financial resources of missouri under the governor's control for a month longer, various incidents delayed the culmination of the approaching struggle, each side continuing its preparations and constantly accentuating the rising antagonism. The crisis came when, on June 11th, Governor Jackson and Captain Lyon, now made Brigadier General by the President, met in an interview at St. Louis. In this interview, the governor demanded that he be permitted to exercise sole military command to maintain the neutrality of Missouri, while Lyon insisted that the federal military authority must be left in unrestricted control. It being impossible to reach any agreement, Governor Jackson hurried back to his capital, burning railroad bridges behind him as he went. And on the following day, June 12th, issued his proclamation calling out 50,000 state militia and denouncing the Lincoln administration as, quote, an unconstitutional military despotism, end quote. Lyon was also prepared for this contingency. On the afternoon of June 13th, he embarked with a regular battery and several battalions of his Union volunteers on steamboats, moved rapidly up the Missouri River to Jefferson City, drove the governor and the secession legislature into precipitate flight, took possession of the capital, and, continuing his expedition, scattered, after a slight skirmish, a small rebel military force, which had hastily collected at Boonville. Rapidly following these events, the loyal members of the Missouri State Convention, which had in February refused to pass a secession ordinance, were called together and passed ordinances under which was constituted a loyal state government that maintained the local civil authority of the United States throughout the greater part of Missouri during the whole of the Civil War, only temporarily interrupted by invasions of transient Confederate armies from Arkansas. It will be seen from the foregoing outline that the original hope of the Southern leaders to make the Ohio River the northern boundary of their slave empire was not realized. They indeed secured the adhesion of Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee, and Arkansas, by which the territory of the Confederate States government was enlarged nearly one-third, and its population and resources nearly doubled. But the northern tier of slave states, Maryland, West Virginia, Kentucky, and Missouri not only decidedly refused to join the rebellion, but remained true to the Union, and this reduced the contest to a trial of military strength between 11 states, 
with 5,115,790 whites and 3,508,131 slaves against 24 states with 21,611,422 whites and 342,212 slaves and at least a proportionate difference in all other resources of war. At the very outset, the conditions were prophetic of the result. End of chapter 14 Chapter 15 of A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Allison Hester of Athens, Georgia. A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln by John G. Nicolay. Chapter 15. Davis's Proclamation for Privateers. Lincoln's Proclamation of Blockade, The Call for Three Years' Volunteers, Southern Military Preparations, Rebel Capital Moved to Richmond, Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee, and Arkansas Admitted to Confederate States, Desertion of Army and Navy Officers, Union Troops Fortify Virginia Short of the Potomac, Concentration at Harper's Ferry, Concentration at Fortress Monroe and Cairo. English Neutrality. Seward's 21st of May. Dispatch. Lincoln's Corrections. Preliminary Skirmishes. Forward to Richmond. Plan of McDowell's Campaign. From the slower political developments in the border slave states, we must return and follow up the primary hostilities of the rebellion. The bombardment of Sumter, President Lincoln's call for troops, the Baltimore riot, the burning of Harper's Ferry Armory and Norfolk Navy Yard, and the interruption of railroad communication, which, for nearly a week, isolated the capital and threatened it with siege and possible capture, fully demonstrated the beginning of serious civil war. Jefferson Davis's proclamation on April 17th of intention to issue letters of Mark was met two days later by President Lincoln's counter-proclamation, instituting a blockade of the southern ports and declaring that privateers would be held amenable to the laws against piracy. His first call for 75,000 three-months militia was dictated as to numbers by the sudden emergency and as to form and term of service by the provisions of the Act of 1795, it needed only a few days to show that this form of enlistment was both cumbrous and inadequate, and the creation of a more powerful army was almost immediately begun. On May 3rd, a new proclamation was issued, calling into service 42,034 three years volunteers, 22,714 enlisted men to add 10 regiments to the regular army, and 18,000 seamen for blockade service, a total immediate increase of 82,748, swelling the entire military establishment to an army of 156,861 and a navy of 25,000. No express authority of law yet existed for these measures, but President Lincoln took the responsibility of ordering them, trusting that Congress would legalize his acts. His confidence was entirely justified. At the special session, which met under his proclamation on the 4th of July, these acts were declared valid, and he was authorized, moreover, to raise an army of a million men and $250 million in money to carry on the war and suppress the rebellion, while other legislation conferred upon him supplementary authority to meet the emergency. Meanwhile, the first effort of the governors of the loyal states was to furnish their quotas under the first call for militia. 
This was easy enough as to men. It required only a few days to fill the regiments and forward them to the state capitals and principal cities. But to arm and equip them for the field on the spur of the moment was a difficult task which involved much confusion and delay, even though existing armories and foundries pushed their work to the utmost and new ones were established. Under the militia call, the governors appointed all the officers required by their respective quotas, from company lieutenant to major general of division, while under the new call for three years' volunteers, their authority was limited to the simple organization of regiments. In the South, war preparation also immediately became active. All the indications are that up to their attack on Sumter, the Southern leaders hoped to effect separation through concession and compromise by the North. That hope, of course, disappeared with South Carolina's opening guns, and the Confederate government made what haste it could to meet the ordeal it dreaded, even while it had provoked it. The rebel Congress was hastily called together and passed acts recognizing war and regulating privateering, admitting Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee, and Arkansas to the Confederate States, authorizing a $50 million loan, practically confiscating debts due from Southern to Northern citizens, and removing the seat of government from Montgomery, Alabama to Richmond, Virginia. Four different calls for Southern volunteers had been made, aggregating 82,000 men, and Jefferson Davis's message now proposed to further organize and hold in readiness an army of 100,000. The work of erecting forts and batteries for defense was being rapidly pushed at all points, on the Atlantic coast, on the Potomac, and on the Mississippi and other western streams. For the present, the Confederates were well supplied with cannon and small arms from the captured navy yards at Norfolk and Pensacola, and the six or eight arsenals located in the south. The martial spirit of their people was roused to the highest enthusiasm, and there was no lack of volunteers to fill the companies and regiments which the Confederate legislators authorized Davis to accept, either by regular calls on state executives in accordance with, or singly in defiance of, their central dogma of states' rights, as he might prefer. The secession of the southern states not only strengthened the rebellion with the arms and supplies stored in the various military and navy depots within their limits, and the fortifications erected for their defense. What was of yet greater help to the revolt, a considerable portion of the officers of the army and navy, perhaps one-third, abandoned the allegiance which they had sworn to the United States, and, under the false doctrine of the state supremacy taught by southern leaders, gave their professional skill and experience to the destruction of the government which had educated and honored them. The defection of Robert E. Lee was a conspicuous example, and his loss to the Union and service to the rebel army cannot easily be measured. So also were the similar cases of Adjutant General Cooper and Quartermaster General Johnston. In gratifying contrast stands the steadfast loyalty and devotion of Lieutenant General Winfield Scott, who, though he was a Virginian and loved his native state, never wavered an instant in his allegiance to the flag he had heroically followed in the War of 1812 and triumphantly planted over the capital of Mexico in 1847. Though unable to take the field, he, as general-in-chief, directed the assembling and first movements of the Union troops. The largest part of the three months' regiments were ordered to Washington City as the most important position in a political and most exposed in a military point of view. The great machine of war, once started, moved, as it always does, by its own inherent energy from arming to concentration, from concentration to skirmish and battle. It was not long before Washington was a military camp. Gradually, the hesitation to invade the sacred soil of the South 
faded out under the stern necessity to forestall an invasion of the equally sacred soil of the north and on may twenty fourth the union regiments in washington crossed the potomac and placed themselves in a great semicircle of formidable earthworks eighteen miles long on the virginia shore from chain bridge to hunting creek below alexandria meanwhile a secondary concentration of force developed itself at harper's ferry forty-nine miles northwest of washington when on april twentieth a union detachment had burned and abandoned the armory at that point it was at once occupied by a handful of rebel militia and immediately thereafter jefferson davis had hurried his regiments thither to sustain or over all baltimore and when that prospect failed it became a rebel camp of instruction afterward as major general patterson collected his pennsylvania quota he turned it toward that point as a probable field of operations as a mere town harper's ferry was unimportant but lying on the potomac and being at the head of the great shenandoah valley down which not only a good turnpike but also an effective railroad ran southeastward to the very heart of the confederacy it was and remained through the entire war a strategical line of the first importance protected as the shenandoah valley was by the main chain of the alleghanies on the west and the blue ridge on the east a part of the eastern quotas had also been hurried to fortress monroe virginia lying at the mouth of chesapeake bay which became and continued an important base for naval as well as military operations in the west even more important than st louis was the little town of cairo lying at the extreme southern end of the state of illinois at the confluence of the ohio river with the mississippi commanding as it did thousands of miles of river navigation in three different directions and being also the southernmost point of the earliest military frontier it had been the first care of general scott to occupy it and indeed it proved itself to be the military key of the whole mississippi valley it was not an easy thing promptly to develop a military policy for the suppression of the rebellion the so-called confederate states of america covered a military field having more than six times the area of great britain with a coastline of over thirty five hundred miles and an interior frontier of over seven thousand miles much less was it possible promptly to plan and set on foot concise military campaigns to reduce the insurgent states to allegiance even the great military genius of general scott was unable to do more than suggest a vague outline for the work the problem was not only too vast but as yet too indefinite since the political future of west virginia kentucky and missouri still hung in more or less uncertainty the passive and negligent attitude which the buchanan administration had maintained toward the insurrection during the whole three months between the presidential election and mr lincoln's inauguration gave the rebellion an immense advantage in the courts and cabinets of europe until within three days of the end of buchanan's term not a word of protest or even explanation was sent to counteract the impression that disunion was likely to become permanent indeed the non-coercion doctrine of buchanan's message was in the eyes of european statesmen equivalent to an acknowledgment of such a result and the formation of the confederate government followed so quickly by the fall of fort sumter seemed to them a practical realization of their forecast the course of events appeared not merely to fulfill their expectations but also in the case of england and france gratified their eager hopes to england it promised cheap cotton and free trade with the south to france 
it appeared to open the way for colonial ambitions which napoleon the third so soon set on foot an imperial scale before charles francis adams whom president lincoln appointed as the new minister to england arrived in london and obtained an interview with lord john russell mr seward had already received several items of disagreeable news one was that prior to his arrival the queen's proclamation of neutrality had been published practically raising the confederate states to the rank of a belligerent power and before they had a single privateer afloat giving these an equality in british ports with united states ships of war another was that an understanding had been reached between england and france which would lead both governments to take the same course as to recognition whatever that course might be third that three diplomatic agents of the confederate states were in london whom the british minister had not yet seen but whom he had caused to be informed that he was not unwilling to see unofficially under the irritation produced by this hasty and equivocal action of the british government mr seward wrote a despatch to mr adams under date of may twenty first which had it been sent in the form of the original draft would scarcely have failed to lead to war between the two nations while it justly set forth with emphasis and courage what the government of the united states would endure and what it would not endure from foreign powers during the southern insurrection its phraseology written in a heat of indignation was so blunt and exasperating as to imply intentional disrespect when mr seward read the document to president lincoln the latter at once perceived its objectionable tone and retained it for further reflection a second reading confirmed his first impression thereupon taking his pen the frontier lawyer in a careful revision of the whole despatch so amended and changed the work of the trained and experienced statesman as entirely to eliminate its offensive crudeness and bring it within all the dignity and reserve of the most studied diplomatic courtesy if after mr seward's remarkable memorandum of april first the secretary of state had needed any further experience to convince him of the president's mastery in both administrative and diplomatic judgment this second incident afforded him the full evidence no previous president had ever had such a sudden increase of official work devolve upon him as president lincoln during the early months of his administration the radical change of parties through which he was elected not only literally filled the white house with applicants for office but practically compelled a wholesale substitution of new appointees for the old to represent the new thought and will of the nation the task of selecting these was greatly complicated by the sharp competition between the heterogeneous elements of which the republican party was composed this work was not half completed when the sumter bombardment initiated active rebellion and precipitated the new difficulty of sifting the loyal from the disloyal and the yet more pressing labor of scrutinizing the organization of the immense new volunteer army called into service by the proclamation of may third mr lincoln used often to say at this period when besieged by claims to appointment that he felt like a man letting rooms at one end of his house while the other end was on fire in addition to this merely routine work was the much more delicate and serious duty of deciding the hundreds of novel questions affecting the constitutional principles and theories of administration the great departments of government especially those of war and navy could not immediately expedite either the supervision or clerical details of this sudden expansion and almost every case of resulting confusion and delay was brought by impatient governors and state officials to the president for complaint and correction volunteers were coming rapidly enough to the various rendezvous in the different states but where were the rations to feed them money to pay them tents to shelter them uniforms to clothe them 
rifles to arm them, officers to drill and instruct them, or transportation to carry them. In this carnival of patriotism, this hurly-burly of organization, the weaknesses as well as the virtues of human nature quickly developed themselves, and there was manifest not only the inevitable friction of personal rivalry, but also the disturbing and baneful effects of occasional falsehood and dishonesty, which could not always be immediately traced to the responsible culprit. It happened in many instances that there were alarming discrepancies between the full paper regiments and brigades reported as ready to start from the state capitals and the actual number of recruits that railroad trains brought to the Washington camps. And Mr. Lincoln several times ironically compared the process to that of a man trying to shovel a bushel of fleas across a barn floor. While the month of May insensibly slipped away amid these preparatory vexations, camps of instruction rapidly grew to small armies at a few principal points, even under such incidental delay and loss, and during June the confronting Union and Confederate forces began to produce the conflicts and casualties of earnest war. As yet, they were both few and unimportant. The assassination of Ellsworth when Alexandria was occupied, a slight cavalry skirmish at Fairfax Courthouse, the rout of a Confederate regiment at Philippi, West Virginia, the blundering leadership through which two Union detachments fired upon each other in the dark at Big Bethel, Virginia, the ambush of a Union railroad train at Vienna Station, and Lyon skirmish, which scattered the first collection of rebels at Boonville, Missouri. Comparatively speaking, all these were trivial in numbers of dead and wounded, the first few drops of blood before the heavy sanguinary showers the future was destined to bring. But the effect upon the public was irritating and painful to a degree entirely out of proportion to their real extent and gravity. The relative loss and gain in these affairs was not greatly unequal. The victories of Philippi and Boonville easily offset the disasters of Big Bethel and Vienna. But the public mind was not yet schooled to patience and to the fluctuating chances of war. The newspapers demanded prompt progress and ample victory as imperatively as they were wont to demand party triumph in politics or achievement in commercial enterprise. Forward to Richmond, repeated the New York Tribune, day after day, and many sheets of lesser note and influence echoed the cry. There seemed, indeed, a certain reason for this clamor, because the period of enlistment of the three months' regiments was already two-thirds gone, and they were not yet all armed and equipped for field service. President Lincoln was fully alive to the need of meeting this popular demand. The special session of Congress was soon to begin, and to it the new administration must look not only to ratify what had been done, but to authorize a large increase of the military force and heavy loans for coming expenses of the war. On June 29th, therefore, he called his cabinet and principal military officers to a council of war at the executive mansion to discuss a more formidable campaign than had yet been planned. General Scott was opposed to such an undertaking at that time. He preferred waiting until autumn, meanwhile organizing and drilling a large army with which to move down the Mississippi and end the war with a final battle at New Orleans. Aside from the obvious military objections to this course, such a procrastination in the present irritation of the public temper was not to be thought of, and the old general gracefully waived his preference and contributed his best judgment to the perfecting of an immediate campaign into Virginia. The Confederate forces in Virginia had been gathered by the orders of General Lee into a defensive position at the Manassas Junction, where a railroad from Richmond and another from Harper's Ferry come together. 
Here, General Beauregard, who had organized and conducted the Sumter bombardment, had command of a total of about 25,000 men which he was drilling. The junction was fortified with some slight field works and 15 heavy guns, supported by a garrison of 2,000, while the main body was camped in a line of seven miles length behind Bull Run, a winding, sluggish stream flowing southeasterly toward the Potomac. The distance was about 32 miles southwest of Washington. Another Confederate force of about 10,000 under General J.E. Johnston was collected at Winchester and Harper's Ferry on the Potomac to guard the entrance to the Shenandoah Valley, and an understanding existed between Johnston and Beauregard that in case either were attacked, the other would come to his aid by the quick railroad transportation between the two places. The new Union plan contemplated that Brigadier General McDowell should march from Washington against Manassas and Bull Run with a force sufficient to beat Beauregard, while General Patterson, who had concentrated the bulk of the Pennsylvania regiments in the neighborhood of Harper's Ferry in numbers nearly or quite double that of his antagonist, should move against Johnston and either fight or hold him so that he could not come to the aid of Beauregard. At the council, McDowell emphasized the danger of such a junction, but General Scott assured him, if Johnston joins Beauregard, he shall have Patterson on his heels. With this understanding, McDowell's movement was ordered to begin on July 9th. End of chapter 15. Chapter 16 of A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Allison Hester of Athens, Georgia. A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln by John G. Nicolay. Chapter 16 Congress the President's Message, Men and Money Voted, The Contraband, Denison Appoints McClellan, Rich Mountain, McDowell, Bull Run, Patterson's Failure, McClellan at Washington. While these preparations for a Virginia campaign were going on, another campaign was also slowly shaping itself in western Virginia. But before either of them reached any decisive results, the 37th Congress, chosen at the presidential election of 1860, met in special session on the 4th of July, 1861, in pursuance of the President's proclamation of April 15th. There being no members present in either branch from the seceded states, the number in each house was reduced nearly one-third. A great change in party feeling was also manifest. No more rampant secession speeches were to be heard. Of the rare instances of men who were yet to join the rebellion, ex-Vice President Breckinridge was the most conspicuous example, and their presence was offset by prominent Southern Unionists like Andrew Johnson of Tennessee and John J. Crittenden of Kentucky. The heated antagonisms which had divided the previous Congress into four clearly defined factions were so far restrained or obliterated by the events of the past four months as to leave but a feeble opposition to the Republican majority now dominant in both branches, which was itself rendered moderate and prudent by the new conditions. The message of President Lincoln was temperate in spirit, but positive and strong in argument. Reciting the secession and rebellion of the Confederate States and their unprovoked assault on Fort Sumter, he continued, quote, Having said to them in the inaugural address, you can have no conflict without being yourselves the aggressors, he took pains not only to keep this declaration good, 
but also to keep the case so free from the power of ingenious sophistry that the world should not be able to misunderstand it by the affair at fort sumter with its surrounding circumstances that point was reached then and thereby the assailants of the government began the conflict of arms without a gun in sight or in expectancy to return their fire save only the few in the fort sent to that harbor years before for their own protection and still ready to give that protection in whatever was lawful this issue embraces more than the fate of these united states it presents to the whole family of man the question whether a constitutional republic or democracy a government of the people by the same people can or cannot maintain its territorial integrity against its own domestic foes with his singular felicity of statement he analyzed and refuted the sophism that secession was lawful and constitutional Quote, this sophism derives much perhaps the whole of its currency from the assumption that there is some omnipotent and sacred supremacy pertaining to a state to each state of our federal union our states have neither more nor less power than that reserved to them in the union by the constitution no one of them ever having been a state out of the union the states have their status in the union and they have no other legal status if they break from this they can only do so against law and by revolution. The Union, and not themselves separately, procured their independence and their liberty. By conquest or purchase, the Union gave each of them whatever of independence or liberty it has. The Union is older than any of the states, and, in fact, it created them as states. Originally, some dependent colonies made the Union, and in turn the union threw off their old dependence for them and made them states such as they are not one of them ever had a state constitution independent of the union a noteworthy point in the message is president lincoln's expression of his abiding confidence in the intelligence and virtue of the people of the united states it may be affirmed said he without extravagance that the free institutions we enjoy have developed the powers and improved the condition of our whole people beyond any example in the world of this we now have a striking and an impressive illustration so large an army as the government has now on foot was never before known without a soldier in it but who has taken his place there of his own free choice but more than this there are many single regiments whose members one and another possess full practical knowledge of all the arts sciences professions and whatever else whether useful or elegant is known in the world and there is scarcely one from which there could not be selected a president a cabinet a congress and perhaps a court abundantly competent to administer the government itself this is essentially a people's contest on the side of the union it is a struggle for maintaining in the world that form and substance of government whose leading object is to elevate the condition of men to lift artificial weights from all shoulders to clear the paths of laudable pursuit for all to afford all an unfettered start and a fair chance in the race of life i am most happy to believe that the plain people understand and appreciate this it is worthy of note that while in this the government's hour of trial large numbers of those in the army and navy who have been favored with the offices have resigned and proved faults to the hand which had pampered them not one common soldier or common sailor is known to have deserted his flag hearty applause greeted that portion of the message which asked for means to make the contest short and decisive and congress acted promptly by authorizing a loan of two hundred fifty million dollars and an army not to exceed one million men all of president lincoln's war measures for which no previous sanction of law existed were duly legalized additional direct income and tariff taxes were laid 
and the force bill of 1795 and various other laws relating to conspiracy piracy unlawful recruiting and kindred topics were amended or passed throughout the whole history of the south by no means the least of the evils entailed by the institution of slavery was the dread of slave insurrections which haunted every master's household and this vague terror was at once intensified by the outbreak of civil war it stands to the lasting credit of the negro race in the united states that the wrongs of their long bondage provoked them to no such crime and that the civil war appears not to have even suggested much less started any organization or attempt but the john brown raid had indicated some possibility of the kind and when the union troops began their movements generals butler in maryland and patterson in pennsylvania moving toward harper's ferry and mcclellan in west virginia in order to reassure non-combatants severely issued orders that all attempts at slave insurrection should be suppressed it was a most pointed and significant warning to the leaders of the rebellion how much more vulnerable the peculiar institution was in war than in peace and that their ill-considered scheme to protect and perpetuate slavery would prove the most potent engine for its destruction the first effect of opening hostilities was to give adventurous or discontented slaves the chance to escape into union camps where even against orders to the contrary they found practical means of protection or concealment for the sake of the help they could render as cooks servants or teamsters or for the information they could give or obtain or the invaluable service they could render as guides practically therefore at the very beginning the war created a bond of mutual sympathy based on mutual helpfulness between the southern negro and the union volunteer and as fast as the union troops advanced and secession masters fled more or less slaves found liberation and refuge in the union camps at some points indeed this tendency created an embarrassment to the union commanders a few days after general butler assumed command of the union troops at fortress monroe the agent of a rebel master who had fled from the neighborhood came to demand under the provisions of the fugitive slave law three field hands alleged to be in butler's camp butler responded that as virginia claimed to be a foreign country the fugitive slave law was clearly inoperative unless the owner would come and take an oath of allegiance to the united states in connection with this incident the newspaper report stated that as the breastworks and batteries which had been so rapidly erected for confederate defense in every direction on the virginia peninsula were built by enforced negro labor under rigorous military impressment negroes were manifestly contraband of war under international law the dictum was so pertinent and the equity so plain that though it was not officially formulated by the general until two months later it sprang at once into popular acceptance and application and from that time forward the words slave and negro were everywhere within the union lines replaced by the familiar significant term contraband while butler's happy designation had a more convincing influence on public thought than a volume of discussion it did not immediately solve the whole question within a few days he reported that he had slave property to the value of sixty thousand dollars in his hands and by the end of july nine hundred contrabands men women and children of all ages what was their legal status and how should they be disposed of it was a knotty problem for upon its solution might depend the sensitive public opinion and balancing undecided loyalty and political action of the border slave states of maryland west virginia kentucky and missouri in solving the problem president lincoln kept in mind the philosophic maxim of one of his favorite stories 
that when the western methodist presiding elder riding about the circuit during the spring freshets was importuned by his young companion how they should ever be able to get across the swollen waters of the fox river which they were approaching the elder quieted him by saying he had made it the rule of his life never to cross fox river till he came to it the president did not immediately decide but left it to be treated as a question of camp and local police in the discretion of each commander under this theory later in the war some commanders excluded others admitted such fugitives to their camps and the curt formula of general orders we have nothing to do with slaves we are neither negro stealers nor negro catchers was easily construed by subordinate officers to justify the practice of either course for the present butler was instructed not to surrender such fugitives but to employ them in suitable labor and leave the question of their final disposition for future determination congress greatly advanced the problem soon after the battle of bull run by adopting an amendment which confiscated a rebel master's right to his slave when by his consent such slave was employed in service or labor hostile to the united states the debates exhibited but little spirit of partisanship even on this feature of the slavery question the border state members did not attack the justice of such a penalty they could only urge that it was unconstitutional and inexpedient on the general policy of war both houses with but few dissenting votes passed the resolution offered by mr crittenden which declared that the war was not waged for oppression or subjugation or to interfere with the rights or institution of states quote, but to defend and maintain the supremacy of the constitution and to preserve the union with all the dignity equality and rights of the several states unimpaired end quote. the special session adjourned on august sixth having in a single month completed and enacted a thorough and comprehensive system of war legislation the military events that were transpiring in the meanwhile doubtless had their effect in hastening the decision and shortening the labors of congress to command the thirteen regiments of militia furnished by the state of ohio governor dennison had given a commission of major general to george b mcclellan who had been educated at west point and served with distinction in the mexican war and who through unusual opportunities in travel and special duties in surveys and exploration had gained acquirements and qualifications that appeared to fit him for a brilliant career being but thirty-five years old and having reached only the grade of captain he had resigned from the army and was at the moment serving as president of the ohio and mississippi railroad general scott warmly welcomed his appointment to lead the ohio contingent and so industriously facilitated his promotion that by the beginning of june mcclellan's militia commission as a major general had been changed to a commission for the same grade in the regular army and he found himself assigned to the command of a military department extending from western virginia to missouri though this was a leap in military title rank and power which excels the inventions of romance it was necessitated by the sudden exigencies of army expansion over the vast territory bordering the insurrection and for a while seemed justified by the hopeful promise indicated in the young officer's zeal and activity his instructions made it a part of his duty to encourage and support the unionists of western virginia in their political movement to divide the state and erect a union commonwealth out of that portion of it lying northwest of the alleghanies general lee not fully informed of the adverse popular sentiment sent a few confederate regiments into that region to gather recruits and hold the important mountain passes 
McClellan, in turn, advanced a detachment eastward from Wheeling to protect the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, and at the beginning of June, an expedition of two regiments, led by Colonel Kelly, made a spirited dash upon Philippi, where, by a complete surprise, he routed and scattered Porterfield's recruiting detachment of 1,000 Confederates. Following up his initial success, McClellan threw additional forces across the Ohio, and about a month later had the good fortune, on July 11th, by a flank movement under Roscrans to drive a regiment of the enemy out of strong entrenchments on Rich Mountain, force the surrender of the retreating garrison on the following day, July 12th, and to win a third success on the 13th over another flying detachment at Carrick's Ford, one of the crossings of the Cheat River, where the Confederate General Garnet was killed in a skirmish fire between sharpshooters. These incidents, happening on three successive days and in distance 40 miles apart, made a handsome showing for the young department commander when gathered into the single short telegram in which he reported to Washington that Garnet was killed, his force routed, at least 200 of the enemy killed, and seven guns and 1,000 prisoners taken. Our success is complete and secession is killed in this country, concluded the dispatch. The result, indeed, largely overshadowed in importance the means which accomplished it. The Union loss was only 13 killed and 40 wounded. In subsequent effect, these two comparatively insignificant skirmishes permanently recovered the state of West Virginia to the Union. The main credit was, of course, due to the steadfast loyalty of the people of that region. This victory afforded welcome relief to the strained and impatient public opinion of the northern states and sharpened the eager expectation of the authorities at Washington of similar results from the projected Virginia campaign. The organization and command of that column were entrusted to Brigadier General McDowell, advanced to this grade from his previous rank of major. He was 42 years old, an accomplished West Point graduate, and had won distinction in the Mexican War, though since, at that time, he had been mainly engaged in staff duty. On the morning of July 16th, he began his advance from the fortifications of Washington, with a marching column of about 28,000 men and a total of 49 guns an additional division of about 6,000 being left behind to guard his communications. Owing to the rawness of his troops, the first few days' march was necessarily cautious and cumbersome. The enemy, under Beauregard, had collected about 23,000 men and 35 guns and was posted behind Bull Run. A preliminary engagement occurred on Thursday, July 18th, at Blackburn's Ford on that stream, which served to develop the enemy's strong position, but only delayed the advance until the whole of McDowell's force reached Centerville. Here, McDowell halted, spent Friday and Saturday in reconnoitering, and on Sunday, July 21st, began the battle by a circuitous march across Bull Run and attacking the enemy's left flank. It proved that the plan was correctly chosen but, by a confusion in the march, the attack, intended for daybreak, was delayed until nine o'clock. Nevertheless, the first half of the battle, during the forenoon, was entirely successful, the Union lines steadily driving the enemy southward, and enabling additional Union brigades to join the attacking column by a direct march from Centerville. At noon, however, the attack came to a halt, partly through the fatigue of the troops, partly because the advancing line, having swept the field for nearly a mile, found itself in a valley, from which further progress had to be made with all the advantage of the ground in favor of the enemy. In the lull of the conflict, which for a while ensued, the Confederate commander, with little hope except to mitigate a defeat, hurriedly concentrated his remaining artillery and supporting regiments into a semicircular line of defense at the top of the hill that the Federals would be obliged to mount, 
and kept them well concealed among the young pines at the edge of the timber with an open field in their front against the second position of the enemy comprising twelve regiments twenty-two guns and two companies of cavalry mcdowell advanced in the afternoon with an attacking force of fourteen regiments twenty-four guns and a single battalion of cavalry but with all the advantages of position against him a fluctuating and intermitting attack resulted the nature of the ground rendered a combined advance impossible the union brigades were sent forward and repulsed by piecemeal a battery was lost by mistaking a confederate for a union regiment even now the victory seemed to vibrate when a new flank attacked by seven rebel regiments from an entirely unexpected direction suddenly impressed the union troops with the belief that johnston's army from harper's ferry had reached the battlefield and demoralized by this belief the union commands by a common impulse gave up the fight as lost and half marched half ran from the field before reaching centerville the retreat at one point degenerated into a downright panic among the army teamsters and a considerable crowd of miscellaneous camp followers and here a charge or two by the confederate cavalry companies captured thirteen union guns and quite a harvest of army wagons when the truth came to be known, it was found that through the want of skill and courage on the part of General Patterson in his operations at Harper's Ferry, General Johnston, with his whole Confederate army, had been allowed to slip away, and so far from coming suddenly into the Battle of Bull Run, the bulk of them were already in Beauregard's camps on Saturday, and performed the heaviest part of the fighting in Sunday's conflict. The sudden cessation of the battle left the Confederates in doubt whether their victory was final or only a prelude to a fresh Union attack. But as the Union forces not only retreated from the field, but also from Centerville, it took on, in their eyes, the proportions of a great triumph, confirming their expectation of achieving ultimate independence and, in fact, giving them a standing in the eyes of foreign nations, which they had hardly dared hope for so soon. In numbers of killed and wounded, the two armies suffered about equally, and General Johnston writes, The Confederate Army was more disorganized by victory than that of the United States by defeat. Manassas was turned into a fortified camp, but the rebel leaders felt themselves unable to make an aggressive movement during the whole of the following autumn and winter. The shock of the defeat was deep and painful to the administration and the people of the North. Up to late Sunday afternoon, favorable reports had come to Washington from the battlefield, and everyone believed in an assured victory. When a telegram came about five o'clock in the afternoon that the day was lost and McDowell's army in full retreat through Centerville, General Scott refused to credit the news so contradictory of everything which had been heard up to that hour. But the intelligence was quickly confirmed. The impulse of retreat once started, McDowell's effort to arrest it at Centerville proved useless. The regiments and brigades, not completely disorganized, made an unmolested and comparatively orderly march back to the fortifications of Washington, while on the following day a horde of stragglers found their way across the bridges of the Potomac into the city. President Lincoln received the news quietly and without any visible sign of perturbation or excitement, but he remained awake and in the executive office all of Sunday night, listening to the personal narratives of a number of congressmen and senators who had, with undue curiosity, followed the army and witnessed some of the sounds and sights of the battle. By the dawn of Monday morning, the president had substantially made up his judgment of the battle and its probable results, and the action dictated by the untoward event. This was, in brief, that the militia regiments enlisted under the three months' call should be mustered out as soon as practicable. The organization of the new three years' forces be pushed forward both east and west. 
Manassas and Harper's Ferry, and the intermediate lines of communication be seized and held, and a joint movement organized from Cincinnati on East Tennessee and from Cairo on Memphis. Meanwhile, General McClellan was ordered from West Virginia to Washington, where he arrived on July 26 and assumed command of the Division of the Potomac, comprising the troops in and around Washington on both sides of the river. He quickly cleared the city of stragglers and displayed a gratifying activity in beginning the organization of the Army of the Potomac from the new three years volunteers that were pouring into Washington by every train. He was received by the administration and the army with the warmest friendliness and confidence, and for a while seemed to reciprocate those feelings with zeal and gratitude. End of chapter 16chapter 17 of a short life of abraham lincoln this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org this reading by allison hester of athens georgia a short life of abraham lincoln by john g nicolay chapter 17 general scott's plans criticized as the anaconda the three fields of conflict fremont appointed major general his military failures battle of wilson's creek hunter ordered to fremont fremont's proclamation president revokes fremont's proclamation lincoln's letter to browning surrender of lexington fremont takes the field cameron's visit to fremont fremont's removal the military genius and experience of general scott from the first pretty correctly divined the grand outline of military operations which would become necessary in reducing the revolted southern states to renewed allegiance long before the battle of bull run was planned he urged that the first seventy-five regiments of three months militia could not be relied on for extensive campaigns because their term of service would expire before they could be well organized his outline suggestion therefore was that the new three years volunteer army be placed in ten or fifteen healthy camps and given at least four months of drill and tactical instruction and when the navy had by a rigid blockade closed all the harbors along the seaboard of the southern states the fully prepared army should by invincible columns move down the mississippi river to new orleans leaving a strong cordon of military posts behind it to keep open the stream join hands with the blockade and thus envelop the principal area of rebellion in a powerful military grasp which would paralyze and effectually kill the insurrection even while suggesting this plan however the general admitted that the great obstacle to its adoption would be the impatience of the patriotic and loyal union people and leaders who would refuse to wait the necessary length of time the general was correct in his apprehension the newspapers criticized his plan in caustic editorials and ridiculous cartoons as Scott's Anaconda, and public opinion rejected it in an overwhelming demand for a prompt and energetic advance. Scott was correct in military theory, while the people and the administration were right in practice under existing political conditions. Although Bull Run seemed to justify the general, West Virginia and Missouri vindicated the president and the people. It can now be seen that still a third element, geography, intervened to give shape and sequence to the main outlines of the Civil War. When at the beginning of May, General Scott gave his advice, the seat of government of the first seven Confederate states was still at Montgomery, Alabama. By the adhesion of the four interior border states to the insurrection and the removal of the archives and administration of Jefferson Davis to Richmond, Virginia, toward the end of June, as the capital of the now eleven Confederate states, Washington necessarily became the center of Union attack, 
and Richmond the center of Confederate defense. From the day when McDowell began his march to Bull Run, to that when Lee evacuated Richmond in his final hopeless flight, the route between these two opposing capitals remained the principal and dominating line of military operations, and the region between Chesapeake Bay and the Potomac River on the east, and the chain of the Alleghenies on the west, the primary field of strategy. According to geographical features, the second great field of strategy lay between the Allegheny Mountains and the Mississippi River, and the third between the Mississippi River, the Rocky Mountains, and the Rio Grande. Except in West Virginia, the attitude of neutrality assumed by Kentucky for a considerable time delayed the definition of the military frontier and the beginning of active hostilities in the second field thus giving greater momentary importance to the conditions existing and events transpiring in Missouri, with the city of St. Louis as the principal center of the third great military field. The same necessity which dictated the promotion of General McClellan at one bound from captain to major general compelled a similar phenomenal promotion, not alone of officers of the regular army, but also of eminent civilians to high command and military responsibility in the immense volunteer force authorized by Congress. Events, rather than original purpose, had brought McClellan into prominence and ranking duty, but now by design the President gave John C. Fremont a commission of Major General and placed him in command of the third great military field with headquarters at St. Louis with the leading idea that he should organize the military strength of the Northwest, first, to hold Missouri to the Union, and second, by a carefully prepared military expedition over the Mississippi River. By so doing, he would sever the Confederate states, reclaim or conquer the region lying west of the Great Stream, and thus reduce by more than one-half the territorial area of the insurrection. Though he had been an army lieutenant, he had no experience in active war, yet the talent and energy he had displayed in Western military exploration and the political prominence he had reached as candidate of the Republican Party for President in 1856 seemed to fit him preeminently for such a duty. While most of the volunteers from New England and the Middle States were concentrated at Washington and dependent points, the bulk of the Western regiments was, for the time being, put under the command of Fremont for present and prospective duty. But the high hopes which the administration placed in the general were not realized. The genius which could lead a few dozen or a few hundred Indian scouts and mountain trappers over desert plains and through the fastnesses of the Sierra Nevada that could defy savage hostilities and outlive starvation amid imprisoning snows, failed signally before the task of animating and combining the patriotic enthusiasm of eight or ten great northwestern states, and organizing and leading an army of 100,000 eager volunteers in a comprehensive and decisive campaign to recover a great national highway. From the first, Fremont failed in promptness, in foresight, in intelligent supervision, and, above all, in inspiring confidence and attracting assistance and devotion. His military administration created serious extravagance and confusion, and his personal intercourse excited the distrust and resentment of the governors and civilian officials, whose counsel and cooperation were essential to his usefulness and success. While his resources were limited, and while he fortified St. Louis and reinforced Cairo, a yet more important point needed his attention and help. Lyon, who had followed Governor Jackson and General Price in their flight from Boonville to Springfield in southern Missouri, found his forces diminished beyond his expectation by the expiration of the term of service of his three months' regiments, and began to be threatened by a northward concentration of Confederate detachments from the Arkansas line and the Indian Territory. The neglect of his appeals for help 
placed him in the situation where he could neither safely remain inactive nor safely retreat. He therefore took the chances of scattering the enemy before him by a sudden daring attack with his 5,000 effectives against nearly treble numbers in the Battle of Wilson's Creek at daylight on August 10th. The casualties on the two sides were nearly equal, and the enemy was checked and crippled, but the Union Army sustained a fatal loss in the death of General Lyon, who was instantly killed while leading a desperate bayonet charge. His skill and activity had, so far, been the strength of the Union cause in Missouri. The absence of his counsel and personal example rendered a retreat to the railroad terminus at Rolla necessary. This discouraging event turned public criticism sharply upon Fremont. Loath to yield to mere public clamor and adverse to hasty changes in military command, Mr. Lincoln sought to improve the situation by sending General David Hunter to take a place on Fremont's staff. General Fremont needs assistance, said his note to Hunter, which it is difficult to give him. He is losing the confidence of men near him, whose support any man in his position must have to be successful. His cardinal mistake is that he isolates himself and allows nobody to see him, and by which he does not know what is going on in the very matter he is dealing with. He needs to have by his side a man of large experience, Will you not, for me, take that place? Your rank is one grade too high to be ordered to do it, but will you not serve the country and oblige me by taking it voluntarily? This note indicates, better than pages of description, the kind, helpful, and forbearing spirit with which the President, through the long four years of war, treated his military commanders and subordinates and which, in several instances, met such ungenerous return. But even while Mr. Lincoln was attempting to smooth this difficulty, Fremont had already burdened him with two additional embarrassments. One was a perplexing personal quarrel the general had begun with the influential Blair family, represented by Colonel Frank Blair, the indefatigable Unionist leader in Missouri, and Montgomery Bear, the postmaster general in Lincoln's cabinet, who had hitherto been Fremont's most influential friends and supporters, and in addition, the father of these, Francis P. Blair, Sr., a veteran politician whose influence dated from Jackson's administration and through whose assistance Fremont had been nominated as a presidential candidate in 1856. The other embarrassment was of a more serious and far-reaching nature. Conscious that he was losing the esteem and confidence of both civil and military leaders in the West, Fremont's adventurous fancy caught at the idea of rehabilitating himself before the public by a bold political maneuver. Day by day, the relation of slavery to the Civil War was becoming a more troublesome question and exciting impatient and angry discussion. Without previous consultation with the President or any of his advisors or friends, Fremont, on August 30th, wrote and printed as commander of the Department of the West a proclamation establishing martial law throughout the state of Missouri and announcing that, Quote, all persons who shall be taken with arms in their hands within these lines shall be tried by court-martial, and, if found guilty, will be shot. The property, real and personal, of all persons in the state of Missouri who shall take up arms against the United States, or who shall be directly proven to have taken an active part with their enemies in the field, is declared to be confiscated to the public use and their slaves, if any they have, are hereby declared free men." End quote. The reason given in the proclamation for this drastic and dictatorial measure was to suppress disorder, maintain the public peace, and protect persons and property of loyal citizens, all simple police duties. For issuing his proclamation without consultation with the president, he could offer only the flimsy excuse that it involved two days of time to communicate with Washington 
while he well knew that no battle was pending and no invasion in progress. This reckless misuse of power, President Lincoln also corrected with his dispassionate prudence and habitual courtesy. He immediately wrote to the general, My dear sir, two points in your proclamation of August 30th give me some anxiety. First, should you shoot a man, according to the proclamation, the Confederates would very certainly shoot our best men in their hands in retaliation, and so, man for man, indefinitely. It is, therefore, my order that you allow no man to be shot under the proclamation without first having my approbation or consent. Second, I think there is great danger that the closing paragraph in relation to the confiscation of property and the liberating slaves of traitorous owners, will alarm our Southern Union friends and turn them against us, perhaps ruin our rather fair prospect of Kentucky. Allow me, therefore, to ask that you will, as of your own motion, modify that paragraph so as to conform to the first and fourth sections of the Act of Congress entitled, an act to confiscate property used for insurrectionary purposes, approved August 6, 1861, and a copy of which act I herewith send you. This letter is written in a spirit of caution and not of censure. I send it by a special messenger in order that it may certainly and speedily reach you. But the headstrong general was too blind and selfish to accept this mild redress of a fault that would have justified instant displacement from command. He preferred that the president should openly direct him to make the correction. Admitting that he decided in one night upon the measure, he added, quote, If I were to retract it of my own accord, it would imply that I thought myself wrong and that I had acted without reflection, which the gravity of the point demanded. End quote. The inference is plain that Fremont was unwilling to lose the influence of his hasty step upon public opinion, but by this course he had deliberately placed himself in an attitude of political hostility to the administration. The incident produced something of the agitation which the general had evidently counted upon, Radical anti-slavery men throughout the free states applauded his act and condemned the president, and military emancipation at once became a subject of excited discussion. Even strong conservatives were carried away by the feeling that rebels would be, but properly punished by the loss of their slaves. To Senator Browning, the president's intimate personal friend, who entertained this feeling, Mr. Lincoln wrote a searching analysis of Fremont's proclamation and its dangers. Quote, Yours of the 17th is just received, and coming from you, I confess it astonishes me that you should object to my adhering to a law which you had assisted in making and presenting to me less than a month before is odd enough, but this is a very small part. General Fremont's proclamation as to confiscation of property and the liberation of slaves is purely political and not within the range of military law or necessity. If a commanding general finds a necessity to seize the farm of a private owner for a pasture, an encampment, or a fortification, he has the right to do so, and to so hold it as long as the necessity lasts and this is within military law because within military necessity. But to say the farm shall no longer belong to the owner or his heirs forever, and this as well when the farm is not needed for military purposes as when it is, is purely political without the savor of military law about it. And the same is true of slaves. If the general needs them, he can seize them and use them, and when the need is passed, it is not for him to fix their permanent future condition. That must be settled according to laws made by lawmakers and not by military proclamations. The proclamation in the point in question is simply dictatorship. It assumes that the general may do anything he pleases, confiscate the lands and free the slaves of loyal people as well as of disloyal ones. 
and going the whole figure, I have no doubt, would be more popular with some thoughtless people than that which has been done. But I cannot assume this reckless position, nor allow others to assume it on my responsibility. You speak of it as being the only means of saving the government. On the contrary, it is itself the surrender of the government, can it be pretended that it is any longer the government of the United States, any government of constitution and laws, wherein a general or a president may make permanent rules of property by proclamation? I do not say Congress might not, with propriety, pass a law on the point, just as General Fremont proclaimed. I do not say I might not, as a member of Congress, vote for it. What I object to is that I, as president, shall expressly or impliedly seize and exercise the permanent legislative functions of the government. So much as to principle, now as to policy. No doubt the thing was popular in some quarters and would have been more so if it had been a general declaration of emancipation. The Kentucky legislature would not budge till that proclamation was modified and General Anderson telegraphed me that on the news of General Fremont having actually issued deeds of manumission, a whole company of our volunteers threw down their arms and disbanded. I was so assured as to think it probable that the very arms we had furnished Kentucky would be turned against us. I think to lose Kentucky is nearly the same as to lose the whole game. Kentucky gone, we cannot hold Missouri, nor as I think, Maryland. These all against us, and the job on our hands is too large for us. We would as well consent to separation at once, including the surrender of this capital. End quote. If it be objected that the president himself decreed military emancipation a year later, then it must be remembered that Fremont's proclamation differed in many essential particulars from the president's edict of January 1, 1863. By that time, also, the entirely changed conditions justified a complete change of policy, but above all, the supreme reason of military necessity, upon which alone Mr. Lincoln based the constitutionality of his edict of freedom, was entirely wanting in the case of Fremont. The harvest of popularity which Fremont evidently hoped to secure by his proclamation was soon blighted by a new military disaster. The Confederate forces, which had been united in the Battle of Wilson's Creek, quickly became disorganized through the disagreement of their leaders and the want of provisions and other military supplies, and mainly returned to Arkansas and the Indian Territory whence they had come. But General Price, with his Missouri contingent, gradually increased his followers, and as the Union retreat from Springfield to Rolla left the way open, began a northward march through the western part of the state to attack Colonel Mulligan, who, with about 2,800 Federal troops, entrenched himself at Lexington on the Missouri River. Secession sympathy was strong along the line of his march and Price gained adherence so rapidly that on September 18th he was able to invest Mulligan's position with a somewhat irregular army numbering about 20,000. After a two days siege, the garrison was compelled to surrender through the exhaustion of the supply of water in their cisterns. The victory won, Price again immediately retreated southward, losing his army almost as fast as he had collected it, made up, as it was, more in the spirit and quality of a sudden border foray than an organized campaign. For this new loss, Fremont was subjected to a shower of fierce criticism, which, this time, he sought to disarm by ostentatious announcements of immediate activity. I am taking the field myself, he telegraphed, and hope to destroy the enemy either before or after the junction of forces under McCulloch. Four days after the surrender, the St. Louis newspapers printed his order organizing an army of five divisions. The document made a respectable show of force on paper, claiming an aggregate of nearly 39,000. In reality, however, being scattered and totally unprepared for the field, it possessed no such effective strength. 
For a month longer, extravagant newspaper reports stimulated the public with the hope of substantial results from Fremont's intended campaign. Before the end of that time, however, President Lincoln, under growing apprehension, sent Secretary of War Cameron and the Adjutant General of the Army to Missouri to make a personal investigation. Reaching Fremont's camp on October 13th, they found the movement to be a mere forced, spasmodic display, without substantial strength, transportation, or coherent and feasible plan, and that at least two of the division commanders were, without means to execute the orders they had received, and utterly without confidence in their leader or knowledge of his intentions. To give Fremont yet another chance, the Secretary of War withheld the President's order to relieve the General from his command, which he had brought with him on Fremont's insistence that a victory was really within his reach. When this hope also proved delusive, and suspicion was aroused that the general might be intending not only to deceive, but to defy the administration, President Lincoln sent the following letter by a special friend to General Curtis, commanding at St. Louis. Quote, Dear Sir, on receipt of this, with the accompanying enclosures, you will take safe, certain and suitable measures to have the enclosure addressed to Major General Fremont delivered to him with all reasonable dispatch, subject to these conditions only, that if, when General Fremont shall be reached by the messenger, yourself, or anyone sent by you, he shall then have, in personal command, fought and won a battle, or shall then be actually in a battle, or shall then be in the immediate presence of the enemy in expectation of a battle, it is not to be delivered, but held for further orders. After, and not till after, the delivery of General Fremont, let the enclosure addressed to General Hunter be delivered to him. End quote. The order of removal was delivered to Fremont on November 2nd. By that date, he had reached Springfield, but had won no victory, fought no battle, and was not in the presence of the enemy. Two of his divisions were not yet even with him. Still laboring under the delusion, perhaps imposed on him by his scouts, his orders stated that the enemy was only a day's march distant and advancing to attack him. The enclosure mentioned in the President's letter to Curtis was an order to General David Hunter to relieve Fremont. When he arrived and assumed command, the scouts he sent forward found no enemy within reach and no such contingency of battle or hope of victory as had been rumored and assumed. Fremont's personal conduct in these disagreeable circumstances was entirely commendable. He took leave of the army in a short farewell order, couched in terms of perfect obedience to authority and courtesy to his successor, asking for him the same cordial support he had himself received. Nor did he, by word or act, justify the suspicions of insubordination for which some of his indiscreet adherents had given cause. Under the instructions, President Lincoln had outlined in his order to Hunter that General gave up the idea of indefinitely pursuing Price and divided the army into two corps of observation, which were drawn back and posted, for the time being, at the two railroad termini of Rolla and Sedalia to be recruited and prepared for further service. End of chapter 17. Chapter 18 of A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jude Cater. A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln by John G. Nicolay. Chapter 18. Blockade, Hatteras Inlet, Port Royal Captured, The Trent Affair, Lincoln Suggests Arbitration, Seward's Dispatch, McClellan at Washington, Army of the Potomac, McClellan's Quarrel with Scott, 
Retirement of Scott. Lincoln's Memorandum. All Quiet on the Potomac. Conditions in Kentucky. Cameron's Visit to Sherman. East Tennessee. Instructions to Buell. Buell's Neglect. Halleck in Missouri. Following the fall of Fort Sumter, the Navy of the United States was in no condition to enforce the blockade from Chesapeake Bay to the Rio Grande declared by Lincoln's proclamation of April 19. Of the 42 vessels then in commission, nearly all were on foreign stations. Another serious cause of weakness was that within a few days after the Sumter attack, 124 officers of the Navy resigned, or were dismissed for disloyalty, and the number of such was doubled before the 4th of July. Yet, by strenuous efforts of the Department in fitting out ships that had been laid up, in completing those under construction, and in extensive purchases and arming of all classes of vessels that could be put to use, from screw and sidewheel merchant steamers to ferry boats and tugs, a legally effective blockade was established within a period of six months. A considerable number of new warships was also placed under construction. The special session of Congress created a commission to study the subject of ironclads, and on its recommendation, three experimental vessels of this class were placed under contract. One of these, completed early in the following year, rendered a momentous service, hereafter to be mentioned, and completely revolutionized naval warfare. Meanwhile, as rapidly as vessels could be gathered and prepared, the Navy Department organized effective expeditions to operate against points on the Atlantic coast. On August 29, a small fleet, under command of Flag Officer Stringham, took possession of Hatteras Inlet after silencing the forts the insurgents had erected to guard the entrance and captured 25 guns and 700 prisoners. This success, achieved without the loss of a man to the Union fleet, was of great importance, opening as it did the way for a succession of victories in the interior waters of North Carolina early in the following year. A more formidable expedition and still greater success soon followed. Early in November, Captain DuPont assembled a fleet of 50 sail, including transports, before the Port Royal Sound forming a column of nine warships with a total of 112 guns, the line steamed by the mid-channel between Fort Beauregard to the right and Fort Walker to the left, the first of 20 and the second of 23 guns, each ship delivering its fire as it passed the forts. Turning at the proper point, they again gave broadside after broadside while steaming out, and so repeated their circular movement. The battle was decided when, on the third round, the forts failed to respond to the fire of the ships. When Commander Rogers carried and planted the stars and stripes on the ramparts, he found them utterly deserted, everything having been abandoned by the flying garrisons. Further reconnaissance proved that the panic extended itself over the whole network of sea islands between Charleston and Savannah, permitting the immediate occupation of the entire region, and affording a military base for both the Navy and the Army of incalculable advantage in the further reduction of the coast. Another naval exploit, however, almost at the same time, absorbed greater public attention and for a while created an intense degree of excitement and suspense. Ex-Senators J.M. Mason and John Slidell, having been accredited by the Confederate government as envoys to European courts, had managed to elude the blockade and reach Havana. Captain Charles Weeks, commanding the San Jacinto, learning that they were to take passage for England on the British mail steamer Trent, intercepted that vessel on November 8 near the coast of Cuba, took the rebel emissaries prisoner by the usual show of force, and brought them to the United States, but allowed the Trent to proceed on her voyage. The incident and alleged insult produced as great excitement in England as in the United States and the British government began instant and significant preparations for war for what it hastily assumed to be a violation of international law and an outrage on the British flag. Instructions were sent to Lord Lyons, the British minister at Washington, to demand the release of the prisoners and a suitable apology, and, if this demand were not complied with within a single week, to close his legation and return to England. In the northern states, the capture was greeted with great jubilation. Captain Wilkes was applauded by the press, 
His act was officially approved by the Secretary of the Navy, and the House of Representatives unanimously passed a resolution thanking him for his brave, adroit, and patriotic conduct. While the President and Cabinet shared the first impulses of rejoicing, second thoughts impressed them with the grave nature of the international question involved, and the serious dilemma of disavowal or war precipitated by the imperative British demand. It was fortunate that Secretary Seward and Lord Lyons were close personal friends, and still more that though British public opinion had strongly favored the rebellion, the Queen of England entertained the kindliest feelings for the American government. Under her direction, Prince Albert instructed the British cabinet to formulate and present the demand in the most courteous diplomatic language, while on their part, the American president and cabinet discussed the affair in a temper of judicious reserve. President Lincoln's first desire was to refer the difficulty to friendly arbitration, and his mood is admirably expressed in the autograph experimental draft of a dispatch suggesting this course. The President is unwilling to believe, he wrote, that Her Majesty's government will press for a categorical answer upon what appears to him to be only a partial record, in the making up of which he has been allowed no part. He is reluctant to volunteer his view of the case, with no assurance that Her Majesty's government will consent to hear him. Yet this much he directs me to say, that this government has intended no affront to the British flag, or to the British nation, nor has it intended to force into discussion an embarrassing question, all which is evident by the fact hereby asserted, that the act complained of was done by an officer without orders from, or expectation of, the government. But being done, it was no longer left to us to consider whether we might not, to avoid a controversy, waive an unimportant though strict right, because we too, as well as Great Britain, have a people justly jealous of their rights, and in whose presence our government could undo the act complained of only upon a fair showing that it was wrong, or at least very questionable. The United States government and people are still willing to make reparation upon such showing. Accordingly, I am instructed by the President to inquire whether Her Majesty's government will hear the United States upon the matter in question. The President desires, among other things, to bring into view and have considered the existing rebellion in the United States, the position Great Britain has assumed, including Her Majesty's proclamation in relation thereto, the relation the persons whose seizure is the subject of complaint bore to the United States, and the object of their voyage at the time they were seized, the knowledge which the Master of the Trent had of their relation to the United States, and of the object of their voyage at the time he received them on board for the voyage, the place of the seizure, and the precedents and respective positions assumed in analogous cases between Great Britain and the United States. Upon a submission containing the foregoing facts, with those set forth in the before-mentioned dispatch to your lordship, together with all other facts which either party may deem material, I am instructed to say the government of the United States will, if agreed to by Her Majesty's government, go to such friendly arbitration as is usual among nations, and will abide the award. The most practiced diplomatic pen in Europe could not have written a more dignified, courteous, or succinct presentation of the case. And yet, under the necessities of the movement, it was impossible to adopt this procedure. Upon full discussion, it was decided that war with Great Britain must be avoided, and Mr. Seward wrote a dispatch defending the course of Captain Wilkes, up to the point where he permitted the Trent to proceed on her voyage. It was his further duty to have brought her before a prize court. Failing in this, he had left the capture incomplete under rules of international law, and the American government had thereby lost the right and the legal evidence to establish the contraband character of the vessel and the person seized. Under the circumstances, the prisoners were therefore willingly released. Excited American feeling was grievously disappointed at the result, but American good sense readily accommodated itself both to the correctness of the law expounded by the Secretary of State and to the public policy that averted a great international danger, particularly as this decision forced Great Britain to depart from her own and to adopt the American traditions respecting this class of neutral rights. It has already been told how Captain George B. McClellan was suddenly raised in rank at the very outset of the war, 
first to a major generalship in the three months militia, then to the command of the military department of the Ohio, from that to a major generalship in the regular army, and after his successful campaign in West Virginia was called to Washington and placed in command of the Division of the Potomac, which comprised all the troops in and around Washington on both sides of the river. Called thus to the capital of the nation to guard it against the results of the disastrous Battle of Bull Run, and to organize a new army for extended offensive operations, the surrounding conditions naturally suggested to him that in all likelihood he would play a conspicuous part in the great drama of the Civil War. His ambition rose eagerly to the prospect. On the day on which he assumed command, July 27, he wrote to his wife, I find myself in a new and strange position here. President, Cabinet, General Scott, and all deferring to me. By some strange operation of magic, I seem to have become the power of the land. And three days later, they give me my way in everything, full swing and unbounded confidence. Who would have thought when we were married that I should so soon be called upon to save my country? And still a few days afterward, I shall carry this thing on guard and crush the rebels in one campaign. From the giddy elevation to which such an imaginary achievement raised his dreams, there was but one higher step, and his colossal egotism immediately mounted to occupy it. On August 9, just two weeks after his arrival in Washington, he wrote, I would cheerfully take the dictatorship and agree to lay down my life when the country is saved. While in the same letter, he adds, with the most naive unconsciousness of his hallucination, I am not spoiled by my unexpected new position. Coming to the national capital in the hour of deepest public depression over the Bull Run defeat, McClellan was welcomed by the President, the Cabinet, and General Scott with sincere friendship, by Congress with a hopeful eagerness, by the people with enthusiasm, and by Washington society with adulation. Externally, he seemed to justify such a greeting. He was young, handsome, accomplished, genial, and winning in conversation and manner. He at once manifested great industry and quick decision, and speedily exhibited a degree of ability in Army organization which was not equaled by any officer during the Civil War. Under his eye, the stream of the new three years' regiments pouring into the city went to their camps, fell into brigades and divisions, and were supplied with equipments, horses, and batteries, and underwent the routine of drill, tactics, and reviews, which, without the least apparent noise or friction, in three months made the Army of the Potomac a perfect fighting machine of over 150,000 men and more than 200 guns. Recognizing his ability in this work, the government had indeed given him its full confidence and permitted him to exercise almost unbounded authority which he fully utilized in favoring his personal friends and drawing to himself the best resources of the whole country in arms, supplies, and officers of education and experience. For a while, his outward demeanor indicated respect and gratitude for the promotion and liberal favors bestowed upon him. But his phenomenal rise was fatal to his usefulness. The dream that he was to be the sole savior of his country— announced confidentially to his wife just two weeks after his arrival in Washington, never again left him so long as he continued in command. Coupled with this dazzling vision, however, was soon developed the tormenting twofold hallucination. First, that everybody was conspiring to thwart him, and second, that the enemy had from double to quadruple the numbers to defeat him. For the first month he could not sleep for the nightmare that Beauregard's demoralized army had by a sudden bound from Manassas seized the city of Washington. He immediately began a quarrel with General Scott, which, by the 1st of November, drove the old hero into retirement and out of his pathway. The cabinet members who, wittingly or unwittingly, had encouraged him in this, he some weeks later stigmatized as a set of geese. Seeing that President Lincoln was kind and unassuming in discussing military questions, McClellan quickly contracted the habit of expressing contempt for him in his confidential letters, and the feeling rapidly grew until it reached a mark of open disrespect. The same trait manifested itself in his making exclusive confidence of only two or three of his subordinate generals and ignoring the counsel of all the others, 
and when, later on, Congress appointed a standing committee of leading senators and representatives to examine into the conduct of the war, he placed himself in a similar attitude respecting their inquiry and advice. McClellan's activity and judgment as an army organizer naturally created great hopes that he would be equally efficient as a commander in the field. But these hopes were grievously disappointed. To his first great defect of estimating himself as the sole savior of the country, must at once be added the second, of his utter inability to form any reasonable judgment of the strength of the enemy in his front. On September 8, when the Confederate Army at Manassas numbered 41,000, he rated it at 130,000. By the end of October, that estimate had risen to 150,000, to meet which he asked that his own force should be raised to an aggregate of 240,000, with a total of effectives of 208,000 and 488 guns. He suggested that to gather this force, all other points should be left on the defensive, that the Army of the Potomac held the fate of the country in its hands, that the advance should not be postponed beyond November 25, and that a single will should direct the plan of accomplishing a crushing defeat of the rebel army at Manassas. On the 1st of November, the President, yielding at last to General Scott's urgent solicitation, issued the orders placing him on the retired list, and in his stead appointing General McClellan to the command of all the armies. The administration indulged the expectation that at last the young Napoleon, as the newspapers often called him, would take advantage of the fine autumn weather, and by a bold move with his single will and his immense force, outnumbering the enemy nearly four to one, would redeem his promise to crush the army at Manassas and save the country. But the November days came and went, as the October days had come and gone. McClellan and his brilliant staff galloped unceasingly from camp to camp, and review followed review, while autumn imperceptibly gave place to the cold and storms of winter, and still there was no sign of forward movement. Under his own growing impatience, as well as that of the public, the President, about the 1st of December, inquired pointedly in a memorandum suggesting a plan of campaign, how long would it require to actually get in motion? McClellan answered, by December 15, probably 25, and put aside the President's suggestion by explaining, I have now my mind actively turned toward another plan of campaign that I do not think at all anticipated by the enemy, nor by many of our own people. December 25 came, as November 25 had come, and still there was no plan, no preparation, no movement. Then McClellan fell seriously ill. By a spontaneous and most natural impulse, the soldiers of the various camps began the erection of huts to shelter them from snow and storm. In a few weeks, the Army of the Potomac was practically, if not by order, in winter quarters. And day after day, the monotonous telegraphic phrase, All Quiet on the Potomac, was read from the northern newspapers and northern homes, until, by mere iteration, it degenerated from an expression of deep disappointment to a note of sarcastic criticism. While so unsatisfactory a condition of affairs existed in the first great military field east of the Alleghenies, the outlook was quite as unpromising both in the second, between the Alleghenies and the Mississippi, and in the third, west of the Mississippi. When the Confederates, about September 1, 1861, invaded Kentucky, they stationed General Pellow at the strongly fortified town of Columbus on the Mississippi River with about 6,000 men, General Buckner at Bowling Green on the railroad north of Nashville with 5,000, and General Zolikoffer with six regiments in eastern Kentucky fronting Cumberland Gap. Up to that time, there were no Union troops in Kentucky except a few regiments of home guards. Now, however, the state legislature called for active help and General Anderson, exercising nominal command from Cincinnati, sent Brigadier General Sherman to Nashville to confront Buckner, and Brigadier General Thomas to Camp Dick Robinson to confront Zolikoffer. Neither side was as yet in a condition of force and preparation to take the aggressive. When, a month later, Anderson, on account of ill health, turned over the command to Sherman, the latter had gathered only about 18,000 men, 
and was greatly discouraged by the task of defending 300 miles of frontier with that small force. In an interview with Secretary of War Cameron, who called upon him on his return from Fremont's camp about the middle of October, he strongly urged that he needed for immediate defense 60,000, and for ultimate offense, 200,000 before we were done. Great God, exclaimed Cameron, where are they to come from? Both Sherman's demand and Cameron's answer were a pertinent comment on McClellan's policy of collecting the whole military strength of the country at Washington to fight the one great battle for which he could never get ready. Sherman was so distressed by the seeming magnitude of his burden that he soon asked to be relieved, and when Brigadier General Buell was sent to succeed him in command of that part of Kentucky lying east of the Cumberland River, it was the expectation of the President that he would devote his main attention and energy to the accomplishment of a specific object which Mr. Lincoln had very much at heart. Ever since the days in June when President Lincoln had presided over the Council of War which discussed and decided upon the Bull Run campaign, he had devoted every spare moment of his time to the study of such military books and leading principles of the art of war as would aid him in solving questions that must necessarily come to himself for final decision. His acute perceptions, retentive memory, an unusual power of logic enabled him to make rapid progress in the acquisition of the fixed and accepted rules on which military writers agree. In this, as in other sciences, the main difficulty, of course, lies in applying fixed theories to variable conditions. When, however, we remember that at the outbreak of hostilities all the great commanders of the Civil War had experience only as captains and lieutenants, it is not strange that in speculative military problems, the President's mature reasoning powers should have gained almost as rapidly by observation and criticism as theirs by practice and experiment. The mastery he attained of the difficult art, and how intuitively correct was his grasp of military situations, has been attested since in the enthusiastic admiration of brilliant technical students, amply fitted by training and intellect to express an opinion, whose comment does not fall short of declaring Mr. Lincoln the ablest strategist of the war. The President had early discerned what must become the dominating and decisive lines of advance in gaining and holding military control of the southern states. Only two days after the Battle of Bull Run, he had written a memorandum suggesting three principal objects for the Army when reorganized. First, to gather a force to menace Richmond. Second, a movement from Cincinnati upon Cumberland Gap in East Tennessee. Third, an expedition from Cairo against Memphis. In his eyes, the second of these objectives never lost its importance, and it was, in fact, substantially adopted by indirection and by necessity in the closing periods of the war. The eastern third of the state of Tennessee remained from the first stubbornly and devotedly loyal to the Union. At an election on June 8, 1861, the people of 29 counties, by more than two to one, voted against joining the Confederacy, and the most rigorous military repression by the orders of Jefferson Davis and Governor Harris was necessary to prevent a general uprising against the rebellion. The sympathy of the President, even more than that of the whole North, went out warmly to these unfortunate Tennesseans and he desired to convert their mountain fastnesses into an impregnable patriotic stronghold. Had his advice been followed, it would have completely severed railroad communication by way of the Shenandoah Valley, Knoxville, and Chattanooga between Virginia and the Gulf States, accomplishing in the winter of 1861 what was not attained until two years later. Mr. Lincoln urged this in a second memorandum, made late in September, and seeing that the principal objection to it lay in the long and difficult line of land transportation, his message to Congress of December 3, 1861, recommended, as a military measure, the construction of a railroad to connect Cincinnati by way of Lexington, Kentucky, with that mountain region. A few days after the message, he personally went to the President's room in the Capitol building, and calling around him a number of leading senators and representatives, and pointing out a map before them, the East Tennessee region, said to them in substance, 
I am thoroughly convinced that the closing struggle of the war will occur somewhere in this mountain country. By our superior numbers and strength, we will everywhere drive the rebel armies back from the level districts lying along the coast, from those lying south of the Ohio River, and from those lying east of the Mississippi River. Yielding to our superior force, they will gradually retreat to the more defensible mountain districts, and make their final stand in that part of the South where the seven states of Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Tennessee, Kentucky, and West Virginia come together. The population there is overwhelmingly and devotedly loyal to the Union. The dispatches from Brigadier General Thomas on October 28 and November 5 show that, with four additional good regiments, he is willing to undertake the campaign and is confident that he can take immediate possession. Once established, the people will rally to his support, and by building a railroad over which to forward him regular supplies and needed reinforcements from time to time, we can hold it against all attempts to dislodge us, and at the same time menace the enemy in any one of the states I have named. While his hearers listened with interest, it was evident that their minds were still full of the prospect of a great battle in Virginia, the capture of Richmond, and an early suppression of the rebellion. Railroad building appeared to them altogether too slow an operation of war. To show how sagacious was the President's advice, we may anticipate by recalling that in the following summer General Buell spent as much time, money, and military strength in his attempted march from Corinth to East Tennessee as would have amply sufficed to build the line from Lexington to Knoxville recommended by Mr. Lincoln, the general's effort resulting only in his being driven back to Louisville, that in 1863 Burnside, under greater difficulties, made the march and successfully held Knoxville, even without a railroad, which Thompson, with a few regiments, could have accomplished in 1861, and that in the final collapse of the rebellion in the spring of 1865, the beaten armies of both Johnston and Lee attempted to retreat for a last stand to this same mountain region which Mr. Lincoln pointed out in December 1861. Though the President received no encouragement from senators and representatives in his plan to take possession of East Tennessee, that object was specially enjoined in the instructions to General Buell when he was sent to command in Kentucky. It so happens that a large majority of the inhabitants of eastern Tennessee are in favor of the Union. It therefore seems proper that you should remain on the defensive on the line from Louisville to Nashville, while you throw the masses of your forces by rapid marches by Cumberland Gap or Walker's Gap on Knoxville, in order to occupy the railroad at that point, and thus enable the loyal citizens of eastern Tennessee to rise, while you at the same time cut off the railway communication between eastern Virginia and the Mississippi. Three times within the same month, McClellan repeated this injunction to Buell with additional emphasis. Senator Andrew Johnson and Representative Horace Maynard telegraphed him from Washington. Our people are oppressed and pursued as beasts of the forest. The government must come to their relief. Buell replied, keeping the word of promise to the ear, but with his ambition fixed on a different campaign, gradually but doggedly broke it to the hope. When, a month later, he acknowledged that his preparations and intent were to move against Nashville, the president wrote him, Of the two, I would rather have a point on the railroad south of Cumberland Gap than Nashville. First, because it cuts a great artery of the enemy's communication which Nashville does not and secondly, because it is in the midst of loyal people who would rally around it while Nashville is not. But my distress is that our friends in East Tennessee are being hanged and driven to despair, and even now, I fear, are thinking of taking rebel arms for the sake of personal protection. In this we lose the most valuable stake we have in the South. McClellan's comment amounted to a severe censure, and this was quickly followed by an almost positive command to advance on eastern Tennessee at once. Again Buell promised compliance, only, however, again to report in a few weeks his conviction that an advance into east Tennessee is impracticable at this time on any scale which would be sufficient. 
It is difficult to speculate upon the advantages lost by this unwillingness of a commander to obey instructions. To say nothing of the strategical value of East Tennessee to the Union, the fidelity of its people is shown in the report sent to the Confederate government that the whole country is now in a state of rebellion, that civil war has broken out in East Tennessee, and that they look for the reestablishment of the federal authority in the South with as much confidence as the Jews look for the coming of the Messiah. Henry W. Halleck, born in 1815, graduated from West Point in 1839, who, after distinguished service in the Mexican War, had been breveted captain of engineers, but soon afterward resigned from the army to pursue the practice of law in San Francisco, was, perhaps, the best professionally equipped officer among the number of those called by General Scott in the summer of 1861 to assume important command in the Union Army. It is probable that Scott intended he should succeed himself as General-in-Chief, but when he reached Washington the autumn was already late, and because of Fremont's conspicuous failure it seemed necessary to send Halleck to the Department of the Missouri, which, as reconstituted, was made to include, in addition to several northwestern states, Missouri and Arkansas, and so much of Kentucky as lay west of the Cumberland River. This change of department lines indicates the beginning of what soon became a dominant feature of military operations, namely that instead of the vast regions lying west of the Mississippi, the great river itself and the country lying immediately adjacent to it on either side became the third principal field of strategy and action, under the necessity of opening and holding it as a great military and commercial highway. While the intention of the government to open the Mississippi River by a powerful expedition received additional emphasis through Halleck's appointment, that general found no immediate means adequate to the task when he assumed command at St. Louis. Fremont's regime had left the whole department in the most deplorable confusion. Halleck reported that he had no army, but rather a military rabble to command, and for some weeks devoted himself with energy and success to bringing order out of the chaos left him by his predecessor. A large element of his difficulty lay in the fact that the population of the whole state was tainted with disloyalty to a degree which rendered Missouri less a factor in the larger questions of general army operations than, from the beginning to the end of the war, a local district of bitter and relentless factional hatred and guerrilla, or, as the term was constantly employed, bushwhacking warfare, intensified and kept alive by annual roving Confederate incursions from Arkansas and the Indian Territory in dulcetory summer campaigns. End of chapter 18「ラジオトーク」ジョージ・ウォシントンの「ジョージ・ウォシントン」の「ジョージ・ウォシントン」の「ジョージ・ウォシントン」の「ジョージ・ウォシントン」の「ジョージ・ウォシントン」の「ジョージ・ウォシントン」の「ジョージ・ウアショート・ライフ・オブ・アブラハム・リンコン、ジョン・ジー・ニコレイ。チャプター19リンコン・ディレクス・コアポレーション。ハレック・アン・ビュウル。ユリシス・エス・グラント。グラント・デモンストレーション。ヴィクトリー・アッ・ミル・リバー。フォート・ヘンリー。フォート・ドナルソン。ビュウル・スタディネス。Halleck's Activity Victory of Pea Ridge Halleck Receives General Command Pittsburgh Landing Island No. 10 Halleck's Corinth Campaign Halleck's Mistakes Toward the end of December 1861, the prospects of the administration became very gloomy. McClellan had indeed organized a formidable army at Washington, but it had done nothing to efface the memory of the Bull Run defeat. On the contrary, a practical blockade of the Potomac by rebel batteries on the Virginia shore, 
and another small but irritating defeat at Ball's Bluff greatly heightened public impatience. The necessary surrender of Mason and Slidell to England was exceedingly unpalatable. Government expenditures had risen to $2 million a day, and a financial crisis was imminent. Buell would not move into East Tennessee, and Halleck seemed powerless in Missouri. Added to this, McClellan's illness completed a stagnation of military affairs both east and west. Congress was clamoring for results, and its Joint Committee on the Conduct of the War was pushing a searching inquiry into the causes of previous defeats. To remove this inertia, President Lincoln directed specific questions to the Western commanders. Are General Buell and yourself in concert? He telegraphed Halleck on December 31. And next day he wrote, I am very anxious that, in case of General Buell's moving toward Nashville, the enemy shall not be greatly reinforced, and I think there is a danger he will be from Columbus. It seems to me that a real or feigned attack on Columbus from upriver at the same time would either prevent this or compensate for it by throwing Columbus into our hands. Similar questions also went to Buell, and their replies showed that no concert, arrangement, or plans existed, and that Halleck was not ready to cooperate. The correspondence started by the President's inquiry for the first time clearly brought out an estimate of the Confederate strength opposed to a southward movement in the West. Since the Confederate invasion of Kentucky on September 4, the rebels had so strongly fortified Columbus on the Mississippi River that it came to be called the Gibraltar of the West, and now had a garrison of 20,000 to hold it, while General Buckner was supposed to have a force of 40,000 at Bowling Green on the railroad between Louisville and Nashville. For more than a month, Buell and Halleck had been aware that a joint river and land expedition southward up the Tennessee or the Cumberland River, which would outflank both positions and cause their evacuation, was practicable with but little opposition. Yet neither Buell nor Halleck had exchanged a word about it or made the slightest preparation to begin it, each being busy in his own field and with his own plans. Even now, when the President had started the subject, Halleck replied that it would be bad strategy for himself to move against Columbus, or Buell against Bowling Green, but he had nothing to say about a Tennessee River expedition or cooperation with Buell to effect it, except by indirectly complaining that to withdraw troops from Missouri would risk the loss of that state. The President, however, was no longer satisfied with indecision and excuses, and telegraphed to Buell on January 7, Please name as early a day as you safely can on or before which you can be ready to move southward in concert with Major General Halleck. Delay is ruining us, and it is indispensable for me to have something definite. I send a like dispatch to Major General Halleck. To this Buell made no direct reply, while Halleck answered that he had asked Buell to designate a date for a demonstration, and explained two days later, I can make, with the gunboats and available troops, a pretty formidable demonstration, but no real attack. In point of fact, Halleck had on the previous day, January 6, written to Brigadier General U.S. Grant, I wish you to make a demonstration in force, and he added full details to which Grant responded on January 8. Your instructions of the 6th were received this morning, and immediate preparations made for carrying them out, also adding details on his part. Ulysses S. Grant was born on April 27, 1822, was graduated from West Point in 1843, and breveted captain for gallant conduct in the Mexican War, but resigned from the Army and was engaged with his father in a leather store at Galena, Illinois, when the Civil War broke out. Employed by the governor of Illinois a few weeks at Springfield to assist in organizing militia regiments under the president's first call, Grant wrote a letter to the War Department at Washington tendering his services and saying, I feel myself competent to command a regiment, if the President in his judgment should see fit to entrust one to me. 
For some reason, never explained, this letter remained unanswered, though the department was then and afterward in constant need of educated and experienced officers. A few weeks later, however, Governor Yates commissioned him colonel of one of the Illinois Three Years Regiments. From that time until the end of 1861, Grant, by constant and specially meritorious service, rose in rank to brigadier general and to the command of the important post of Cairo, Illinois, having meanwhile, on November 7th, won the Battle of Belmont on the Missouri shore opposite Columbus. The demonstration ordered by Halleck was probably intended only as a passing show of activity, but it was executed by Grant, though under strict orders to avoid a battle, with a degree of promptness and earnestness that drew after it momentous consequences. He pushed a strong reconnaissance by 8,000 men within a mile or two of Columbus and sent three gunboats up the Tennessee River, which drew the fire of Fort Henry. The results of the combined expedition convinced Grant that a real movement in that direction was practicable, and he hastened to St. Louis to lay his plan personally before Halleck. At first, that general would scarcely listen to it, but returning to Cairo, Grant urged it again and again, and the rapidly changing military condition soon caused Halleck to realize its importance. Within a few days, several items of interesting information reached Halleck. That General Thomas in eastern Kentucky had won a victory over the rebel General Zolikoffer, capturing his fortified camp on the Cumberland River annihilating his army of over ten regiments, and fully exposing Cumberland Gap. That the Confederates were about to throw strong reinforcements into Columbus. That seven formidable Union ironclad river gunboats were ready for service, and that a rise of fourteen feet had taken place in the Tennessee River, greatly weakening the rebel batteries on that stream and the Cumberland. The advantages on the one hand and the dangers on the other, which these reports indicated, moved Halleck to a sudden decision. When Grant, on January 28, telegraphed him, With permission, I will take Fort Henry on the Tennessee and establish and hold a large camp there. Halleck responded on the 30th, Make your preparations to take and hold Fort Henry. It would appear that Grant's preparations were already quite complete when he received written instructions by mail on February 1, for on the next day he started 15,000 men on transports, and on February 4 himself followed with seven gunboats under command of Commodore Foote. Two days later, Grant had the satisfaction of sending a double message in return. Fort Henry is ours. I shall take and destroy Fort Donelson on the 8th. Fort Henry had been an easy victory. The rebel commander, convinced that he could not defend the place, had early that morning sent away his garrison of 3,000 on a retreat to Fort Donelson, and simply held out during a two-hours bombardment until they could escape capture. To take Fort Donelson was a more serious enterprise. That stronghold, lying 12 miles away on the Cumberland River, was a much larger work, with a garrison of 6,000 and armed with 17 heavy and 48 field guns. If Grant could have marched immediately to an attack of the combined garrisons, there would have been a chance of quick success. But the high water presented unlooked-for obstacles, and nearly a week elapsed before his army began stretching itself cautiously around the three miles of Donaldson's entrenchments. During this delay, the conditions became greatly changed. When the Confederate general, Albert Sidney Johnston, received news that Fort Henry had fallen, he had held a council at Bowling Green with his subordinate generals, Hardy and Beauregard, and seeing that the Union success would, if not immediately counteracted, render both Nashville and Columbus untenable, resolved, to use his own language, to defend Nashville at Donelson. An immediate retreat was begun from Bowling Green to Nashville, and heavy reinforcements were ordered to the garrison of Fort Donelson. It happened, therefore, that when Grant was ready to begin his assault, the Confederate garrison with its reinforcements outnumbered his entire army. To increase the discouragement, 
The attack by gunboats on the Cumberland River on the afternoon of February 14 was repulsed, seriously damaging two of them, and a heavy sortie from the fort threw the right of Grant's investing line into disorder. Fortunately, General Halleck at St. Louis strained all his energies to send reinforcements, and these arrived in time to restore Grant's advantage in numbers. Serious disagreement among the Confederate commanders also hastened the fall of the place. On February 16, General Buckner, to whom the senior officers had turned over the command, proposed an armistice and the appointment of commissioners to agree on terms of capitulation. To this Grant responded with a characteristic spirit of determination, no terms except unconditional and immediate surrender can be accepted. I propose to move immediately upon your works. Buckner complained that the terms were ungenerous and unchivalric, but that necessity compelled him to accept them. And Grant telegraphed Halleck on February 16, We have taken Fort Donelson and from twelve to 15,000 prisoners. The senior Confederate generals, Pillow and Floyd, and a portion of the garrison had escaped by the Cumberland River during the preceding night. Since the fall of Fort Henry on February 6, a lively correspondence had been going on in which General Halleck besought Buell to come with his available forces, assist in capturing Donelson, and command the column up the Cumberland to cut off both Columbus and Nashville. President Lincoln, scanning the news with intense solicitude, and losing no opportunity to urge effective cooperation, telegraphed Halleck. You have Fort Donelson safe, unless Grant shall be overwhelmed from outside, to prevent which latter will, I think, require all the vigilance, energy, and skill of yourself and Buell acting in full cooperation. Columbus will not get it, Grant, but the force from Bowling Green will. They hold the railroad from Bowling Green to within a few miles of Fort Donelson, with the bridge at Clarksville undisturbed. It is unsafe to rely that they will not dare to expose Nashville to Buell. A small part of their force can retire slowly toward Nashville, breaking up the railroad as they go, and keep Buell out of that city twenty days. Meantime, Nashville will be abundantly defended by forces from all south and perhaps from here at Manassas. Could not a cavalry force from General Thomas on the Upper Cumberland dash across, almost unresisted, and cut the railroad at or near Knoxville, Tennessee? In the midst of a bombardment at Fort Donelson, why could not a gunboat run up and destroy the bridge at Clarksville? Our success or failure at Fort Donelson is vastly important, and I beg you to put your soul in the effort. I send a copy of this to Buell. This telegram abundantly shows with what minute understanding and accurate judgment the President comprehended military conditions and results in the West. Buell, however, was too intent upon his own separate movement to seize the brilliant opportunity offered him. As he, only in a feeble advance, followed up the retreating Confederate column from Bowling Green to Nashville, Halleck naturally appropriated to himself the merit of the campaign, and telegraphed to Washington on the day after the surrender, Make Buell, Grant, and Pope major generals of volunteers, and give me command in the West. I ask this in return for Forts Henry and Donelson. The eagerness of General Halleck for a superior command in the West was, to say the least, very pardonable. A vast horizon of possibilities was opening up to his view. Two other campaigns under his direction were exciting his liveliest hopes. Late in December, he had collected an army of 10,000 at the railroad terminus in Rolla, Missouri, under command of Brigadier General Curtis, for the purpose of scattering the rebel forces under General Price at Springfield, or driving them out of the state. Despite the hard winter weather, Halleck urged on the movement with almost peremptory orders, and Curtis executed the intentions of his chief with such alacrity that Price was forced into a rapid and damaging retreat from Springfield toward Arkansas. While forcing this enterprise in the southwest, Halleck had also determined on an important campaign in southeast Missouri. Next to Columbus, 
which the enemy evacuated on March 2, the strongest Confederate fortifications on the Mississippi River were at Island No. 10, about 40 miles further to the south. To operate against these, he planned an expedition under Brigadier General Pope to capture the town of New Madrid as a preliminary step. Columbus and Nashville were almost sure to fall as the result of Donelson. If now he could bring his two Missouri campaigns into a combination with two swift and strong Tennessee expeditions while the enemy was in scattered retreat, he could look forward to the speedy capture of Memphis. But to the realization of such a project, the hesitation and slowness of Buell were a serious hindrance. That general had indeed started a division under Nelson to Grant's assistance, but it was not yet in the Cumberland when Donelson surrendered. Halleck's demand for enlarged power, therefore, became almost imperative. He pleaded earnestly with Buell. I have asked the President to make you a major general. Come down to the Cumberland and take command. The Battle of the West is to be fought in that vicinity. There will be no battle at Nashville. His telegrams to McClellan were more urgent. Give it, the Western Division, to me, and I will split secession in twain in one month. And again, I must have command of the armies in the West. Hesitation and delay are losing us the golden opportunity. Lay this before the President and Secretary of War. May I assume command? Answer quickly. But McClellan was in no mood to sacrifice the ambition of his intimate friend and favorite, General Buell, and induce the President to withhold his consent. And while the generals were debating by telegraph, Nelson's division of the army of Buell moved up the Cumberland and occupied Nashville under the orders of Grant. Halleck, however, held tenaciously to his views and requests, explaining to McClellan that he himself proposed going to Tennessee. That is now the great strategic line of the Western Campaign, and I am surprised that General Buell should hesitate to reinforce me. He was too late at Fort Donelson. Believe me, General, you make a serious mistake in having three independent commands in the West. There never will and never can be any cooperation at the critical moment. All military history proves it. This insistence had greater point because of the news received that Curtis, energetically following Price into Arkansas, had won a great Union victory at Pea Ridge between March 5 and 8 over the united forces of Price and McCulloch, commanded by Van Dorn. At this juncture, events at Washington, hereafter to be mentioned, caused the reorganization of military commands, and President Lincoln's Special War Order No. 3 consolidated the western departments of Hunter, Halleck, and Buell, as far east as Knoxville, Tennessee, under the title of the Department of the Mississippi, and placed General Halleck in command of the whole. Meanwhile, Halleck had ordered the victorious Union Army at Fort Donelson to move forward to Savannah on the Tennessee River under the command of Grant, and, now that he had superior command, directed Buell to march all of his forces, not required to defend Nashville, as rapidly as possible to the same point. Halleck was still at St. Louis and through the indecision of his further orders, through the slowness of Buell's march, and through the unexplained inattention of Grant, the Union armies narrowly escaped a serious disaster, which, however, the determined courage of the troops and subordinate officers turned into a most important victory. The golden opportunity so earnestly pointed out by Halleck, while not entirely lost, was nevertheless seriously diminished by the hesitation and delay of the Union commanders to agree upon some plan of effective cooperation. When, at the fall of Fort Donelson, the Confederates retreated from Nashville toward Chattanooga and from Columbus toward Jackson, a swift advance by the Tennessee River could have kept them separated. But as that open highway was not promptly followed in force, the flying Confederate detachments found abundant leisure to form a junction. Grant reached Savannah on the east bank of the Tennessee River 
about the middle of March, and in a few days began massing troops at Pittsburgh Landing, six miles further south, on the west bank of the Tennessee. Still keeping his headquarters at Savannah to await the arrival of Buell and his army. During the next two weeks, he reported several times that the enemy was concentrating at Corinth, Mississippi, an important railroad crossing 20 miles from Pittsburgh Landing, the estimate of their number varying from 40 to 80,000. All this time, his mind was so filled with an eager intention to begin a march upon Corinth and a confidence that he could win a victory by a prompt attack that he neglected the essential precaution of providing against an attack by the enemy, which at the same time was occupying the thoughts of the Confederate commander, General Johnston. General Grant was therefore greatly surprised on the morning of April 6, when he proceeded from Savannah to Pittsburgh Landing to learn the cause of a fierce cannonade. He found that the Confederate army, 40,000 strong, was making an unexpected and determined attack in force on the Union camp, whose five divisions numbered a total of about 33,000. The Union generals had made no provision against such an attack. No entrenchments had been thrown up, no plan or understanding arranged. A few preliminary picket skirmishes had, indeed, put the Union front on the alert, but the commanders of brigades and regiments were not prepared for the impetuous rush with which the three successive Confederate lines began the main battle. On their part, the enemy did not realize their hope of effecting a complete surprise, and the nature of the ground was so characterized by a network of local roads, alternating patches of woods and open fields, miry hollows and abrupt ravines, that the lines of conflict were quickly broken into short, disjointed movements that admitted of little or no combined or systematic direction. The effort of the Union officers was necessarily limited to a continuous resistance to the advance of the enemy from whatever direction it came that of the Confederate leaders to the general purpose of forcing the Union lines away from Pittsburgh Landing so that they might destroy the Federal transports and thus cut off all means of retreat. In this effort, although during the whole of Sunday, April 6, the Union front had been forced back a mile and a half, the enemy had not entirely succeeded. About sunset, General Beauregard, who by the death of General Johnston during the afternoon, succeeded to the Confederate command, gave orders to suspend the attack, in the firm expectation, however, that he would be able to complete his victory the next morning. But in this hope, he was disappointed. During the day, the vanguard of Buell's army had arrived on the opposite bank of the river. Before nightfall, one of his brigades was ferried across and deployed in front of the exultant enemy, during the night and early Monday morning, three superb divisions of Buell's army, about 20,000 fresh, well-drilled troops, were advanced to the front under Buell's own direction. And by three o'clock of that day, the two wings of the Union army were once more in possession of all the ground that had been lost on the previous day, while the foiled and disorganized Confederates were in full retreat upon Corinth. The severity of the battle may be judged by the losses. In the Union Army, killed 1,754, wounded 8,408, missing 2,885. In the Confederate Army, killed 1,728, wounded 8,012, missing 954. Having comprehended the uncertainty of Buell's successful junction with Grant, Halleck must have received tidings of the final victory at Pittsburgh Landing with emotions of deep satisfaction. To this was now joined the further gratifying news that the enemy on the same momentous April 7 had surrendered Island No. 10, together with six or 7,000 Confederate troops, including three general officers, to the combined operations of General Pope and Flag Officer Foot. Full particulars of these two important victories did not reach Halleck for several days. Following previous suggestions, Pope and Foot promptly moved their gunboats and troops down the river to the next Confederate stronghold, 
Fort Pillow, were extensive fortifications aided by an overflow of the adjacent river banks, indicated strong resistance and considerable delay. When all the conditions became more fully known, Halleck at length adopted the resolution, to which he had been strongly leaning for some time, to take the field himself. About April 10, he proceeded from St. Louis to Pittsburgh Landing, and on the 15th ordered Pope with his army to join him there, which the latter, having his troops already on transports, succeeded in accomplishing by April 22. Halleck immediately effected a new organization, combining the armies of the Tennessee, of the Ohio, and of the Mississippi into respectively his right wing, center, and left wing. He assumed command of the whole himself, and nominally made Grant second in command. Practically, however, he left Grant so little authority or work that the latter felt himself slighted, and asked to leave to proceed to another field of duty. It required but a few weeks to demonstrate that however high were Halleck's professional acquirements in other respects, he was totally unfit for a commander in the field. Grant had undoubtedly been careless in not providing against the enemy's attack at Pittsburgh Landing. Halleck, on the other extreme, was now doubly overcautious in his march upon Corinth. From first to last, his campaign resembled a siege. With over 100,000 men under his hand, he moved at a snail's pace, building roads and breastworks, and consuming more than a month in advancing a distance of 20 miles during which period Beauregard managed to collect about 50,000 effective Confederates and construct defensive fortifications with equal industry around Corinth. When, on May 29, Halleck was within assaulting distance of the rebel entrenchments, Beauregard had leisurely removed his sick and wounded, destroyed or carried away his stores, and that night finally evacuated the place, leaving Halleck to reap, practically, a barren victory. Nor were the general's plans and actions any more fruitful during the following six weeks. He wasted the time and energy of his soldiers multiplying useless fortifications about Corinth. He dispatched Buell's wing of the army on a march toward eastern Tennessee, but under such instructions and limitations that long before reaching its objective, it was met by a Confederate army under General Bragg, and forced into a retrograde movement which carried it back to Louisville. More deplorable, however, than either of these errors in judgment, was Halleck's neglect to seize the opportune moment when, by a vigorous movement in cooperation with the brilliant naval victories under Flag Officer Farragut, commanding a formidable fleet of Union warships, he might have completed the overshadowing military task of opening the Mississippi River. End of chapter 19. Chapter 20 of A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jude Cater A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln by John G. Nicolay Chapter 20 The Blockade Hatteras Inlet Roanoke Island Fort Pulaski, Merrimack and Monitor, The Cumberland Sunk, The Congress Burned, Battle of the Ironclads, Flag Officer Farragut, Forts Jackson and St. Philip, New Orleans Captured, Farragut at Vicksburg, Farragut's Second Expedition to Vicksburg, Return to New Orleans. In addition to its heavy work of maintaining the Atlantic blockade, 
The Navy of the United States contributed signally toward the suppression of the rebellion by three brilliant victories which it gained during the first half of the year 1862. After careful preparation during several months, a joint expedition under the command of General Ambrose E. Burnside and Flag Officer Goldsboro, consisting of more than 12,000 men and 20 ships of war, accompanied by numerous transports, sailed from Fort Monroe on January 11, with the object of occupying the interior waters of the North Carolina coast. Before the larger vessels could effect their entrance through Hatteras Inlet, captured in the previous August, a furious storm set in, which delayed the expedition nearly a month. By February 7, however, that and other serious difficulties were overcome, and on the following day the expedition captured Roanoke Island, and thus completely opened the whole interior water system of Albemarle and Pamlico Sounds to the easy approach of the Union fleet and forces. From Roanoke Island as a base, minor expeditions within a short period effected the destruction of the not very formidable fleet which the enemy had been able to organize, and the reduction of Fort Macon, and the rebel defenses of Elizabeth City, New Bern, and other smaller places. An eventual advance upon Goldsboro formed part of the original plan, but before it could be executed, circumstances intervened effectually to thwart that object. While the gradual occupation of the North Carolina coast was going on, two other expeditions of a similar nature were making steady progress, one of them, under the direction of General Quincy A. Gilmore, carried on a remarkable siege operation against Fort Pulaski, standing on an isolated sea marsh at the mouth of the Savannah River. Here, not only the difficulties of approach, but the apparently insurmountable obstacle of making the soft, unctuous mud sustain heavy batteries, was overcome, and the fort compelled to surrender on April 11, after an effective bombardment. The second was an expedition of 19 ships, which, within a few days during the month of March, without serious resistance, occupied the whole remaining Atlantic coast southward as far as St. Augustine. When, at the outbreak of the rebellion, the navy yard at Norfolk, Virginia, had to be abandoned to the enemy, the destruction at that time attempted by Commodore Paulding remained very incomplete. Among the vessels set on fire, the screw frigate Merrimack, which had been scuttled, was burned only to the water's edge, leaving her hull and machinery entirely uninjured. In due time she was raised by the Confederates, covered with a sloping roof of railroad iron, provided with a huge wedge-shaped prow of cast iron, and armed with a formidable battery of ten guns. Secret information came to the Navy Department of the progress of this work, and such a possibility was kept in mind by the Board of Officers that decided upon the construction of three experimental ironclads in September 1861. The particular one of these three especially intended for this peculiar emergency was a ship of entirely novel design made by the celebrated inventor John Erickson, a Swede by birth but American by adoption, a man who combined great original genius with long scientific study and experience. His invention may be most quickly described as having a small, very low hull, covered by a much longer and wider flat deck only a foot or two above the waterline, upon which was placed a revolving iron turret twenty feet in diameter, nine feet high, and eight inches thick on the inside of which were two 11-inch guns trained side by side and revolving with the turret. This unique naval structure was promptly nicknamed a cheese box on a raft, and the designation was not at all inept. Naval experts at once recognized that her seagoing qualities were bad, but compensation was thought to exist in the belief that her iron turret would resist shot and shell and that the thin edge of her flat deck would offer only a minimum mark to an enemy's guns. In other words, that she was no cruiser, but would prove a formidable floating battery, 
and this belief she abundantly justified. The test of her fighting qualities was attended by what most suggested a miraculous coincidence. On Saturday, March 8, 1862, about noon, a strange-looking craft resembling a huge turtle was seen coming into Hampton Roads out of the mouth of Elizabeth River, and it quickly became certain that this was the much-talked-of rebel ironclad Merrimack, or as the Confederates had renamed her, the Virginia. She steamed rapidly toward Newport News, three miles to the southwest, where the Union ships Congress and Cumberland lay at anchor. These saw the uncouth monster coming and prepared for action. The Minnesota, the St. Lawrence, and the Roanoke, lying at Fortress Monroe, also saw her and gave chase. But the water being low, they all soon grounded. The broadsides of the Congress, as the Merrimack passed her at 300 yards' distance, seemed to produce absolutely no effect upon her sloping iron roof. Neither did the broadsides of her intended prey, nor the fire of the shore batteries, for even an instant arrest her speed, as, rushing on, she struck the Cumberland, and with her iron prow broke a hole as large as a hogshead in her side. Then, backing away and hovering over her victim at a convenient distance, she raked her decks with shot and shell until, after three-quarters of an hour's combat, the Cumberland and her heroic defenders, who had maintained the fight with unyielding stubbornness, went to the bottom in fifty feet of water with colors flying. Having sunk the Cumberland, the Merrimack next turned her attention to the Congress, which had meanwhile run into shoal water and grounded where the rebel vessel could not follow. But the Merrimack, being herself apparently proof against shot and shell by her iron plating, took up a raking position two cables' length away, and during an hour's firing deliberately reduced the Congress to helplessness and to surrender, her commander being killed and the vessel set on fire. The approach, the maneuvering, and the two successive combats consumed the afternoon, and toward nightfall the Merrimack and her three small consorts that had taken little part in the action withdrew to the rebel batteries on the Virginia shore, not alone because of the approaching darkness and the fatigue of the crew, but because the rebel ship had really suffered considerable damage in ramming the Cumberland, as well as from one or two chance shots that entered her port holes. That same night, while the burning Congress yet lighted up the waters of Hampton Roads, a little ship, as strange-looking and as new to marine warfare as the rebel Turtleback herself, arrived by sea in tow from New York, and receiving orders to proceed at once to the scene of conflict, stationed herself near the grounded Minnesota. This was Erickson's cheese box on a raft, named by him the Monitor, the Union officers, who had witnessed the day's events with dismay, and were filled with gloomy forebodings for the morrow, while welcoming this providential reinforcement, were by no means reassured. The Monitor was only half the size of her antagonist, and had only two guns to the other's ten. But this very disparity proved an essential advantage. With only ten feet draft to the Merrimack's twenty-two, she not only possessed superior mobility, but might run where the Merrimack could not follow. When, therefore, at eight o'clock on Sunday, March 9, the Merrimack again came into Hampton Roads to complete her victory, Lieutenant John L. Warden, commanding the Monitor, steamed boldly out to meet her. Then ensued a three hours naval conflict which held the breathless attention of the active participants and the spectators on ship and shore and for many weeks excited the wonderment of the reading world. If the Monitor's solid 11-inch balls bounded without apparent effect from the sloping roof of the Merrimack, so, in turn, the Merrimack's broadsides passed harmlessly over the low deck of the Monitor, or rebounded from the round sides of her iron turret. When the unwieldy rebel turtleback, with her slow, awkward movement, tried to ram the pointed raft that carried the cheese box, the little vessel, obedient to her rudder, easily glided out of the line of direct impact. Each ship passed through occasional moments of danger, 
but the long three hours encounter ended without other serious damage than an injury to Lieutenant Warden by the explosion of a rebel shell against a crevice of the monitor's pilot house through which he was looking, which temporarily blinding his eyesight, disabled him from command. At that point, the battle ended by mutual consent. The monitor, unharmed by a few unimportant dents in her plating, ran into shoal water to permit surgical attendance to her wounded officer. On her part, the Merrimack, abandoning any further molestation of the other ships, steamed away at noon to her retreat in Elizabeth River. The forty-one rounds fired from the monitor's guns had so far weakened the Merrimack's armor that, added to the injuries of the previous day, it was of the highest prudence to avoid further conflict. A tragic fate soon ended the careers of both vessels. Owing to other military events, the Merrimack was abandoned, burned, and blown up by her officers about two months later. And in the following December, the Monitor foundered in a gale off Cape Hatteras. But the types of these pioneer ironclads, which had demonstrated such unprecedented fighting qualities, were continued. Before the end of the war, the Union Navy had more than 20 monitors in service, and the structure of the Merrimack was, in a number of instances, repeated by the Confederates. The most brilliant of all the exploits of the Navy during the year 1862 were those carried on under the command of Flag Officer David G. Farragut, who, though born a Southerner and residing in Virginia when the rebellion broke out, remained loyal to the government and true to the flag he had served for forty-eight years. Various preparations had been made, and various plans discussed, for an effective attempt against some prominent point on the Gulf Coast. Very naturally, all examinations of the subject inevitably pointed to the opening of the Mississippi as the dominant problem to be solved, and on January 9, Farragut was appointed to the command of the Western Gulf Blockading Squadron, and eleven days thereafter received his confidential instructions to attempt the capture of the city of New Orleans. Thus far in the war, Farragut had been assigned to no prominent service, but the patience with which he had awaited his opportunity was now more than compensated by the energy and thoroughness with which he had superintended the organization of his fleet. By the middle of April, he was in the lower Mississippi with 17 men of war and 177 guns. With him were Commander David D. Porter, in charge of a mortar flotilla of 19 schooners and six armed steamships, and General Benjamin F. Butler, at the head of an army contingent of 6,000 men, soon to be followed by considerable reinforcements. The first obstacle to be overcome was the fire from the twin forts Jackson and St. Philip, situated nearly opposite each other at a bend of the Mississippi, 25 miles above the mouth of the river, while the city of New Orleans itself lies 75 miles farther up the stream. These were formidable forts of masonry, with an armament together of over a hundred guns and garrisons of about 600 men each. They also had auxiliary defenses. First, of a strong river barrier of log rafts and other obstructions connected by powerful chains, half a mile below the forts. Second, of an improvised fleet of sixteen rebel gunboats and a formidable floating battery. None of Farragut's ships were ironclad. He had, from the beginning of the undertaking, maintained the theory that a wooden fleet, properly handled, could successfully pass the batteries of the forts. I would as soon have a paper ship as an ironclad. Only give me men to fight her, he said. He might not come back, but New Orleans would be won. In his hazardous undertaking, his faith was based largely on the skill and courage of his subordinate commanders of ships, and this faith was fully sustained by their gallantry and devotion. Porter's flotilla of nineteen schooners carrying two mortars each, anchored below the forts, maintained a heavy bombardment for five days, and then Farragut decided to try his ships. On the night of the 20th, the daring work of two gunboats cut an opening through the river barrier through which the vessels might pass. And at two o'clock on the morning of April 24, 
Farragut gave the signal to advance. The first division of his fleet, eight vessels, led by Captain Bailey, successfully passed the barrier. The second division of nine ships was not quite so fortunate. Three of them failed to pass the barrier, but the others, led by Farragut himself and his flagship, the Hartford, followed the advance. The starlit night was quickly obscured by the smoke of the general cannonade from both ships and forts, but the heavy batteries of the latter had little effect on the passing fleet. Farragut's flagship was for a short while in great danger. At a moment when she was slightly grounded, a huge fire raft fully ablaze was pushed against her by a rebel tug, and the flames caught in the paint on her side and mounted into her rigging. But this danger had also been provided against, and by heroic efforts the Hartford freed herself from her peril. Immediately above the forts, the fleet of rebel gunboats joined in the battle, which now resolved itself into a series of conflicts between single vessels or small groups. But the stronger and better armed Union ships quickly destroyed the Confederate flotilla, with the single exception that two of the enemy's gunboats rammed the Varuna from opposite sides and sank her. Aside from this, the Union fleet sustained much miscellaneous damage, but no serious injury in the furious battle of an hour and a half. With but a short halt at Quarantine, six miles above the forts, Farragut and his thirteen ships of war pushed on rapidly over the seventy-five miles, and on the forenoon of April 25, New Orleans lay helpless under the guns of the Union fleet. The city was promptly evacuated by the Confederate General Lovell. Meanwhile, General Butler was busy moving his transports and troops around outside by sea to quarantine. And, having occupied that point in force, Forts Jackson and St. Philip capitulated on April 28. This last obstruction removed, Butler, after having garrisoned the forts, brought the bulk of his army up to New Orleans, and on May 1, Farragut turned over to him the formal possession of the city where Butler continued in command of the Department of the Gulf until the following December. Farragut immediately dispatched an advanced section of his fleet up the Mississippi. None of the important cities on its banks below Vicksburg had yet been fortified, and without serious opposition, they surrendered as the Union ships successively reached them. Farragut himself, following with the remainder of his fleet, arrived at Vicksburg on May 20. This city, by reason of the high bluffs on which it stands, was the most defensible point on the whole length of the Great River within the southern states. But so confidently had the Confederates trusted to the strength of their works at Columbus, Island No. 10, Fort Pillow, and other points, that the fortifications of Vicksburg had thus far received comparatively little attention. The recent Union victories, however, both to the north and south, had awakened them to their danger. And when Lovell evacuated New Orleans, he shipped heavy guns and sent five Confederate regiments to Vicksburg. And during the eight days between their arrival on May 12 and the 20th, on which day Farragut reached the city, six rebel batteries were put in readiness to fire on his ships. General Halleck, while pushing his siege works toward Corinth, was notified as early as April 27 that Farragut was coming, and the logic of the situation ought to have induced him to send a cooperating force to Farragut's assistance, or, at the very least, to have matured plans for such cooperation. All the events would have favored an expedition of this kind. When Corinth, at the end of May, fell into Halleck's hands, Forts Pello and Randolph on the Mississippi River were hastily evacuated by the enemy and on June 6, the Union flotilla of river gunboats which had rendered such signal service at Henry, Donelson, and Island No. 10, reinforced by a hastily constructed flotilla of heavy river tugs converted into rams, gained another brilliant victory in a most dramatic naval battle at Memphis, during which an opposing Confederate flotilla of similar rams and gunboats was almost completely destroyed and the immediate evacuation of Memphis by the Confederates thereby forced. 
This left Vicksburg as the single barrier to the complete opening of the Mississippi, and that barrier was defended by only six batteries and a garrison of six Confederate regiments at the date of Farragut's arrival before it. But Farragut had with his expedition only two regiments of troops, and the rebel batteries were situated at such an elevation that the guns of the Union fleet could not be raised sufficiently to silence them. Neither help nor promise of help came from Halleck's army, and Farragut could therefore do nothing but turn his vessels downstream and return to New Orleans. There, about June 1, he received news from the Navy Department that the administration was exceedingly anxious to have the Mississippi opened, and this time, taking with him Porter's mortar flotilla in 3,000 troops, he again proceeded up the river and a second time reached Vicksburg on June 25. The delay, however, had enabled the Confederates greatly to strengthen the fortifications and the garrison of the city. Neither a bombardment from Porter's mortar sloops nor the running of Farragut's ships past the batteries, where they were joined by the Union gunboat flotilla from above, sufficed to bring the Confederates to a surrender. Farragut estimated that a cooperating land force of twelve to 15,000 would have enabled him to take the works, and Halleck, on June 28 and July 3, partially promised early assistance. But on July 14, he reported definitely that it would be impossible for him to render the expected aid. Under these circumstances, the Navy Department ordered Farragut back to New Orleans, lest his ships of deep draft should be detained in the river by a rapidly falling water. The capture of Vicksburg was postponed for a whole year, and the early transfer of Halleck to Washington changed the current of the Western campaigns. End of chapter 20Chapter 21 of A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jude Cater. A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln by John G. Nicolay Chapter 21 McClellan's Illness Lincoln Consults McDowell and Franklin President's Plan Against Manassas McClellan's Plan Against Richmond Cameron and Stanton President's War Order No. 1 Lincoln's Questions to McClellan News from the West Death of Willie Lincoln The Harper's Ferry Fiasco President's War Order No. 3 The News from Hampton Roads Manassas Evacuated Movement to the Peninsula Yorktown The Peninsula Campaign Seven Days' Battles Retreat to Harrison's Landing We have seen how the express orders of President Lincoln in the early days of January 1862 stirred the Western commanders to the beginning of active movements that brought about an important series of victories during the first half of the year. The results of his determination to break a similar military stagnation in the East need now to be related. The gloomy outlook at the beginning of the year has already been mentioned. Finding on January 10 that General McClellan was still ill and unable to see him, he called Generals McDowell and Franklin into conference with himself, Seward, Chase, and the Assistant Secretary of War, and explaining to them his dissatisfaction and distress at existing conditions, said to them that, if something were not done soon, the bottom would fall out of the whole affair. And if General McClellan did not want to use the army, he would like to borrow it, provided he could see how it could be made to do something. 
The two generals, differing on some points, agreed, however, in a memorandum prepared next day at the President's request, that a direct movement against the Confederate Army at Manassas was preferable to a movement by water against Richmond, that preparations for the former could be made in a week, while the latter would require a month or six weeks. Similar discussions were held on the 11th and 12th, and finally on January 13, by which date General McClellan had sufficiently recovered to be present. McClellan took no pains to hide his displeasure at the proceedings, and ventured no explanation when the President asked what and when anything could be done. Chase repeated the direct interrogatory to McClellan himself, inquiring what he intended doing with his army, and when he intended doing it. McClellan stated his unwillingness to develop his plans, but said he would tell them if he was ordered to do so. The President then asked him if he had in his own mind any particular time fixed when a movement could be commenced. McClellan replied that he had. Then, rejoined the President, I will adjourn this meeting. While these conferences were going on, a change occurred in the President's cabinet. Secretary of War Cameron, who had repeatedly expressed a desire to be relieved from the onerous duties of the War Department, was made Minister to Russia, and Edwin M. Stanton appointed to succeed him. Stanton had been Attorney General during the last months of President Buchanan's administration, and, though a lifelong Democrat, had freely conferred and cooperated with Republican leaders in the Senate and House of Representatives in thwarting secession schemes. He was a lawyer of ability and experience, and possessing organizing qualities of a high degree, combined with a strong will and great physical endurance, gave his administration of the War Department a record for efficiency which it will be difficult for any future minister to equal, and for which service his few mistakes and subordinate faults of character will be readily forgotten. In his new functions, Stanton enthusiastically seconded the President's efforts to rouse the Army of the Potomac to speedy and vigorous action. In his famous report, McClellan states that very soon after Stanton became Secretary of War, he explained verbally to the latter his plan of a campaign against Richmond by way of the lower Chesapeake Bay, and at Stanton's direction also explained it to the President. It is not strange that neither the President nor the new Secretary approved it. The reasons which then existed against it in theory, and were afterward demonstrated in practice, are altogether too evident. As this first plan was never reduced to writing, it may be fairly inferred that it was one of those mere suggestions which, like all that had gone before, would serve only to postpone action. The patience of the President was at length so far exhausted that on January 27 he wrote his General War Order No. 1, which directed that the 22nd day of February, 1862, be the day for a general movement of all land and naval forces of the United States against the insurgent forces, and that the Secretaries of War and of the Navy, the General-in-Chief, and all other commanders and subordinates of land and naval forces, will severally be held to their strict and full responsibilities for prompt execution of this order. To leave no doubt of his intention that the Army of the Potomac should make a beginning, the President, four days later, issued his Special War Order No. 1, directing that after providing safely for the defense of Washington, it should move against the Confederate Army at Manassas Junction, on or before the date announced. As McClellan had been allowed to have his way almost without question for six months past, it was perhaps as much through mere habit of opposition as from any intelligent decision in his own mind that he again requested permission to present his objection to the President's plan. Mr. Lincoln thereupon, to bring the discussion to a practical point, wrote him the following list of queries on February 3. My dear sir, you and I have distinct and different plans for a movement of the Army of the Potomac. Yours to be down the Chesapeake, up the Rappahannock to Urbana, and across land to the terminus of the railroad on the York River. Mine, 
to move directly to a point on the railroad southwest of Manassas. If you will give me satisfactory answers to the following questions, I shall gladly yield my plan to yours. First, does not your plan involve a greatly larger expenditure of time and money than mine? Second, wherein is a victory more certain by your plan than mine? Third, wherein is a victory more valuable by your plan than mine? Fourth, in fact, would it not be less valuable in this, that it would break no great line of the enemy's communications, while mine would? Fifth, in case of disaster, would not a retreat be more difficult by your plan than mine? Instead of specifically answering the President's concise interrogatories, McClellan on the following day presented to the Secretary of War a long letter, reciting in much detail his statement of what he had done since coming to Washington, and giving a rambling outline of what he thought might be accomplished in the future prosecution of the war. His reasoning in favor of an advance by Chesapeake Bay upon Richmond instead of against Manassas Junction rests principally upon the assumption that at Manassas the enemy is prepared to resist, while at Richmond there are no preparations. That to win Manassas would give us only the field of battle and the moral effect of a victory, while to win Richmond would give us the rebel capital with its communications and supplies. That at Manassas we would fight on a field chosen by the enemy, while at Richmond we would fight on one chosen by ourselves. If, as a preliminary hypothesis, these comparisons look plausible, succeeding events quickly exposed their fallacy. The President, in his anxious studies and exhaustive discussion with military experts in the recent conferences, fully comprehended that under McClellan's labored strategical theories lay a fundamental error. It was not the capture of a place but the destruction of the rebel armies that was needed to subdue the rebellion. But Mr. Lincoln also saw the fearful responsibility he would be taking upon himself if he forced McClellan to fight against his own judgment and protest, even though that judgment was incorrect. The whole subject, therefore, underwent a new and yet more elaborate investigation. The delay which this rendered necessary was soon greatly lengthened by two other causes. It was about this time that the telegraph brought news from the West of the surrender of Fort Henry, February 6, the investment of Fort Donelson on the 13th, and its surrender on the 16th, incidents which absorbed the constant attention of the President and the Secretary of War. Almost simultaneously, a heavy domestic sorrow fell upon Mr. Lincoln in the serious illness of his son Willie, an interesting and most promising lad of twelve, and his death in the White House on February 20. When February 22 came, while there was plainly no full compliance with the President's War Order No. 1, there was, nevertheless, such promise of a beginning, even at Washington, as justified reasonable expectation. The authorities looked almost hourly for the announcement of two preliminary movements which had been preparing for many days, one to attack rebel batteries on the Virginia shore of the Potomac, the other to throw bridges, one of pontoons, the second a permanent bridge of canal boats, across the river at Harper's Ferry, and an advance by Banks Division on the Winchester to protect the opening of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, and re-establish transportation to and from the West over that important route. On the evening of February 27, Secretary Stanton came to the President and, after locking the door to prevent interruption, opened and read two dispatches from McClellan, who had gone personally to superintend the crossing. The first dispatch from the General described the fine spirits of the troops and the splendid throwing of the pontoon bridge by Captain Duane and his three lieutenants, for whom he at once recommended brevets and the immediate crossing of the 8,500 infantry. This dispatch was dated at 10 o'clock the previous night. The next is not so good, remarked the Secretary of War. 
It stated that the lift rock was too small to permit the canal boats to enter the river, so that it was impossible to construct the permanent bridge. He would therefore be obliged to fall back upon the safe and slow plan of merely covering the reconstruction of the railroad, which would be tedious and make it impossible to seize Winchester. "'What does this mean?' asked the President in amazement. "'It means,' said the Secretary of War, "'that it is a damned fizzle. "'It means that he doesn't intend to do anything.' "'The President's indignation was intense, "'and when, a little later, General Marcy, "'McClellan's father-in-law and chief of staff came in, "'Lincoln's criticism of the affair was in sharper language "'than was his usual habit.' Why, in the name of common sense, said he excitedly, couldn't the general have known whether the canal boats would go through that lock before he spent a million dollars getting them there? I am almost despairing at these results. Everything seems to fail. The impression is daily gaining ground that the general does not intend to do anything. By a failure like this, we lose all the prestige gained by the capture of Fort Donelson. The prediction of the Secretary of War proved correct. That same night, McClellan revoked Hooker's authority to cross the lower Potomac and demolish the rebel batteries about the Occoquan River. It was, doubtless, this Harper's Ferry incident which finally convinced the President that he could no longer leave McClellan entrusted with the sole and unrestricted exercise of military affairs. Yet, that general had shown such decided ability in certain lines of his profession and had plainly in so large a degree won the confidence of the Army of the Potomac itself, that he did not wish entirely to lose the benefit of his services. He still hoped that, once actively started in the field, he might yet develop valuable qualities of leadership. He had substantially decided to let him have his own way in his proposed campaign against Richmond by water, and orders to assemble the necessary vessels had been given before the Harper's Ferry failure was known. Early on the morning of March 8, the President made one more effort to convert McClellan to a direct movement against Manassas, but without success. On the contrary, the General convened 12 of his division commanders in a council, who voted 8-4 to four for the water route. This finally decided the question in the President's mind, but he carefully qualified the decision by two additional war orders of his own, written without consultation. President's General War Order No. 2 directed that the Army of the Potomac should be immediately organized into four Army Corps to be respectively commanded by McDowell, Sumner, Heinzelman, and Keyes, and the fifth under Banks. It is noteworthy that the first three of these had always earnestly advocated the Manassas movement. President's General War Order No. 3 directed, in substance, first, an immediate effort to capture the Potomac batteries. Second, that until that was accomplished, not more than two Army Corps should be started on the Chesapeake campaign toward Richmond. Third, that any Chesapeake movement should begin in ten days. And fourth, that no such movement should be ordered without leaving Washington entirely secure. Even while the President was completing the drafting and copying of these important orders, Events were transpiring which once more put a new face upon the proposed campaign against Richmond. During the forenoon of the next day, March 9, a dispatch was received from Fortress Monroe reporting the appearance of the rebel ironclad Merrimack and the havoc she had wrought the previous afternoon, the Cumberland sunk, the Congress surrendered and burned, the Minnesota aground and about to be attacked. There was a quick gathering of officials at the executive mansion. Secretaries Stanton, Seward, Wells, Generals McClellan, Meggs, Totten, Commodore Smith, and Captain Dahlgren, and a scene of excitement ensued, unequaled by any other in the President's office during the war. Stanton walked up and down like a caged lion, and eager discussion animated cabinet and military officers. Two other dispatches soon came one from the captain of a vessel at Baltimore who had left Fortress Monroe on the evening of the 8th, and a copy of a telegram to the New York Tribune giving more details. President Lincoln was the coolest man in the whole gathering, carefully analyzing the language of the telegrams, 
to give their somewhat confused statements intelligible coherence. Wild suggestions flew from speaker to speaker about the possible danger to be apprehended from the new marine terror, whether she might not be able to go to New York or Philadelphia and levy tribute, to Baltimore or Annapolis to destroy the transports gathered for McClellan's movement, or even to come up the Potomac and burn Washington, and all sorts of prudential measures and safeguards were proposed. In the afternoon, however, apprehension was greatly quieted. That very day, a cable was laid across the bay, giving direct telegraphic communication with Fortress Monroe, and Captain Fox, who happened to be on the spot, concisely reported at about 4 p.m. the dramatic sequel, the timely arrival of the Monitor, the interesting naval battle between the two ironclads, and that at noon the Merrimack had withdrawn from the conflict, and with her three small consorts steamed back into Elizabeth River. Scarcely had the excitement over the Monitor and Merrimack news begun to subside, when, on the same afternoon, a new surprise burst upon the military authorities in a report that the whole Confederate Army had evacuated its stronghold at Manassas and the batteries on the Potomac, and had retired southward to a new line behind the Rappahannock. General McClellan hastened across the river and, finding the news to be correct, issued orders during the night for a general movement of the army next morning to the vacated rebel camps. The march was promptly accomplished, notwithstanding the bad roads, and the troops had the meager satisfaction of hoisting the Union flag over the deserted rebel earthworks. For two weeks the enemy had been preparing for this retreat, and, beginning their evacuation on the 7th, their whole retrograde movement was completed by March 11, by which date they were secure in their new line of defense, prepared for such an emergency, the south bank of the Rappahannock strengthened by field works and provided with a depot of food, writes General Johnston. No further comment is needed to show McClellan's utter incapacity or neglect than that for full two months he had commanded an army of 190,000 present for duty within two days' march of the 47,000 Confederates present for duty, whom he thus permitted to march away to their new strongholds without a gun fired, or even a mediated attack. General McClellan had not only lost the chance of an easy and brilliant victory near Washington, but also the possibility of his favorite plan to move by water to Urbana on the lower Rappahannock, and from there by a land march via West Point toward Richmond. On that route, the enemy was now in his way. He therefore, on March 13, hastily called a council of his corps commanders, who decided that under the new conditions it would be best to proceed by water to Fortress Monroe, and from there move up the peninsula toward Richmond. To this new plan, adopted in the stress of excitement and haste, the President answered through the Secretary of War on the same day. First, Leave such force at Manassas Junction as shall make it entirely certain that the enemy shall not repossess himself of that position and line of communication. Second, leave Washington entirely secure. Third, move the remainder of the force down the Potomac, choosing a new base at Fort Monroe or anywhere between here and there, or, at all events, move such remainder of the army at once in pursuit of the enemy by some route. Two days before, the President had also announced a step which he had doubtless had in contemplation for many days, if not many weeks, namely that Major General McClellan, having personally taken the field at the head of the Army of the Potomac, until otherwise ordered, he is relieved from the command of the other military departments, he retaining command of the Department of the Potomac. This order of March 11 included also the already mentioned consolidation of the western departments under Halleck, and out of the region lying between Halleck's command and McClellan's command, it created the Mountain Department, the command of which he gave to General Fremont, whose reinstatement had been loudly clamored for by many prominent and enthusiastic followers. As the preparations for a movement by water had been in progress since February 27, 
there was little delay in starting the Army of the Potomac on its new campaign. The troops began their embarkation on March 17, and by April 5, over 100,000 men with all their material of war had been transported to Fortress Monroe, where General McClellan himself arrived on the 2nd of the month and issued orders to begin his march on the 4th. Unfortunately, right at the outset of his new campaign, General McClellan's incapacity and want of candor once more became sharply evident. In the plan formulated by the four corps commanders and approved by himself, as well as emphatically repeated by the President's instructions, was the essential requirement that Washington should be left entirely secure. Learning that the general had neglected this positive injunction, the President ordered McDowell's corps to remain for the protection of the Capitol, and when the general complained of this, Mr. Lincoln wrote him on April 9. After you left, I ascertained that less than 20,000 unorganized men, without a single field battery, were all you designed to be left for the defense of Washington and Manassas Junction. And part of this, even, was to go to General Hooker's old position. General Banks's corps, once designed for Manassas Junction, was divided and tied up on the line of Winchester and Strasburg, and could not leave it without again exposing the Upper Potomac and the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. This presented, or would present when McDowell and Sumner should be gone, a great temptation to the enemy to turn back from the Rappahannock and sack Washington. My explicit order that Washington should, by the judgment of all the commanders of corps, be left entirely secure, had been neglected. It was precisely this that drove me to detain McDowell. I do not forget that I was satisfied with your arrangement to leave Banks at Manassas Junction. But when that arrangement was broken up and nothing was substituted for it, of course I was not satisfied. I was constrained to substitute something for it myself. And now allow me to ask... Do you really think I should permit the line from Richmond via Manassas Junction to this city to be entirely open, except what resistance could be presented by less than 20,000 unorganized troops? This is a question which the country will not allow me to evade. By delay, the enemy will relatively gain upon you, that is, he will gain faster by fortifications and reinforcements than you can by reinforcements alone. And once more, let me tell you, it is indispensable to you that you strike a blow. I am powerless to help this. You will do me the justice to remember I always insisted that going down the bay in search of a field, instead of fighting at or near Manassas, was only shifting and not surmounting a difficulty. That we would find the same enemy and the same or equal entrenchments at either place. The country will not fail to note, is noting now, that the present hesitation to move upon an entrenched enemy is but the story of Manassas repeated. General McClellan's expectations in coming to the peninsula, first, that he would find few or no rebel entrenchments, and second, that he would be able to make rapid movements, at once signally failed. On the afternoon of the second day's march, he came to the first line of the enemy's defenses, heavy fortifications at Yorktown on the York River, and a strong line of entrenchments and dams flooding the Warwick River, extending to an impassable inlet from James River. But the situation was not yet desperate. Magruder, the Confederate commander, had only 11,000 men to defend Yorktown and the 13-mile line of the Warwick. McClellan, on the contrary, had 50,000 at hand, and as many more within call, with which to break the Confederate line and continue his proposed rapid movements. But now, without any adequate reconnaissance or other vigorous effort, he at once gave up his thoughts of rapid movement, one of the main advantages he had always claimed for the water route, and adopted the slow expedient of a siege of Yorktown. Not only was his original plan of campaign demonstrated to be faulty, but by this change in the method of its execution, it became fatal. 
It would be weary and exasperating to recount in detail the remaining principal episodes of McClellan's operations to gain possession of the Confederate capital. The whole campaign is a record of hesitation, delay, and mistakes in the chief command, brilliantly relieved by the heroic fighting and endurance of the troops and subordinate officers, gathering honor out of defeat, and shedding the luster of renown over a result of barren failure. McClellan wasted a month raising siege works to bombard Yorktown, when he might have turned the place by two or three days' operations with his superior numbers of four to one. By his failure to give instructions after Yorktown was evacuated, he allowed a single division of his advance guard to be beaten back at Williamsburg, when 30,000 of their comrades were within reach, but without orders. He wrote to the President that he would have to fight double numbers entrenched when his own army was actually twice as strong as that of his antagonist. Placing his army astride the Chickahominy, he afforded that antagonist, General Johnston, the opportunity, at a sudden rise of the river, to fall on one portion of his divided forces at Fair Oaks with overwhelming numbers. Finally, when he was within four miles of Richmond and was attacked by General Lee, he began a retreat to the James River, and after his corps commanders held the attacking enemy at bay by a successful battle on each of six successive days, he, day after day, gave up each field won or held by the valor and blood of his heroic soldiers. On July 1, the collected Union army had made a stand at the Battle of Melvern Hill, inflicting a defeat on the enemy which practically shattered the Confederate army, and in the course of a week caused it to retire within the fortifications of Richmond. During all this magnificent fighting, however, McClellan was oppressed by the apprehension of impending defeat, and even after the brilliant victory of Malvern Hill, continued his retreat to Harrison's Landing, where the Union gunboats on the James River assured him of safety and supplies. It must be borne in mind that this peninsula campaign, from the landing at Fortress Monroe to the battle at Malvern Hill, occupied three full months, and that during the first half of that period the government, yielding to McClellan's constant fault-finding and clamor for reinforcements, sent him 40,000 additional men. Also, that in the opinion of competent critics, both Union and Confederate, he had, after the Battle of Fair Oaks, and twice during the Seven Days Battles, a brilliant opportunity to take advantage of Confederate mistakes, and by a vigorous offensive, to capture Richmond. But constitutional indecision unfitted him to seize the fleeting chances of war. His hope of victory was always overawed by his fear of defeat. While he commanded during a large part of the campaign double and always superior numbers to the enemy, his imagination led him continually to double their strength in his reports. This delusion so wrought upon him that on the night of June 27, he sent the Secretary of War an almost despairing and insubordinate dispatch containing these inexcusable phrases. Had I 20,000 or even 10,000 fresh troops to use tomorrow, I could take Richmond. But I have not a man in reserve, and shall be glad to cover my retreat and save the material and personnel of the army. If I save this army now, I tell you plainly that I owe no thanks to you or to any other persons in Washington. You have done your best to sacrifice this army. Under almost any other ruler, such language would have been quickly followed by trial and dismissal, if not by much severer punishment. But while Mr. Lincoln was shocked by McClellan's disrespect, he was yet more startled by the implied portent of the dispatch. It indicated a loss of confidence and a perturbation of mind, which rendered possible even a surrender of the whole army. The President, therefore, with his habitual freedom from passion, merely sent an unmoved and kind reply. Save your army at all events. We'll send reinforcements as fast as we can. Of course they cannot reach you today, tomorrow, or next day. I have not said you were ungenerous for saying you needed reinforcements. I thought you were ungenerous in assuming that I did not send them as fast as I could. 
I feel any misfortune to you and your army quite as keenly as you feel it yourself. If you have had a drawn battle or a repulse, it is the price we pay for the enemy not being in Washington. End of chapter 21「XXII of A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jude Cater A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln by John G. Nicolay. Chapter 22. Jackson's Valley Command. Lincoln's Visit to Scott. Pope Assigned to Command. Lee's Attack on McClellan. Retreat to Harrison's Landing. Seward Sent to New York. Lincoln's Letter to Seward. Lincoln's Letter to McClellan. Lincoln's visit to McClellan. Halleck made general-in-chief. Halleck's visit to McClellan. Withdrawal from Harrison's Landing. Pope assumes command. Second Battle of Bull Run. The Cabinet Protest. McClellan ordered to defend Washington. The Maryland Campaign. Battle of Antietam. Lincoln visits Antietam. Lincoln's letter to McClellan. McClellan removed from command. During the month of May, while General McClellan was slowly working his way across the Chickahominy by bridge building and entrenching, there occurred the episode of Stonewall Jackson's Valley Campaign in which that eccentric and daring Confederate commander made a rapid and victorious march up the Shenandoah Valley, nearly to Harper's Ferry. Its principal effect upon the Richmond campaign was to turn back McDowell, who had been started on a land march to unite with the right wing of McClellan's army, under instructions, however, always to be in readiness to interpose his force against any attempt of the enemy to march upon Washington. This campaign of Stonewall Jackson's has been much lauded by military writers, but its temporary success resulted from good luck rather than military ability. Rationally considered, it was an imprudent and even reckless adventure that courted and would have resulted in destruction or capture had the junction of forces under McDowell, Shields, and Fremont, ordered by President Lincoln, not been thwarted by the mistake and delay of Fremont. It was an episode that signally demonstrated the wisdom of the President in having retained McDowell's Corps for the protection of the National Capital. That, however, was not the only precaution to which the President had devoted his serious attention. During the whole of McClellan's Richmond campaign, he had continually borne in mind the possibility of his defeat, and the eventualities it might create. Little by little, that general's hesitation, constant complaints, and exaggerated reports of the enemy's strength changed the president's apprehensions from possibility to probability, and he took prompt measures to be prepared as far as possible should a new disaster arise. On January 24, he made a hurried visit to the veteran General Scott at West Point for consultation on the existing military conditions and on his return to Washington called General Pope from the West, and, by an order dated June 26, specially assigned him to the command of the combined forces under Fremont, Banks, and McDowell, to be called the Army of Virginia, whose duty it should be to guard the Shenandoah Valley in Washington City, and, as far as might be, render aid to McClellan's campaign against Richmond. The very day on which the President made this order proved to be the crisis of McClellan's campaign. 
That was the day he had fixed upon for a general advance, but so far from realizing this hope, it turned out also to be the day on which General Lee began his attack on the Army of the Potomac, which formed the beginning of the Seven Days' Battles, and changed McClellan's intended advance against Richmond to a retreat to the James River. It was after midnight of the next day that McClellan sent Stanton his despairing and insubordinate dispatch, indicating the possibility of losing his entire army. Upon the receipt of this alarming piece of news, President Lincoln instantly took additional measures of safety. He sent a telegram to General Burnside in North Carolina to come with all the reinforcements he could spare to McClellan's help. Through the Secretary of War, he instructed General Halleck at Corinth to send 25,000 infantry to McClellan by way of Baltimore and Washington. His most important action was to begin the formation of a new army. On the same day, he sent Secretary of State Seward to New York with a letter to be confidentially shown to such governors of states as could be hurriedly called together, setting forth his view of the present condition of the war and his own determination in regard to its prosecution. After outlining the reverse at Richmond and the new problems it created, the letter continued, What should be done is to hold what we have in the West, open the Mississippi, and take Chattanooga and East Tennessee without more. A reasonable force should in every event be kept about Washington for its protection. Then let the country give us a 100,000 new troops in the shortest possible time, which, added to McClellan directly or indirectly, will take Richmond without endangering any other place which we now hold, and will substantially end the war. I expect to maintain this contest until successful, or till I die, or am conquered, or my term expires, or Congress or the country forsake me. And I would publicly appeal to the country for this new force, were it not that I fear a general panic and stampede would follow, so hard it is to have a thing understood as it really is. Meanwhile, by the news of the victory of Malvern Hill and the secure position to which McClellan had retired at Harrison's Landing, the President learned that the condition of the Army of the Potomac was not as desperate as at first had seemed. The result of Seward's visit to New York is shown in the President's letter of July 2, answering McClellan's urgent call for heavy reinforcements. The idea of sending you 50,000 or any other considerable force promptly is simply absurd. If in your frequent mention of responsibility, you have the impression that I blame you for not doing more than you can. Please be relieved of such an impression. I only beg that in like manner you will not ask impossibilities of me. If you think you are not strong enough to take Richmond just now, I do not ask you to try just now. Save the Army, material and personnel, and I will strengthen it for the offensive again as fast as I can. The governors of 18 states offer me a new levy of 300,000, which I accept. And in another letter, two days later, To reinforce you so as to enable you to resume the offensive within a month or even six weeks is impossible. Under these circumstances, the defensive for the present must be your only care. Save the army. First, where you are, if you can. Secondly, by removal, if you must. To satisfy himself more fully about the actual situation, the President made a visit to Harrison's Landing on July 8 and 9 and held personal interviews with McClellan and his leading generals. While the question of removing the army underwent considerable discussion, the President left it undecided for the present. But on July 11, soon after his return to Washington, he issued an order that Major General Henry W. Halleck be assigned to command the whole land forces of the United States as General-in-Chief, and that he repair to this capital so soon as he can with safety to the positions and operations within the department now under his charge. 
Though General Halleck was loath to leave his command in the West, he made the necessary dispositions there, and in obedience to the President's order, reached Washington on July 23, and assumed command of all the armies as General-in-Chief. On the day following, he proceeded to General McClellan's headquarters at Harrison's Landing, and after two days' consultation, reached the same conclusion at which the President had already arrived, that the Army of the Potomac must be withdrawn. McClellan strongly objected to this course. He wished to be reinforced so that he might resume his operations against Richmond. To do this, he wanted 50,000 more men, which number it was impossible to give him, as he had already been pointedly informed by the President. On Halleck's return to Washington, it was, on further consultation, resolved to bring the Army of the Potomac back to Aquia Creek and unite it with the Army of Pope. On July 30, McClellan received a preliminary order to send away his sick, and the withdrawal of his entire force was ordered by telegraph on August 3. With the obstinacy and persistence that characterized his course from first to last, McClellan still protested against the change, and when Halleck in a calm letter answered his objections with both the advantages and the necessity of the order, McClellan's movement of withdrawal was so delayed that fully eleven days of inestimable time were unnecessarily lost, and the army of Pope was thereby put in serious peril. Meanwhile, under President Lincoln's order of June 26, General Pope had left the West, and about the 1st of July reached Washington, where for two weeks, in consultation with the President and the Secretary of War, he studied the military situation, and on July 14 assumed command of the Army of Virginia, consisting of the Corps of General Fremont, 11,500 strong, and that of General Banks, 8,000 strong, in the Shenandoah Valley, and the Corps of General McDowell, 18,500 strong, with one division at Manassas and the other at Fredericksburg. It is unnecessary to relate in detail the campaign which followed. Pope intelligently and faithfully performed the task imposed on him to concentrate his forces and hold in check, which began as soon as the Confederates learned of the evacuation of Harrison's Landing. When the Army of the Potomac was ordered to be withdrawn, it was clearly enough seen that the movement might put the Army of Virginia in jeopardy. But it was hoped that if the transfer to Aquia Creek and Alexandria were made as promptly as the order contemplated, the two armies would be united before the enemy could reach them. McClellan, however, continued day after day to protest against the change, and made his preparations and embarkation with such exasperating slowness as showed that he still hoped to induce the government to change its plans. Pope, despite the fact he had managed his retreat with skill and bravery, was attacked by Lee's army, and fought the Second Battle of Bull Run on August 30, under the disadvantage of having one of McClellan's divisions entirely absent, and the other failing to respond to his order to advance to the attack on the first day. McClellan had reached Alexandria on August 24, and notwithstanding telegram after telegram from Halleck ordering him to push Franklin's division out to Pope's support, excuse and delay seemed to be his only response, ending at last in his direct suggestion that Franklin's division be kept to defend Washington and Pope be left to get out of his scrape as best he might. McClellan's conduct and language had awakened the indignation of the whole cabinet, roused Stanton to fury, and greatly outraged the feelings of President Lincoln. But even under such irritation, the President was, as ever, the very incarnation of cool, dispassionate judgment, allowing nothing but the daily and hourly logic of facts to influence his suggestions or decision. In these moments of crisis and danger, he felt more keenly than ever the awful responsibilities of rulership, and that the fate of the nation hung upon his words and acts from hour to hour. His official counselors, equally patriotic and sincere, were not his equals in calmness of temper. On Friday, August 29, Stanton went to Chase, and after an excited conference drew up a memorandum of protest, to be signed by members of the cabinet, which drew a gloomy picture of present and apprehended dangers, 
and recommended the immediate removal of McClellan from command. Chase and Stanton signed the paper, as also did Bates, whom they immediately consulted, and somewhat later Smith added his signature. But when they presented it to Wells, he firmly refused, stating that though he concurred with them in judgment, it would be discourteous and unfriendly to the President to adopt such a course. They did not go to Seward and Blair, apparently believing them to be friendly to McClellan, and therefore probably unwilling to give their assent. The refusal of Mr. Wells to sign had evidently caused a more serious discussion among them about the form and language of the protest, for on Monday, September 1, it was entirely rewritten by Bates, cut down to less than half its original length as drafted by Stanton, and once more signed by the same four members of the cabinet. Presented for the second time to Mr. Wells, he reiterated his objection and again refused his signature. Though in the new form it bore the signatures of a majority of the cabinet, the paper was never presented to Mr. Lincoln. The signers may have adopted the feeling of Mr. Wells that it was discourteous, or they may have thought that with only four members of the cabinet for it and three against it, it would be ineffectual. The defeat of Pope became final and conclusive on the afternoon of August 30, and his telegram announcing it conveyed an intimation that he had lost control of his army. President Lincoln had, therefore, to confront a most serious crisis and danger. Even without having seen the written and signed protest, he was well aware of the feelings of the cabinet against McClellan. With what began to look like a serious conspiracy among McClellan's officers against Pope, with Pope's army in a disorganized retreat upon Washington, with the capital in possible danger of capture by Lee, and with a distracted and half-mutinous cabinet, the President had need of all his caution and all his wisdom. Both his patience and his judgment proved equal to the demand. On Monday, September 1, repressing every feeling of indignation, and solicitous only to make every expedient contribute to the public safety, he called McClellan from Alexandria to Washington and asked him to use his personal influence with the officers who had been under his command to give a hearty and loyal support to Pope as a personal favor to their former general, and McClellan at once sent a telegram in this spirit. That afternoon also, Mr. Lincoln dispatched a member of General Halleck's staff to the Virginia side of the Potomac, who reported the disorganization and discouragement among the retreating troops as even more than had been expected. Worse than all, Halleck, the general-in-chief, who was much worn out by the labors of the past few days, seemed either unable or unwilling to act with prompt direction and command equal to the emergency, though still willing to give his advice and suggestion. Under such conditions, Mr. Lincoln saw that it was necessary for him personally to exercise at the moment his military functions and authority as commander-in-chief of the Army and Navy. On the morning of September 2, therefore, he gave a verbal order which during the day was issued in regular form as coming from the general-in-chief, that Major General McClellan be placed in command of the fortifications around Washington and the troops for the defense of the capital. Mr. Lincoln made no concealment of his belief that McClellan had acted badly toward Pope and really wanted him to fail. But there is no one in the army who can man these fortifications and lick these troops of ours into shape half as well as he can, he said. We must use the tools we have. If he cannot fight himself, he excels in making others ready to fight. It turned out that the Second Battle of Bull Run had by no means so seriously disorganized the Union Army as was reported, and that Washington had been exposed to no real danger. The Confederate Army hovered on its front door for a day or two, but made neither attack nor demonstration. Instead of this, Lee entered upon a campaign into Maryland, hoping that his presence might stimulate a secession revolt in that state, and possibly create the opportunity successfully to attack Baltimore or Philadelphia. Pope having been relieved and sent to another department, McClellan soon restored order among the troops, and displayed unwanted energy and vigilance in watching the movements of the enemy, as Lee gradually moved his forces northwestward toward Leesburg, 
thirty miles from Washington, where he crossed the Potomac and took position at Frederick, ten miles farther away. McClellan gradually followed the movement of the enemy, keeping the Army of the Potomac constantly in a position to protect both Washington and Baltimore against an attack. In this way it happened that, without any order or express intention on the part of either the general or the president, McClellan's duty became imperceptibly changed from that of merely defending Washington City to that of an active campaign into Maryland to follow the Confederate Army. This movement into Maryland was begun by both armies about September 4. On the 13th of that month, McClellan had reached Frederick, while Lee was by that time across the Catoctin Range at Boonesboro, but his army was divided. He had sent a large part of it back across the Potomac to capture Harper's Ferry and Martinsburg. On that day there fell into McClellan's hands the copy of an order issued by General Lee three days before, which, as McClellan himself states in his report, fully disclosed Lee's plans. The situation was, therefore, as follows. It was splendid September weather, with the roads in fine condition. McClellan commanded a total moving force of more than 80,000, Lee a total moving force of 40,000. The Confederate Army was divided. Each of the separate portions was within 20 miles of the Union columns and before half-past six on the evening of September 13th, McClellan had full knowledge of the enemy's plans. General Palfrey, an intelligent critic friendly to McClellan, distinctly admits the Union Army, properly commanded, could have absolutely annihilated the Confederate forces. But the result proved quite different. Even such advantages in McClellan's hands failed to rouse him to vigorous and decisive action. As usual, Hesitation and tardiness characterized the orders and movements of the Union forces, and during the four days succeeding, Lee had captured Harper's Ferry with 11,000 prisoners and 73 pieces of artillery, reunited his army, and fought the defensive battle of Antietam on September 17 with almost every Confederate soldier engaged, while one-third of McClellan's army was not engaged at all and the remainder went into action piecemeal and successively, under such orders that cooperative movement and mutual support were practically impossible. Substantially, it was a drawn battle, with appalling slaughter on both sides. Even after such a loss of opportunity, there still remained a precious balance of advantage in McClellan's hands. Because of its smaller total numbers, the Confederate Army was disproportionately weakened by the losses in battle. The Potomac River was almost immediately behind it, and had McClellan renewed his attack on the morning of the 18th, as several of his best officers advised, a decisive victory was yet within his grasp. But with his usual hesitation, notwithstanding the arrival of two divisions of reinforcements, he waited all day to make up his mind. He indeed gave orders to renew the attack at daylight on the 19th. But before that time, the enemy had retreated across the Potomac, and McClellan telegraphed, apparently with great satisfaction, that Maryland was free and Pennsylvania safe. The President watched the progress of this campaign with an eagerness born of the lively hope that it might end the war. He sent several telegrams to the startled Pennsylvania authorities to assure them that Philadelphia and Harrisburg were in no danger. He ordered a reinforcement of 21,000 to join McClellan. He sent a prompting telegram to that general, Please do not let him, the enemy, get off without being hurt. He recognized the Battle of Antietam as a substantial, if not complete, victory, and seized the opportunity it afforded him to issue his preliminary proclamation of emancipation on September 22. For two weeks after the Battle of Antietam, General McClellan kept his army camped on various parts of the field, and so far from exhibiting any disposition of advancing against the enemy in the Shenandoah Valley, showed constant apprehension lest the enemy might come and attack him. On October 1, the President and several friends made a visit to Antietam, and during the three succeeding days reviewed the troops and went over the various battlegrounds in company with the General. 
The better insight which the President thus received of the nature and results of the late battle served only to deepen in his mind the conviction he had long entertained, how greatly McClellan's defects overbalanced his merits as a military leader, and his impatience found vent in a phrase of biting irony. In a morning walk with a friend, waving his arm toward the white tents of the great army, he asked, Do you know what that is? The friend, not catching the drift of his thought, said, It is the Army of the Potomac, I suppose. So it is called, responded the President, in a tone of suppressed indignation. But that is a mistake. It is only McClellan's bodyguard. At that time, General McClellan commanded a total force of 100,000 men present for duty under his immediate eye, and 73,000 present for duty under General Banks about Washington. It is, therefore, not to be wondered at that on October 6, the second day after Mr. Lincoln's return to Washington, the following telegram went to the general from Halleck. I am instructed to telegraph you as follows. The president directs that you cross the Potomac and give battle to the enemy, or drive him south. Your army must move now while the roads are good. If you cross the river between the enemy and Washington, and cover the latter by your operation, you can be reinforced with 30,000 men. If you move up the valley of the Shenandoah, not more than 12,000 or 15,000 can be sent to you. The President advises the interior line between Washington and the enemy, but does not order it. He is very desirous that your army move as soon as possible. You will immediately report what line you adopt and when you intend to cross the river. Also, to what point the reinforcements are to be sent. It is necessary that the plan of your operations be positively determined on before orders are given for building bridges and repairing railroads. I am directed to add that the Secretary of War and the General-in-Chief fully concur with the President in these instructions. This express order was reinforced by a long letter from the President dated October 13, specifically pointing out the decided advantages McClellan possessed over the enemy, and suggesting a plan of campaign even to details, the importance and value of which was self-evident. You remember my speaking to you of what I call your overcautiousness. Are you not overcautious when you assume that you cannot do what the enemy is constantly doing? Should you not claim to be at least his equal in prowess and act upon the claim? Change positions with the enemy, and think you not he would break your communication with Richmond within the next 24 hours? You dread his going into Pennsylvania, but if he does so in full force, he gives up his communications to you absolutely, and you have nothing to do but to follow and ruin him. If he does so with less than full force, fall upon and beat what is left behind all the easier. Exclusive of the water line, you are now nearer Richmond than the enemy is by the route that you can and he must take. Why can you not reach there before him, unless you admit that he is more than your equal on a march? His route is the arc of a circle, while yours is the cord. The roads are as good on yours as on his. You know I desired, but did not order, you to cross the Potomac below instead of above the Shenandoah and Blue Ridge. My idea was that this would at once menace the enemy's communications, which I would seize if he would permit. If he should move northward, I would follow him closely, holding his communications. If he should prevent our seizing his communications and move toward Richmond, I would press closely to him, fight him if a favorable opportunity should present, and at least try to beat him to Richmond on the inside track. I say try. If we never try, we shall never succeed. If he makes a stand at Winchester, moving neither north nor south, I would fight him there, on the idea that if we cannot beat him where he bears the wastage of coming to us, we never can when we bear the wastage of going to him. But advice, expostulation, argument, orders were all wasted, now as before, on the unwilling, hesitating general. When he had frittered away another full month in preparation, 
in slowly crossing the Potomac and in moving east of the Blue Ridge and massing his army about Warrenton, a short distance south of the battlefield of Bull Run, without a vigorous offensive or any discernible intention to make one, the President's patience was finally exhausted, and on November 5 he sent him an order removing him from command. And so ended General McClellan's military career. End of chapter 22「23 of a short life of Abraham Lincoln。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alana Jordan. A short life of Abraham Lincoln by John G. Nicolay. Chapter 23. Cameron's Report. Lincoln's Letter to Bancroft. Annual Message on Slavery. The Delaware Experiment Joint Resolution on Compensated Abolishment First Border State Interview Stevens Comment District of Columbia Abolishment Committee on Abolishment Hunter's Order Revoked Anti-Slavery Measures of Congress Second Border State Interview Emancipation Proposed and Postponed The relation to the war to the institution of slavery has been touched upon in describing several incidents which occurred during 1891, namely the designation of fugitive states as contraband. The Crittenden Resolution and the Confiscation Act of the Special Session of Congress, issuing and revocation of Fremont's proclamation, and various orders relating to contrabands in Union camps. The already mentioned resignation of Secretary Cameron had also grown out of a similar question. In the form in which it was first printed, his report as Secretary of War to the annual session of Congress, which met on December 3, 1861, announced, If it shall be found that the men who have been held by the rebels as slaves are capable of bearing arms and performing efficient military service, it is the right, and may become the duty, of the government to arm and equip them and employ their services against the rebels under proper military regulation, discipline, and command. The President was not prepared to permit a member of his cabinet, without his consent, to commit the administration to so radical a policy at that early date. He caused the advanced copies of the document to be recalled and modified to the simple declaration that fugitive and abandoned slaves being clearly an important military resource, should not be returned to rebel masters, but withheld from the enemy to be disposed of in future as Congress might deem best. Mr. Lincoln saw clearly enough what a serious political role the slavery question was likely to play during the continuance of the war, replying to a letter from the Honorable George Bancroft, in which that accomplished historian predicted that posterity would not be satisfied with the results of the war unless it should affect an increase of the free states, the President wrote, The main thought in the closing paragraph of your letter is one which does not escape my attention, and with which I must deal in all due caution, and with the best judgment I can bring to it. This caution was abundantly manifested in his annual message to Congress, of December 3, 1861. In considering the policy to be adopted for suppressing the insurrection, he wrote, I have been anxious and careful that the inevitable conflict for this purpose shall not degenerate into a violent and remorseless revolutionary struggle. I have, therefore, in every case, thought it proper to keep the integrity of the Union prominent as the primary object of the contest on our part leaving all questions which are not of vital military importance to the more deliberate action of the legislature. The Union must be preserved, and hence all indispensable means must be employed. We should not be in haste to determine that radical and extreme measures, which may reach the loyal as well as the disloyal, are indispensable. 
the most conservative opinion could not take alarm at phraseology so guarded and at the same time so decided and yet it proved broad enough to include every great exigency which the conflict still had in store mr lincoln had indeed already maturely considered and in his own mind adopted a plan of dealing with the slavery question the simple plan which while a member of congress he had proposed for adoption in the district of columbia the plan of voluntary compensated abolishment at that time local and national prejudice stood in the way of its practicability but to his logical and reasonable mind it seemed now that the new conditions opened for it a prospect at least of initial success in the late presidential election the little state of delaware had by a fusion between bell and the lincoln vote chosen a union member of congress who identified himself in thought and action with the new administration while delaware was a slave state only the merest remnant of the institution existed there seventeen hundred and ninety eight slaves all told without any public announcement of his purpose the president now proposed to the political leaders of delaware through their representative a scheme for the gradual emancipation of these seven hundred and ninety-eight slaves on the payment therefore by the united states at the rate of four hundred dollars per slave in annual installments during thirty-one years to that state the sum to be distributed by it to the individual owners the president believed that if delaware could be induced to take this step maryland might follow and that these examples would create a sentiment that would lead other states into the same easy and beneficent path but the ancient prejudice still had its relentless grip upon some of the delaware lawmakers a majority of the delaware house indeed voted to entertain the scheme but five of the nine members of the delaware senate with hot partisan anathemas scornfully repelled the abolition bribe as they called it and the project withered in the bud mr lincoln did not stop at the failure of his delaware experiment but at once took an appeal to a broader section of public opinion on march sixth eighteen sixty two he sent a special message to the two houses of congress recommending the adoption of the following joint resolution resolved that the united states ought to cooperate with any state which may adopt gradual abolishment of slavery giving to such state pecuniary aid to be used by such state in its discretion to compensate for the inconveniences public and private produced by such change of system the point is not said his explanatory message that all the states tolerating slavery would very soon if at all initiate emancipation but that while the offer is equally made to all the more northern shall by such initiation make it certain to the more southern that in no event will the former ever join the latter in their proposed confederacy i say initiation because in my judgment gradual and not sudden emancipation is better for all such a proposition on the part of the general government sets up no claim of a right by federal authority to interfere with slavery within state limits preferring as it does the absolute control of the subject in each case to the state and its people immediately interested it is proposed as a matter of perfectly free choice with them in the annual message last december i thought fit to say the union must be preserved and hence all indispensable means must be employed i said this not hastily but deliberately war has been made and continues to be an indispensable means to this end a practical reacknowledgment of the national authority would render the war necessary and it would at once cease if however resistance continues the war must also continue and it is impossible to foresee all the incidents which may attend and all the ruin which may follow it such as may seem indispensable or may obviously promise great efficiency toward ending the struggle must and will come the republican journals of the north devoted considerable discussion to the president's message and plan which in the main were very favorably received objection was made however in some quarters 
that the proposition would be likely to fail on the score of expense, and this objection the President conclusively answered in a private letter to a senator. As to the expensiveness of the plan of gradual emancipation with compensation proposed in the late message, please allow me one or two brief suggestions. Less than one half-day's cost of this war would pay for all the slaves in Delaware at $400 per head. Again, less than 87 days' cost of this war would, at the same price, pay for all in Delaware, Maryland, District of Columbia, Kentucky, and Missouri. Do you doubt that taking the initiatory steps on the part of those states and this district would shorten the war more than 87 days and thus be an actual saving of expense? Four days after transmitting the message, the President called together the delegations in Congress from the border slave states, and in a long and earnest personal interview, in which he repeated and enforced the arguments of his message, urged upon them the expediency of adopting his plan, which he assured them he had proposed in the most friendly spirit, and with no intent to injure the interests or wound the sensibilities of the slave states. On the day following this interview, the House of Representatives adopted the joint resolution by more than a two-thirds vote, ayes 89, nays 31. Only a very few of the border state members had the courage to vote in the affirmative. The Senate also passed the joint resolution by about a similar party division not quite a month later, the delay occurring through press of business rather than unwillingness. As yet, however, the scheme was tolerated rather than heartily endorsed by the more radical elements in Congress. Stevens, the cynical Republican leader of the House of Representatives, said, I confess I have not been able to see what makes one side so anxious to pass it and the other side so anxious to defeat it. I think it is about the most diluted milk-and-water gruel proposition that was ever given to the American nation. But the bulk of the Republicans, though it proposed no immediate practical legislation, nevertheless voted for it as a declaration of purpose and harmony without a pending measure, and as being, on the one hand, a tribute to anti-slavery opinion in the North, and, on the other, an expression of liberality toward the border states. The concurrent measure of practical legislation was a bill for the immediate emancipation of the slaves in the District of Columbia on the payment to their loyal owners of an average sum of $300 for each slave and for the appointment of a commission to assess and award the amount. The bill was introduced early in the session and its discussion was much stimulated by the President's special message and joint resolution. Like other anti-slavery measures, it was opposed by the Democrats and supported by the Republicans, but with trifling exceptions, and by the same majority of two-thirds was passed by the Senate on April 3, and the House on April 11, and became a law by the President's signature on April 16. The Republic majority in Congress, as well as the President, was thus pledged to the policy of compensated abolishment, both by the promise of the joint resolution and the fulfillment carried out in the district bill. If the representatives and senators of the border slave states had shown a willingness to accept the generosity of the government, they could have avoided the pecuniary sacrifice which overtook the slave owners in those states not quite three years later. On April 14, in the House of Representatives, the subject was taken up by Mr. White of Indiana, at whose insistence a select committee on emancipation, consisting of nine members, a majority of whom were from border slave states, was appointed. And this committee, on July 16, reported a comprehensive bill authorizing the President to give compensation at the rate of $300 for each slave to any one of the states of Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, Kentucky, Tennessee, and Missouri that might adopt immediate or gradual emancipation. Some subsequent proceedings on this subject occurred in Congress in the case of Missouri, but as to the other states named in the bill, 
either the neglect or open opposition of their people and representatives and senators prevented any further action from the committee meanwhile a new incident once more brought the question of military emancipation into sharp public discussion on may nine general david hunter commanding the department of the south which consisted mainly of some sixty or seventy miles of the south carolina coast between north adisto river and warsaw sound embracing the famous sea island cotton region which fell into union hands by the capture of port royal in eighteen sixty one issued a military order which declared slavery and martial law in a free country are altogether incompatible the persons in these three states georgia florida and south carolina heretofore held as slaves are therefore declared forever free the news of this order coming by the slow course of ocean mails greatly surprised mr lincoln and his first comment on it was positive and emphatic no commanding general shall do such a thing upon my responsibility without consulting me he wrote to secretary chase three days later may nineteenth eighteen sixty two he published a proclamation declaring hunter's order entirely unauthorized and void by adding i further make known that whether it be competent for me as commander-in-chief of the army and navy to declare the slaves of any state or states free whether at any time in any case it shall have become a necessity indispensable to the maintenance of the government to exercise such supposed power are questions which under my responsibility i reserve to myself and which i cannot feel justified in leaving to the decision of commanders in the field these are totally different questions from those of police regulations in armies and camps this distinct reservation of executive power an equally plain announcement of the contingency which would justify its exercise was coupled with a renewed recital of his plan an offer of compensated abolishment and reinforced by a powerful appeal to the public opinion of the border slave states i do not argue continued the proclamation i beseech you to make the arguments for yourselves you cannot if you would be blind to the signs of the times i beg of you a calm and enlarged consideration of them ranging if it may be far above personal and partisan politics this proposal makes common cause for a common object casting no reproaches upon any it acts not the pharisee the change it contemplates would come gently as the dews of heaven not rending or wrecking anything will you not embrace it so much good has not been done by one effort in all past time as in the providence of god it is now your high privilege to do may the vast future not have to lament that you have neglected it this proclamation of president lincoln's naturally created considerable and very diverse comment but much less than would have occurred had not military events intervened which served in a great degree to absorb public attention at the date of the proclamation mcclellan with the army of the potomac was just reaching the chickahominy in his campaign toward richmond stonewall jackson was about beginning his startling raid into the shenandoah valley and halleck was pursuing his somewhat leisurely campaign against corinth on the day following the proclamation the victorious fleet of farragut reached vicksburg in its first ascent of the mississippi congress was busy with the multifarious work that crowded the closing weeks of the long session and among this congressional work the debates and proceedings upon several measures of positive and immediate anti-slavery legislation were significant signs of the times during the season and before it ended acts or amendments were passed prohibiting the army from returning fugitive slaves recognizing the independence and sovereignty of haiti and liberia providing for carrying into effect the treaty with england to suppress the african slave trade restoring the missouri compromise and extending its provisions to all united states territories 
greatly increasing the scope of the Confiscation Act in freeing slaves actually employed in hostile military service and giving the President authority, if not in express terms, at least by easy implication, to organize and arm Negro regiments for the war. But between the President's proclamation and the adjournment of Congress military affairs underwent a most discouraging change. McClellan's advance upon Richmond became a retreat to Harrison's Landing. Halleck captured nothing but empty forts at Corinth. Farragut found no cooperation at Vicksburg and returned to New Orleans, leaving its hostile guns still barring the commence of the Great River. Still worse, the country was plunged into gloomy forebodings by the President's call for 300,000 new troops. About a week before the adjournment of Congress, the President again called together the delegations from the border slave states and read to them, in a carefully prepared paper, a second and most urgent appeal to adopt his plan of compensated abolishment. Let the states which are in rebellion See definitely and certainly that in no event will the states you represent ever join their proposed confederacy, and they cannot much longer maintain the contest. But you cannot divest them of their hope to ultimately have you with them so long as you show a determination to perpetuate the institution within your own states. Beat them at elections, as you have overwhelmingly done, and nothing daunted, they still claim you as their own. You and I know what the lever of their power is. Break that lever before their faces, and they can shake you no more forever. If the war continues long, as it must if the object be not sooner attained, the institution in your states will be extinguished by mere friction and abrasion, by the mere incidents of the war. It will be gone, and you will have nothing valuable in lieu of it. Much of its value is gone already. How much better for you and for your people to take the step which at once shortens the war and secures substantial compensation for that which is sure to be wholly lost in any other event? How much better to thus save the money which else we sink forever in the war? Our common country is in great peril, demanding the loftiest views and boldest action to bring it speedy relief. Once relieved, its form of government is saved to the world, its beloved history and cherished memories are vindicated, and its happy future fully assured and rendered inconceivably grand. To you, more than to any others, the privilege is given to assure that happiness and swell that grandeur, and to link your own names therewith forever. Even while the delegations listened, Mr. Lincoln could see that events had not yet ripened their minds to the acceptance of his proposition. In their written replies, submitted a few days afterward, two-thirds of them united in a qualified refusal, which, while recognizing the President's patriotism and reiterating their own loyalty, urged a number of rather unsubstantial excuses. The minority replies promised to submit the proposal fairly, to the people of their states, but could, of course, give no assurance that it would be welcomed by their constituents. The interview itself only served to confirm the President in an alternative course of action upon which his mind had doubtless dwelt for a considerable time with intense solicitude, and which is best presented in the words of his own recital. It had got to be, said he, in a conversation with the artist F. B. Carpenter, Midsummer, 1862, things had gone on from bad to worse, until I felt that we had reached the end of our rope on the plan of operations we had been pursuing, that we had about played our last card, and must change our tactics or lose the game. I now determined upon the adoption of the emancipation policy, and, without consultation with or the knowledge of the cabinet, I prepared the original draft of the proclamation, and after much anxious thought, called a cabinet meeting upon the subject. All were present, excepting Mr. Blair, the Postmaster General, who was absent at the opening of the discussion, but came in subsequently. I said to the cabinet, 
that I had resolved upon this step, and had not called them together to ask their advice, but to lay the subject matter of a proclamation before them, suggestions as to which would be in order after they had heard it read. It was on July 22nd that the President read to his cabinet the draft of this first Emancipation Proclamation, which, after a formal warning against continuing the rebellion, was in the following words, And I hereby make it known that it is my purpose, upon the next meeting of Congress, to again recommend the adoption of a practical measure for tendering pecuniary aid to the free choice or rejection of any and all states which may then be recognizing and practically sustaining the authority of the United States, and which may then have voluntarily adopted, or thereafter may voluntarily adopt, gradual abolishment of slavery within such state or states, that the object is to practically restore, thenceforward to be maintained, the constitutional relation between the general government and each and all the states wherein that relation is now suspended or disturbed, and that for this object the war, as it has been, will be prosecuted. And as a fit and necessary military measure for effecting this object, I, as Commander-in-Chief of the Army and Navy of the United States, do order and declare that on the first day of January, in the year of our Lord, 1,863, all persons held as slaves within any state or states wherein the constitutional authority of the United States shall not then be practically recognized, submitted to, and maintained, shall then, thenceforward, and forever be free. Mr. Lincoln had given a confidential intimation of this step to Mr. Seward and Mr. Wells on the day following the border state interview. But to all the other members of the cabinet, it came as a complete surprise. Blair thought it would cost the administration the fall elections. Chase preferred that emancipation should be proclaimed by commanders in the several military districts. Seward, approving the measure, suggested that it be postponed until it could be given to the country supported by military success, instead of issuing it, as would be the case then, upon the greatest disasters of the war. Mr. Lincoln's recital continues. The wisdom of the view of the Secretary of State struck me with very great force. It was an aspect of the case that, in all my thought upon the subject, I had entirely overlooked. The result was that I put the draft of the proclamation aside, as you do your sketch for a picture, waiting for a victory. End of chapter 23. Recording by Elena Jordan. Chapter 24 of A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jude Cater A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln by John G. Nicolay Chapter 24 Criticism of the President for His Action on Slavery Lincoln's Letters to Louisiana Friends Greeley's Open Letter Mr. Lincoln's Reply Chicago Clergymen Urge Emancipation Lincoln's Answer Lincoln Issues Preliminary Proclamation President Proposes Constitutional Amendment Cabinet Considers Final Proclamation Cabinet Discusses Admission of West Virginia Lincoln Signs Edict of Freedom Lincoln's Letter to Hodges The secrets of the government were so well kept that no hint whatever came to the public that the President had submitted to the Cabinet the draft of an Emancipation Proclamation. 
Between that date and the Battle of the Second Bull Run intervened the period of a full month, during which, in the absence of military movements or congressional proceedings to furnish exciting news, both private individuals and public journals turned to a new and somewhat vindictive fire of criticism upon the administration. For this they seized upon the ever-ready text of the ubiquitous slavery question. Upon this issue the conservatives protested indignantly that the president had been too fast, while, contrarywise, the radicals clamored loudly that he had been altogether too slow. We have seen how his decision was unalterably taken, and his course distinctly marked out, but that he was not yet ready publicly to announce it. Therefore, during this period of waiting for victory, he underwent the difficult task of restraining the impatience of both sides, which he did in very positive language. Thus, under date of July 26, 1862, he wrote to a friend in Louisiana, Yours of the 16th, by the hand of Governor Shepley, is received. It seems the Union feeling in Louisiana is being crushed out by the course of General Phelps. Please pardon me for believing that this is a false pretense. The people of Louisiana, all intelligent people, everywhere, know full well that I never had a wish to touch the foundations of their society or any right of theirs. With perfect knowledge of this, they forced a necessity upon me to send armies among them, and it is their own fault, not mine, that they are annoyed by the presence of General Phelps. They also know the remedy know how to be cured of General Phelps. Remove the necessity of his presence. I am a patient man, always willing to forgive on the Christian terms of repentance, and also to give ample time for repentance. Still, I must save this government if possible. What I cannot do, of course, I will not do. But it may as well be understood once and for all that I shall not surrender this game, leaving any available card unplayed. Two days later, he answered another Louisiana critic. Mr. Durant complains that, in various ways, the relation of master and slave is disturbed by the presence of our army, and he considers it particularly vexatious that this, in part, is done under the cover of an act of Congress, while constitutional guarantees are suspended on the plea of military necessity. The truth is that what is done and omitted about slaves is done and omitted on the same military necessity. It is a military necessity to have men and money, and we can get neither in sufficient numbers or amounts if we keep from or drive from our lines slaves coming to them. Mr. Durant cannot be ignorant of the pressure in this direction nor of my efforts to hold it within bounds till he and such as he shall have time to help themselves. What would you do in my position? Would you drop the war where it is? Or would you prosecute it in future with elder stalk squirts charged with rosewater? Would you deal lighter blows rather than heavier ones? Would you give up the contest, leaving any available means unapplied? I am in no boastful mood. I shall not do more than I can, and I shall do all I can to save the government, which is my sworn duty as well as my personal inclination. I shall do nothing in malice. What I deal with is too vast for malicious dealing. The President could afford to overlook the misrepresentations and invective of the professedly opposition newspapers but he had also to meet the overzeal of influential Republican editors of strong anti-slavery bias. Horace Greeley printed, in the New York Tribune of August 20, a long open letter ostentatiously addressed to Mr. Lincoln, full of unjust censure, all based on the general accusation that the President and many Army officers as well were neglecting their duty under pro-slavery influences and sentiments. The open letter which Mr. Lincoln wrote in reply is remarkable not alone for the skill with which it separated the true from the false issue of the moment, but also for the equipoise and dignity with which it maintained his authority as moral arbiter between the contending factions. Executive Mansion, Washington, 
August 22, 1862. Honorable Horace Greeley. Dear Sir, I have just read years of the 19th, addressed to myself through the New York Tribune. If there be in it any statements or assumptions of fact which I may know to be erroneous, I do not, now and here, controvert them. If there be in it any inferences which I may believe to be falsely drawn, I do not, now and here, argue against them. If there be perceptible in it an impatience and dictatorial tone, I wave it in deference to an old friend whose heart I have always supposed to be right. As to the policy I seem to be pursuing, as you say, I have not meant to leave anyone in doubt. I would save the Union. I would save it in the shortest way under the Constitution. The sooner the national authority can be restored, the nearer the Union will be, the Union it was. If there be those who would not save the Union unless they could at the same time save slavery, I do not agree with them. If there be those who would not save the Union unless they could at the same time destroy slavery, I do not agree with them. My paramount object in this struggle is to save the Union, and it is not to either save or destroy slavery. If I could save the Union without freeing a slave, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing all the slaves, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing some and leaving others alone, I would also do that. What I do about slavery and the colored race, I do because I believe it helps to save the Union. And what I forbear, I forbear because I do not believe it would help to save the Union. I shall do less whenever I shall believe what I am doing hurts the cause, and I shall do more whenever I shall believe doing more will help the cause. I shall try to correct errors when shown to be errors, and I shall adopt new views so fast as they shall appear to be true views. I have here stated my purpose according to my view of official duty, and I intend no modification of my oft-expressed personal wish that all men everywhere could be free. Yours, A. Lincoln It can hardly be doubted that President Lincoln, when he wrote this letter, intended that it should have a twofold effect upon public opinion. First, that it should curb extreme anti-slavery sentiment to greater patience. Secondly, that it should rouse dogged pro-slavery conservatism and prepare it for the announcement which he had resolved to make at the first fitting opportunity. At the date of the letter, he very well knew that a serious conflict of arms was soon likely to occur in Virginia, and he had strong reason to hope that the junction of the armies of McClellan and Pope, which had been ordered and was then in progress, could be successfully effected, and would result in a decisive Union victory. This hope, however, was sadly disappointed. The Second Battle of Bull Run, which occurred one week after the Greeley letter, proved a serious defeat, and necessitated a further postponement of his contemplated action. As a secondary effect of the new disaster, there came upon him once more an increased pressure to make reprisal upon what was assumed to be the really vulnerable side of the rebellion. On September 13, he was visited by an influential deputation from the religious denominations of Chicago, urging him to issue at once a proclamation of universal emancipation. His reply to them, made in the language of the most perfect courtesy, nevertheless has in it a tone of rebuke that indicates the state of irritation and high sensitiveness under which he was living from day to day. In the actual condition of things, he could neither safely satisfy them nor deny them. As any answer he could make would be liable to misconstruction, he devoted the larger part of it to pointing out the unreasonableness of their dogmatic insistence. I am approached with the most opposite opinions and advice, and that by religious men who are equally certain that they represent the divine will. I am sure that either the one or the other class is mistaken in that belief, and perhaps, in some respects, both. 
I hope it will not be irreverent for me to say that if it is probable that God would reveal his will to others, on a point so connected with my duty, it might be supposed he would reveal it directly to me. What good would a proclamation of emancipation from me do, especially as we are now situated? I do not want to issue a document that the whole world will see must necessarily be inoperative, like the Pope's bull against the comet. Understand I raise no objections against it on legal or constitutional grounds, for, as commander-in-chief of the army and navy in time of war, I suppose I have a right to take any measure which may best subdue the enemy, nor do I urge objections of a moral nature in view of possible consequences of insurrection and massacre at the South. I view this matter as a practical war measure, to be decided on according to the advantages or disadvantages it may offer to the suppression of the rebellion. Do not misunderstand me because I have mentioned these objections. They indicate the difficulties that have thus far prevented my action in some such way as you desire. I have not decided against a proclamation of liberty to the slaves, but hold the matter under advisement. And I can assure you that the subject is on my mind, by day and night, more than any other. Whatever shall appear to be God's will, I will do. Four days after this interview, the Battle of Antietam was fought, and when, after a few days of uncertainty, it was ascertained that it could be reasonably claimed as a Union victory, the President resolved to carry out his long-matured purpose. The diary of Secretary Chase has recorded a very full report of the interesting transaction. On this ever-memorable September 22, 1862, after some playful preliminary talk, Mr. Lincoln said to his cabinet, Gentlemen, I have, as you are aware, thought a great deal about the relation of this war to slavery, and you all remember that, several weeks ago, I read to you an order I had prepared on this subject, which, on account of objections made by some of you, was not issued. Ever since then, my mind has been much occupied with this subject, and I have thought, all along, that the time for acting on it might probably come. I think the time has come now. I wish it was a better time. I wish that we were in a better condition. The action of the army against the rebels has not been quite what I should have best liked. But they have been driven out of Maryland, and Pennsylvania is no longer in danger of invasion. When the rebel army was at Frederick, I determined, as soon as it should be driven out of Maryland, to issue a proclamation of emancipation, such as I thought most likely to be useful. I said nothing to anyone. But I made the promise to myself and, hesitating a little, to my maker. The rebel army is now driven out, and I am going to fulfill that promise. I have got you together to hear what I have written down. I do not wish your advice about the main matter, for that I have determined for myself. This I say without intending anything but respect for any one of you. But I already know the views of each on this question. They have been heretofore expressed, and I have considered them as thoroughly and carefully as I can. What I have written is that which my reflections have determined me to say. If there is anything in the expressions I use, or in any minor matter which any of you thinks had best be changed, I shall be glad to receive the suggestions. One other observation I will make. I know very well that many others might, in this matter as in others, do better than I can. And if I was satisfied that the public confidence was more fully possessed by any one of them than by me, and knew of any constitutional way in which he could be put in my place, he should have it. I would gladly yield it to him. But though I believe that I have not so much of the confidence of the people as I had some time since, I do not know that, all things considered, any other person has more. And, however this may be, there is no way in which I can have any other man put where I am. I am here. I must do the best I can, and bear the responsibility of taking the course which I feel I ought to take. The members of the Cabinet all approve the policy of the measure, Mr. Blair only objecting that he thought the time inopportune, while others suggested some slight amendments. In the new form in which it was printed on the following morning, 
the document announced a renewal of the plan of compensated abolishment, a continuance of the effort at voluntary colonization, a promise to recommend ultimate compensation to loyal owners, and that on the first day of January, in the year of our Lord, 1,863, all persons held as slaves within any state, or designated part of a state, the people whereof shall then be in rebellion against the United States, shall be then, thenceforward, and forever free. And the executive government of the United States, including the military and naval authorities thereof, will recognize and maintain the freedom of such persons, and will do no act or acts to repress such persons, or any of them, in any efforts they may make for their actual freedom. Pursuant to these announcements, the President's annual message of December 1, 1862, recommended to Congress the passage of a joint resolution proposing to the legislatures of the several states a constitutional amendment consisting of three articles, namely, one providing compensation and bonds for every state which should abolish slavery before the year 1900, another securing freedom to all slaves who, during the rebellion, had enjoyed actual freedom by the chances of war, also providing compensation to legal owners, the third authorizing Congress to provide for colonization. The long and practical argument in which he renewed this plan, not in exclusion of, but additional to, all others for restoring and preserving the national authority throughout the Union, concluded with the following eloquent sentences. We can succeed only by concert. It is not, can any of us imagine better, but can we all do better, object whatsoever is possible. Still, the question recurs, can we do better? The dogmas of the quiet past are inadequate to the stormy present. The occasion is piled high with difficulty, and we must rise with the occasion. As our case is new, so we must think anew and act anew. We must disenthrall ourselves, and then we shall save our country. Fellow citizens, we cannot escape history. We, of this Congress and this administration, will be remembered in spite of ourselves. No personal significance or insignificance can spare one or another of us. The fiery trial through which we pass will light us down in honor or dishonor, to the latest generation. We say we are for the Union. The world will not forget that we say this. We know how to save the Union. The world knows we do know how to save it. We, even we here, hold the power and bear the responsibility. In giving freedom to the slave, we assure freedom to the free. Honorable alike in what we give and what we preserve. We shall nobly save, or meanly lose, the last best hope of earth. Other means may succeed. This could not fail. The way is plain, peaceful, generous, just. A way which, if followed, the world will forever applaud, and God must forever bless. But Mr. Lincoln was not encouraged by any response to this earnest appeal either from Congress or by manifestations of public opinion. Indeed, it may be fairly presumed that he expected none. Perhaps he considered it already a sufficient gain that it was silently accepted as another admonition of the consequences which not he nor his administration but the Civil War, with its relentless agencies, was rapidly bringing about. He was becoming more and more conscious of the silent influence of his official utterances on public sentiment, if not to convert obstinate opposition, at least to reconcile it to patient submission. In that faith he steadfastly went on carrying out his well-matured plan, the next important step of which was the fulfillment of the announcements made in the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation of September 22. On December 30, he presented to each member of his cabinet a copy of the draft he had carefully made of the new and final proclamation to be issued on New Year's Day. 
It will be remembered that as early as July 22, he informed the cabinet that the main question involved he had decided for himself. Now, as twice before, it was only upon minor points that he asked their advice and suggestion, for which object he placed these drafts in their hands for verbal and collateral criticism. In addition to the central point of military emancipation in all the states yet in rebellion, the President's draft for the first time announced his intention to incorporate a portion of the newly liberated slaves into the Army of the Union. This policy had also been under discussion at the first consideration of the subject in July. Mr. Lincoln had then already seriously considered it, but thought it inexpedient and productive of more evil than good at that date. In his judgment, the time had now arrived for energetically adopting it. On the following day, December 31, the members brought back to the cabinet meeting their several criticisms and suggestions on the draft he had given them. Perhaps the most important one was that earnestly pressed by Secretary Chase, that the new proclamation should make no exceptions of fractional parts of states controlled by the Union armies, as in Louisiana and Virginia, save the 48 counties of the latter designated as West Virginia, then in the process of formation and admission as a new state, the constitutionality of which, on this same December 31, was elaborately discussed in writing by members of the Cabinet and affirmatively decided by the President. On the afternoon of December 31, the Cabinet meeting being over, Mr. Lincoln once more carefully rewrote the proclamation, embodying in it the suggestions which had been made as to mere verbal improvements, but he rigidly adhered to his own draft in retaining the exceptions as to fractional parts of states and the 48 counties of West Virginia, and also his announcement of intention to enlist the freedmen in military service. Secretary Chase had submitted the form of a closing paragraph. This the President also adopted, but added to it, after the words, warranted by the Constitution, his own important qualifying correction, upon military necessity. The full text of the weighty document will be found in a footnote. It recited the announcement of the September Proclamation, defined its character and authority as a military decree, designated the states and parts of states that day in rebellion against the government, ordered and declared that all persons held as slaves therein are and henceforward shall be free, and that such persons of suitable condition would be received into the military service. And upon this act, sincerely believed to be an act of justice, warranted by the Constitution upon military necessity, I invoke the considerate judgment of mankind and the gracious favor of Almighty God. The conclusion of the momentous transaction was as deliberate and simple as had been its various stages of preparation. The morning and midday of January 1, 1863, were occupied by the half-social, half-official ceremonial of the usual New Year's Day reception at the Executive Mansion, established by long custom. At about three o'clock in the afternoon, after full three hours of greetings and handshakings, Mr. Lincoln and perhaps a dozen persons assembled in the Executive Office, and, without any prearranged ceremony, the President affixed his signature to the great Edict of Freedom. No better commentary will ever be written upon this far-reaching act than that which he himself embodied in a letter written to a friend a little more than a year later. I am naturally anti-slavery. If slavery is not wrong, nothing is wrong. I cannot remember when I did not so think and feel, and yet I have never understood that the Presidency conferred upon me an unrestricted right to act officially upon this judgment and feeling. It was in the oath I took that I would, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. I could not take the office without taking the oath, nor was it in my view that I might take an oath to get power and break the oath in using the power. I understood, too, that in ordinary civil administration, this oath even forbade me to practically indulge my primary abstract judgment on the moral question of slavery. 
I had publicly declared this many times and in many ways, and I aver that to this day. I have done no official act in mere deference to my abstract judgment and feeling on slavery. I did understand, however, that my oath to preserve the Constitution to the best of my ability imposed upon me the duty of preserving, by every indispensable means, that government, that nation, of which that Constitution was the organic law. Was it possible to lose the nation and yet preserve the Constitution? By general law, life and limb must be protected, yet often a limb must be amputated to save a life, but a life is never wisely given to save a limb. I felt that measures otherwise unconstitutional might become lawful by becoming indispensable to the preservation of the Constitution, through the preservation of the nation. Right or wrong, I assume this ground, and now avow it. I could not feel that, to the best of my ability, I had even tried to preserve the Constitution if, to save slavery or any minor matter, I should permit the wreck of government, country, and constitution altogether. When, early in the war, General Fremont attempted military emancipation, I forbade it, because I did not then think it an indispensable necessity. When, a little later, General Cameron, then Secretary of War, suggested the arming of the blacks, I objected because I did not yet think it an indispensable necessity. When, still later, General Hunter attempted military emancipation, I again forbade it, because I did not yet think the indispensable necessity had come. When in March and May and July 1862, I made earnest and successive appeals to the border states to favor compensated emancipation, I believed the indispensable necessity for military emancipation and arming the blacks would come unless averted by that measure. They declined the proposition, and I was, in my best judgment, driven to the alternative of either surrendering the Union and with it the Constitution, or of laying strong hand upon the colored element. I chose the latter. Footnote By the President of the United States of America, a proclamation. Whereas on the 22nd day of September, in the year of our Lord, 1,862, a proclamation was issued by the President of the United States, containing, among other things, the following. To wit, that on the first day of January, in the year of our Lord, 1,863, all persons held as slaves within any state or designated part of a state, the people whereof shall then be in rebellion against the United States, shall be then thenceforward and forever free. And the executive government of the United States, including the military and naval authority thereof, will recognize and maintain the freedom of such persons, and will do no act or acts to repress such persons, or any of them, in any efforts they make for their actual freedom. That the executive will, on the first day of January aforesaid, by proclamation, designate the states and parts of states, if any, in which the people thereof respectively shall then be in rebellion against the United States. And the fact that any state, or the people thereof, shall on that day be in good faith represented in the Congress of the United States by members chosen thereto, at elections wherein a majority of the qualified voters of such state shall have participated, shall, in the absence of strong countervailing testimony, be deemed conclusive evidence that such state, and the people thereof, are not then in rebellion against the United States. Now, therefore, I, Abraham Lincoln, President of the United States, by virtue of the power in me vested as Commander-in-Chief of the Army and Navy of the United States, in time of actual armed rebellion against the authority and government of the United States, and, as a fit and necessary war measure for suppressing said rebellion, do on this first day of January, 
in the year of our Lord, 1,863, and in accordance with my purpose so to do, publicly proclaimed for the full period of 100 days from the day first above mentioned, order and designate as the states and parts of states wherein the people thereof, respectively, are this day in rebellion against the United States, the following, to wit, Arkansas, Texas, Louisiana, except the parishes of St. Bernard, Plaquemines, Jefferson, St. John, St. Charles, St. James, Ascension, Assumption, Terbonne, La Fourche, St. Mary, St. Martin, and Orleans, including the city of New Orleans, Mississippi, Alabama, Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, and Virginia, except the 48 counties designated as West Virginia, and also the counties of Berkeley, Accomack, Northampton, Elizabeth City, York, Princess Anne, and Norfolk, including the cities of Norfolk and Portsmouth, and which accepted parts are for the present left precisely as if this proclamation were not issued. And by virtue of the power and for the purpose aforesaid, I do order and declare that all persons held as slaves within said designated states and parts of states are, and henceforward shall be, free, and that the executive government of the United States, including the military and naval authorities thereof, will recognize and maintain the freedom of said persons. And I hereby enjoin upon the people so declared to be free, to abstain from all violence, unless in necessary self-defense, and I recommend to them that, in all cases when allowed, they labor faithfully for reasonable wages. And I further declare and make known that such persons of suitable condition will be received into the armed service of the United States to garrison forts, positions, stations, and other places, and to man vessels of all sorts in said service. And upon this act, sincerely believed to be an act of justice, warranted by the Constitution upon military necessity, I invoke the considerate judgment of mankind and the gracious favor of Almighty God. In witness whereof, I have hereunto set my hand and caused the seal of the United States to be affixed. Done at the city of Washington, this first day of January, in the year of our Lord, 1863, and of the independence of the United States of America, the 87th. Abraham Lincoln By the President, William H. Seward, Secretary of State End of footnote End of chapter 24《Chapter 25 of A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Leader. A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln — Chapter 25 by John G. Nicolay Negro Soldiers — Fort Pillow — Retaliation Draft, Northern Democrats, Governor Seymour's Attitude, Draft Riots in New York, Vallandigham, Lincoln on his authority to suspend writ of habeas corpus, Knights of the Golden Circle, Jacob Thompson in Canada. On the subject of Negro soldiers, as on many other topics, the period of active rebellion and civil war had wrought a profound change in public opinion. From the foundation of the government to the rebellion, the horrible nightmare of a possible slave insurrection had brooded over the entire South. This feeling naturally had a sympathetic reflection in the North, and at first produced an instinctive shrinking from any thought of placing arms in the hands of the blacks whom the chances of war had given practical or legal freedom. During the year 1862, a few sporadic efforts were made by zealous individuals, 
under apparently favoring conditions, to begin the formation of colored regiments. The eccentric Senator Lane tried it in Kansas, or, rather, along the Missouri border, without success. General Hunter made an experiment in South Carolina, but found the freedmen too unwilling to enlist, and the white officers too prejudiced to instruct them. General Butler, at New Orleans, infused his wonted energy into a similar attempt, with somewhat better results. He found that before the capture of the city, Governor Moore of Louisiana had begun the organization of a regiment of free colored men for local defense. Butler resuscitated this organization for which he thus had the advantage of Confederate example and precedent, and against which the accusation of arming slaves could not be urged. Early in September, Butler reported, with his usual biting sarcasm, quote, I shall also have within ten days a regiment, one thousand strong, of native guards, colored, the darkest of whom will be about the complexion of the late Mr. Webster. End of quote. All these efforts were made under implied rather than expressed provisions of law, and encountered more or less embarrassment in obtaining pay and supplies, because they were not distinctly recognized in the army regulations. This could not well be done so long as the President considered the policy premature. His spirit of caution in this regard was set forth by the Secretary of War in a letter of instruction dated July 3, 1862. He is of opinion, wrote Mr. Stanton, that under the laws of Congress they, the former slaves, cannot be sent back to their masters, that in common humanity they must not be permitted to suffer for want of food, shelter, or other necessaries of life, that to this end they should be provided for by the quartermasters and commissaries' departments, and that those who are capable of labor should be set to work and paid reasonable wages. In directing this to be done, the President does not mean, at present, to settle any general rule in respect to slaves or slavery, but simply to provide for the particular case under the circumstances in which it is now presented. All this was changed by the final proclamation of emancipation, which authoritatively announced that persons of suitable condition, whom it declared free, would be received into the armed service of the United States. During the next few months, the President wrote several personal letters to General Dix, commanding at Fortress Monroe, to Andrew Johnson, military governor of Tennessee, to General Banks, commanding at New Orleans, and to General Hunter, in the Department of the South, urging their attention to promoting the new policy, and, what was yet more to the purpose, a bureau was created in the War Department having special charge of the duty, and the adjutant general of the army was personally sent to the Union camps on the Mississippi River to superintend the recruitment and enlistment of the Negroes, where, with the hearty cooperation of General Grant and other Union commanders, he met most encouraging and gratifying success. The Confederate authorities made a great outcry over the new departure. They could not fail to see the immense effect it was destined to have, and, the, and their prejudice of generations greatly intensified the gloomy apprehensions they no doubt honestly felt. Yet, even allowing for this, the exaggerated language in which they described it became ludicrous. The Confederate War Department early declared Generals Hunter and Phelps to be outlaws because they were drilling and organizing slaves and the sensational proclamation issued by Jefferson Davis on December 23, 1862, ordered that Butler and his commissioned officers, quote, robbers and criminals deserving death, be, whenever captured, reserved for execution, end of quote. Mr. Lincoln's final emancipation proclamation excited them to a still higher frenzy. The Confederate Senate talked of raising the black flag. Jefferson Davis's message stigmatized it as the most execrable measure recorded in the history of guilty man, and a joint resolution of the Confederate Congress prescribed that white officers of Negro Union soldiers 
shall, if captured, be put to death, or be otherwise punished at the discretion of the court. The general orders of some subordinate Confederate commanders repeated or rivaled such denunciations and threats. Fortunately, the records of the war are not stained with either excesses by the colored troops or even a single instance of such proclaimed barbarity upon white Union officers, and the visitation of vengeance upon Negro soldiers is confined, so far as known, to the single instance of the massacre at Fort Pillow. In that deplorable affair, the Confederate commander reported, by telegraph, that in thirty minutes he stormed a fort manned by seven hundred, and captured the entire garrison, killing five hundred, and taking one hundred prisoners, while he sustained a loss of only twenty killed and sixty wounded. It is unnecessary to explain that the bulk of the slain were colored soldiers. Making due allowance for the heat of battle, history can considerably veil closer scrutiny into the realities wrapped in the exaggerated boast of such a victory. The Fort Pillow incident, which occurred in the spring of 1864, brought upon President Lincoln the very serious question of enforcing an order of retaliation which had been issued on July 30, 1863, as an answer to the Confederate Joint Resolution of May 1. Mr. Lincoln's freedom from every trace of passion was as conspicuous in this as in all his official acts. In a little address at Baltimore, while referring to the rumor of the massacre which had just been received, Mr. Lincoln said, we do not today know that a colored soldier or white officer commanding colored soldiers has been massacred by the rebels when made a prisoner we fear it believe it i may say but we do not know it to take the life of one of their prisoners on the assumption that they murder ours when it is short of certainty that they do murder ours might be too serious too cruel a mistake when more authentic information arrived, the matter was very earnestly debated by the assembled cabinet, but the discussion only served to bring out in stronger light the inherent dangers of either course. In this nice balancing of weighty reasons, two influences decided the course of the government against retaliation. One was that General Grant was about to begin his memorable campaign against Richmond, and that it would be most impolitic to preface a great battle by the tragic spectacle of a military punishment, however justifiable. The second was the tender-hearted humanity of the ever-merciful President. Frederick Douglass has related the answer Mr. Lincoln made to him in a conversation nearly a year earlier. I shall never forget the benignant expression of his face, the tearful look of his eye, and the quiver in his voice when he deprecated a resort to retaliatory measures. Once begun, said he, I do not know where such a measure would stop. He said he could not take men out and kill them in cold blood for what was done by others. If he could get hold of the persons who were guilty of killing the colored prisoners in cold blood, the case would be different but he could not kill the innocent for the guilty. Amid the sanguinary reports and crowding events that held public attention for a year, from the wilderness to Appomattox, the Fort Pillow affair was forgotten, not only by the cabinet, but by the country. The related subjects of emancipation and Negro soldiers would doubtless have been discussed with much more passion and friction had not public thought been largely occupied during the year 1863 by the enactment of the conscription law and the enforcement of the draft. In the hard stress of politics and war during the years 1861 and 1862, the popular enthusiasm with which the free states responded to the President's call to put down the rebellion by force of arms had become measurably exhausted the heavy military reverses which attended the failure of mcclellan's campaign against richmond pope's defeat at the second bull run mcclellan's neglect to follow up the drawn battle of antietam with energetic operations the gradual change of early western victories to a cessation of all effort to open the mississippi 
and the scattering of the western forces to the spiritless routine of repairing and guarding long railroad lines all operated together practically to stop volunteering and enlistment by the end of 1862. Thus far the patriotic record was a glorious one. Almost 100,000, three months militia, had shouldered muskets to redress the fall of Fort Sumter. Over half a million, three years volunteers, promptly enlisted to form the first national army under the laws of Congress passed in August 1861. Nearly half a million more volunteers came forward under the tender of the governors of free states and the president's call of July 1862 to repair the failure of McClellan's Peninsula campaign. Several minor calls for shorter terms of enlistment, aggregating more than 40,000, are here omitted for brevity's sake. Had the Western victories continued, had the Mississippi been opened, had the Army of the Potomac been more fortunate, volunteering would doubtless have continued at quite or nearly the same rate. But with success delayed, with campaigns thwarted, with public sentiment despondent, armies ceased to fill. An emergency call for 300,000 nine-months men, issued on August 4, 1862, produced a total of only 86,860, and an attempt to supply these in some of the states by a draft under state laws demonstrated that mere local statutes and machinery for that form of military recruitment were defective and totally inadequate. With the beginning of the third year of the war, more energetic measures to fill the armies were seen to be necessary, and after very hot and acrimonious debate for about a month, Congress, on March 3, 1863, passed a national conscription law under which all male citizens between the ages of twenty and forty-five were enrolled to constitute the national forces, and the President was authorized to call them into service by draft as occasion might require. The law authorized the appointment of a provost marshal general, and under him a provost marshal, a commissioner, and a surgeon to constitute a board of enrollment in each congressional district who, with necessary deputies, were required to carry out the law by national authority, under the supervision of the Provost Marshal General. For more than a year past, the Democratic leaders in the northern states had assumed an attitude of violent partisanship against the administration, their hostility taking mainly the form of stubborn opposition to the anti-slavery enactments of Congress and the emancipation measures of the President. They charged with loud denunciation that he was converting the maintenance of the Union into a war for abolition, and with this and other clamors had gained considerable successes in the autumn congressional elections of 1862, though not enough to break the Republican majority in the House of Representatives. General McClellan was a Democrat, and, since his removal from command, they proclaimed him a martyr to this policy and were grooming him to be their coming presidential candidate. The passage of the conscription law afforded them a new pretext to assail the administration, and Democratic members of both houses of Congress denounced it with extravagant partisan bitterness as a violation of the Constitution and subversive of popular liberty. In the mouths of vindictive crossroads demagogues, and in the columns of irresponsible newspapers that supply the political reading among the more reckless elements of city populations, the extravagant language of Democratic leaders degenerated in many instances into unrestrained abuse and accusation. Yet, considering that this was the first conscription law ever enacted in the United States, considering the multitude of questions and difficulties attending its application, Considering that the necessity of its enforcement was, in the nature of things, unwelcome to the friends of the government, and as naturally excited all the enmity and cunning of its foes to impede, thwart, and evade it, the law was carried out with a remarkably small proportion of delay, obstruction, or resulting violence. Among a considerable number of individual violations of the Act, in which prompt punishment prevented a repetition, only two prominent incidents arose which had what may be called a national significance. In the state of New York, 
the partial political reaction of 1862 had caused the election of Horatio Seymour, a Democrat, as governor. A man of high character and great ability, he, nevertheless, permitted his partisan feeling to warp and color his executive functions to a dangerous extent. The spirit of his antagonism is shown in a phrase of his Fourth of July oration. Quote, the Democratic organization look upon this administration as hostile to their rights and liberties. They look upon their opponents as men who would do them wrong in regard to their most sacred franchises. End of quote. Believing, perhaps honestly, the conscription law to be unconstitutional, he endeavored by protest, argument, and administrative noncompliance to impede its execution on the plea of first demanding a Supreme Court decision as to its legality. To this, President Lincoln replied, quote, I cannot consent to suspend the draft in New York, as you request, because, among other reasons, time is too important. I do not object to abide a decision of the United States Supreme Court, or of the judges thereof, on the constitutionality of the draft law. In fact, I should be willing to facilitate the obtaining of it, but I cannot consent to lose the time while it is being obtained. We are contending with an enemy who, as I understand, drives every able-bodied man he can reach into his ranks, very much as a butcher drives bullocks into a slaughter pen. No time is wasted, no argument is used. This produces an army which will soon turn upon our now victorious soldiers already in the field if they shall not be sustained by recruits as they should be. End of quote. Notwithstanding Governor Seymour's neglect to give the enrolling officers any cooperation, preparations for the draft went on in New York City without prospect of serious disturbance, except the incendiary language of low newspapers and handbills. But scarcely had the wheel begun to turn, and the drawing commenced on July 13, when a sudden riot broke out. First demolishing the enrolling office, the crowd next attacked an adjoining block of stores, which they plundered and set on fire, refusing to let the firemen put out the flames. From this point the excitement and disorder spread over the city, which for three days was at many points subjected to the uncontrolled fury of the mob. Loud threats to destroy the New York Tribune office, which the inmates as vigorously prepared to defend, were made. The most savage brutality was wreaked upon colored people. The fine building of the colored orphan asylum, where several hundred children barely found means of escape, was plundered and set on fire. It was notable that foreigners of recent importation were the principal leaders and actors in this lawlessness, in which two million dollars' worth of property was destroyed, and several hundred persons lost their lives. The disturbance came to an end on the night of the fourth day, when a small detachment of soldiers met a body of rioters, and, firing into them, killed thirteen and wounded eighteen more. Governor Seymour gave but little help in the disorder, and left a stain on the record of his courage by addressing a portion of the mob as, My Friends. The opportune arrival of national troops restored, and thereafter maintained, quiet and safety. Some temporary disturbance occurred in Boston, but was promptly put down, and loud appeals came from Philadelphia and Chicago to stop the draft. The final effect of the conscription law was not so much to obtain recruits for the service as to stimulate local effort throughout the country to promote volunteering, whereby the number drafted was either greatly lessened or, in many localities, entirely avoided by filling the state quotas. The military arrest of Clement L. Vallandigham, a Democratic member of Congress from Ohio, for incendiary language denouncing the draft also grew to an important incident. Arrested and tried under the orders of General Burnside, a military commission found him guilty of having violated General Order No. 38 by, quote, declaring disloyal sentiments and opinions with the object and purpose of weakening the power of the government in its efforts to suppress an unlawful rebellion, end of quote, and sentenced him to military confinement during the war. 
Judge Levitt of the United States Circuit Court denied a writ of habeas corpus in the case. President Lincoln regretted the arrest, but felt it imprudent to annul the action of the general and the military tribunal. Conforming to a clause of Burnside's order, he modified the sentence by sending Vallandigham south beyond the Union military lines. The affair created a great sensation, and, in a spirit of party protest, the Ohio Democrats unanimously nominated Vallandigham for governor. Vallandigham went to Richmond, held a conference with the Confederate authorities, and, by way of Bermuda, went to Canada, from whence he issued a political address. The Democrats of both Ohio and New York took up the political and legal discussion with great heat and sent imposing committees to present long addresses to the President on the affair. Mr. Lincoln made long written replies to both addresses, of which only so much needs quoting here as concisely states his interpretation of his authority to suspend the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus. Quote, you ask, in substance, whether I really claim that I may override all the guaranteed rights of individuals on the plea of conserving the public safety, when I may choose to say the public safety requires it. This question, divested of the phraseology calculated to represent me as struggling for an arbitrary personal prerogative, is either simply a question, who shall decide, or an affirmation that nobody shall decide, what the public safety does require in cases of rebellion or invasion. The Constitution contemplates the question is likely to occur for decision, but it does not expressly declare who is to decide it. By necessary implication, when rebellion or invasion comes, the decision is to be made from time to time, and I think the man whom, for the time, the people have, under the Constitution, made the commander-in-chief of their army and navy, is the man who holds the power and bears the responsibility of making it. If he uses the power justly, the same people will probably justify him. If he abuses it, he is in their hands, to be dealt with by all the modes they have reserved to themselves in the Constitution. End of quote. Forcible and convincing as was this legal analysis, a single sympathetic phrase of the President's reply had a much greater popular effect. Quote, must I shoot a simple-minded soldier boy who deserts, while I must not touch a hair of a wily agitator who induces him to desert? End of quote. The term so accurately described the character of Vallandigham, and the pointed query so touched the hearts of the Union people throughout the land whose favorite soldier boys had volunteered to fill the Union armies, that it rendered powerless the crafty criticism of party diatribes. The response of the people of Ohio was emphatic. At the October election, Vallandigham was defeated by more than 100,000 majority. In sustaining the arrest of Vallandigham, President Lincoln had acted not only within his constitutional, but also strictly within his legal authority. In the preceding March, Congress had passed an act legalizing all orders of this character made by the President at any time during the rebellion, and accorded him full indemnity for all searches, seizures, and arrests or imprisonments made under his orders. The act also provided... Quote, that during the present rebellion, the President of the United States, whenever in his judgment the public safety may require it, is authorized to suspend the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus in any case throughout the United States or any part thereof. End of quote. About the middle of September, Mr. Lincoln's proclamation formally put the law in force to obviate any hindering or delaying the prompt execution of the draft law. Though Valindigam and the Democrats of his type were unable to prevent or even delay the draft, they yet managed to enlist the sympathies and secure the adhesion of many uneducated and unthinking men by means of secret societies known as Knights of the Golden Circle, the Order of American Knights, Order of the Star, Sons of Liberty, and by other equally high-sounding names, which they adopted and discarded in turn as one after the other was discovered and brought into undesired prominence. 
The titles and grips and passwords of these secret military organizations, the turgid eloquence of their meetings, and the clandestine drill of their oath-bound members, doubtless exercised quite as much fascination on such followers as their unlawful object of aiding and abetting the Southern cause. The number of men thus enlisted in the work of inducing desertion among Union soldiers, fomenting resistance to the draft, furnishing the Confederates with arms, and conspiring to establish a Northwestern Confederacy in full accord with the South, which formed the ultimate dream of their leaders, is hard to determine. Vallandigham, the real head of the movement, claimed 500,000, and Judge Holt, in an official report, adopted that as being somewhere near the truth, though others counted them at a full million. The government, cognizant of their existence, and able to produce abundant evidence against the ringleaders whenever it chose to do so, wisely paid little heed to these dark lantern proceedings, though, as was perhaps natural, military officers commanding the departments in which they were most numerous were inclined to look upon them more seriously. And Governor Morton of Indiana was much disquieted by their work in his state. Mr. Lincoln's attitude toward them was one of good-humored contempt. "'Nothing can make me believe that one hundred thousand Indiana Democrats are disloyal,' he said, and maintain that there was more folly than crime in their acts. Indeed, though prolific enough of oaths and treasonable utterances, these organizations were singularly lacking in energy and initiative.' Most of the attempts made against the public peace in the free states and along the northern border came, not from resident conspirators, but from southern emissaries and their Canadian sympathizers, and even these rarely rose above the level of ordinary arson and highway robbery. Jacob Thompson, who had been Secretary of the Interior under President Buchanan, was the principal agent of the Confederate government in Canada, where he carried on operations as remarkable for their impracticability as for their malignity. One plan during the summer of 1864 contemplated nothing less than seizing and holding the three great states of Illinois, Indiana, and Ohio with the aid of disloyal Democrats, whereupon it was supposed Missouri and Kentucky would quickly join them and make an end of the war. Becoming convinced, when this project fell through, that nothing could be expected from Northern Democrats, he placed his reliance on Canadian sympathizers, and turned his attention to liberating the Confederate prisoners confined on Johnson's Island in Sandusky Bay and at Camp Douglas near Chicago. But both these elaborate schemes, which embraced such magnificent details as capturing the war steamer Michigan on Lake Erie, came to naught nor did the plans to burn St. Louis and New York, and to destroy steamboats on the Mississippi River, to which he also gave his sanction, succeed much better. A very few men were tried and punished for these and similar crimes, despite the voluble protest of the Confederate government, but the injuries he and his agents were able to inflict, like the acts of the Knights of the Golden Circle on the American side of the border, amounted merely to a petty annoyance, and never reach the dignity of real menace to the government. End of chapter 25. Recording by John Leader, Bloomington, Illinois. Chapter 26 of A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Leader. A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln by John G. Nicolay. Chapter 26. Burnside. Fredericksburg. A Tangle of Cross Purposes. Hooker Succeeds Burnside. Lincoln to Hooker. Chancellorsville. Lee's Second Invasion. Lincoln's Criticisms of Hooker's Plans. Hooker Relieved. Meade. Gettysburg, Lee's Retreat, Lincoln's Letter to Meade, Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, Autumn Strategy, The Armies Go Into Winter Quarters. It was not without well-meditated reasons that Mr. Lincoln had so long kept McClellan in command of the Army of the Potomac. 
He perfectly understood that general's defects, his want of initiative, his hesitations, his delays, his never-ending complaints. But he had long foreseen the difficulty which would and did immediately arise when, on November 5, 1862, he removed him from command. Whom should he appoint as McClellan's successor? What officer would be willing and competent to play a better part? That important question had also long been considered. Several promising generals had been consulted, who, as gracefully as they could, shrank from the responsibility even before it was formally offered them. The President finally appointed General Ambrose E. Burnside to the command. He was a West Point graduate, thirty-eight years old, of handsome presence, brave and generous to a fault, and McClellan's intimate friend. He had won a favorable reputation in leading the expedition against Roanoke Island and the North Carolina coast, and, called to reinforce McClellan after the Peninsula disaster, commanded the left wing of the Army of the Potomac at Antietam. He was not covetous of the honor now given him. He had already twice declined it, and only now accepted the command as a duty under the urgent advice of members of his staff. His instincts were better than the judgment of his friends. A few brief weeks sufficed to demonstrate what he had told them, that he, quote, was not competent to command such a large army, end of quote. The very beginning of his work proved the truth of his self-criticism. Rejecting all the plans of campaign which were suggested to him, he found himself incapable of forming any very plausible or consistent one of his own. As a first move, he concentrated his army opposite the town of Fredericksburg on the lower Rappahannock, but with such delays that General Lee had time to seize and strongly fortify the town and the important adjacent heights on the south bank, and when Burnside's army crossed on December 11th and made its main and direct attack on the formidable and practically impregnable Confederate entrenchments on the 13th, a crushing repulse and defeat of the Union forces, with a loss of over 10,000 killed and wounded, was the quick and direful result. It was in a spirit of stubborn determination rather than clear, calculating courage that he renewed his orders for an attack on the 14th, but, dissuaded by his division and corps commanders from the rash experiment, succeeded without further damage in withdrawing his forces on the night of the 15th to their old camps north of the river. In manly words, his report of the unfortunate battle gave generous praise to his officers and men, and assumed for himself all the responsibility for the attack and its failure. But its secondary consequences soon became irremediable. By that gloomy disaster, Burnside almost completely lost the confidence of his officers and men, and rumors soon came to the President that a spirit akin to mutiny pervaded the army. When information came that, on the day after Christmas, Burnside was preparing for a new campaign, the President telegraphed him, quote, I have good reason for saying you must not make a general movement of the army without letting me know. End of quote. This naturally brought Burnside to the President for explanation, and, after a frank and full discussion between them, Mr. Lincoln, on New Year's Day, wrote the following letter to General Halleck, quote, General Burnside wishes to cross the Rappahannock with his army, but his grand division commanders all oppose the movement. If in such a difficulty as this you do not help, you fail me precisely in the point for which I sought your assistance. You know what General Burnside's plan is, and it is my wish that you go with him to the ground, examine it as far as practicable, confer with the officers, getting their judgment and ascertaining their temper. In a word, gather all the elements for forming a judgment of your own, and then tell General Burnside that you do approve or that you do not approve his plan. Your military skill is useless to me if you will not do this. End of quote. Halleck's moral and official courage, however, failed the President in this emergency. He declined to give his military opinion, and asked to be relieved from further duties as general-in-chief. This left Mr. Lincoln no option, and, still having need of the advice of his general-in-chief on other questions, he endorsed on his own letter, quote, 
withdrawn because considered harsh by General Halleck. End of quote. The complication, however, continued to grow worse, and the correspondence more strained. Burnside declared that the country had lost confidence in both the Secretary of War and the General-in-Chief. Also, that his own generals were unanimously opposed to again crossing the Rappahannock. Halleck, on the contrary, urged another crossing, but that it must be made on Burnside's own decision, plan, and responsibility. Upon this, the President, on January 8, 1863, again wrote Burnside, quote, I understand General Halleck has sent you a letter of which this is a copy. I approve this letter. I deplore the want of concurrence with you in opinion by your general officers, but I do not see the remedy. Be cautious, and do not understand that the government or country is driving you. I do not yet see how I could profit by changing the command of the Army of the Potomac, and if I did, I should not wish to do it by accepting the resignation of your commission. Once more Burnside issued orders against which his generals protested, and which a storm turned into the fruitless and impossible mud march before he reached the intended crossings of the Rappahannock. Finally, on January 23rd, Burnside presented to the President the alternative of either approving an order dismissing about a dozen generals, or accepting his own resignation, and Mr. Lincoln once more had before him the difficult task of finding a new commander for the Army of the Potomac. On January 25th, 1863, the President relieved Burnside and assigned Major General Joseph Hooker to duty as his successor and in explanation of his action wrote him the following characteristic letter. Quote, I have placed you at the head of the Army of the Potomac. Of course I have done this upon what appear to me to be sufficient reasons, and yet I think it best for you to know that there are some things in regard to which I am not quite satisfied with you. I believe you to be a brave and skillful soldier, which, of course, I like. I also believe you do not mix politics with your profession, in which you are right. You have confidence in yourself, which is a valuable, if not an indispensable, quality. You are ambitious, which, within reasonable bounds, does good rather than harm. But I think that during General Burnside's command of the army you have taken counsel of your ambition, and thwarted him as much as you could, in which you did a great wrong to the country and to a most meritorious and honorable brother officer. I have heard, in such a way as to believe it, of your recently saying that both the army and the government needed a dictator. Of course it was not for this, but in spite of it, that I have given you the command. Only those generals who gain successes can set up dictators. What I now ask of you is military success, and I will risk the dictatorship. The government will support you to the utmost of its ability, which is neither more nor less than it has done and will do for all commanders. I much fear that the spirit which you have aided to infuse into the army, of criticizing their commander and withholding confidence from him, will now turn upon you. I shall assist you as far as I can to put it down. Neither you, nor Napoleon, if he were alive again, could get any good out of an army while such a spirit prevails in it and now beware of rashness. Beware of rashness, but with energy and sleepless vigilance go forward and give us victories. End of quote. Perhaps the most remarkable thing in this letter is the evidence it gives how completely the genius of President Lincoln had by this, the middle of his presidential term, risen to the full height of his great national duties and responsibilities. From beginning to end it speaks the language and breathes the spirit of the great ruler, secure in popular confidence and official authority, equal to the great emergencies that successively rose before him. Upon General Hooker, its courteous praise and frank rebuke, its generous trust and distinct note of fatherly warning, made a profound impression. He strove worthily to redeem his past indiscretions by devoting himself with great zeal and energy to improving the discipline and morale of his army, recalling its absentees, and restoring its spirit by increased drill and renewed activity. He kept the President well informed of what he was doing, and early in April submitted a plan of campaign on which Mr. Lincoln endorsed, 
on the 11th of that month. Quote, My opinion is that just now, with the enemy directly ahead of us, there is no eligible route for us into Richmond, and consequently a question of preference between the Rappahannock route and the James River route is a contest about nothing. Hence our prime object is the enemy's army in front of us, and is not with or about Richmond at all, unless it be incidental to the main object. End of quote. Having raised his effective force to about 130,000 men, and learning that Lee's army was weakened by detachments to perhaps half that number, Hooker, near the end of the month, prepared and executed a bold movement which, for a while, was attended with encouraging progress. Sending General Sedgwick with three army corps to make a strong demonstration and crossing below Fredericksburg, Hooker, with his remaining four corps, made a somewhat long and circuitous march by which he crossed both the Rappahannock and the Rapidan, above the town without serious opposition, and on the evening of April 30th had his four corps at Chancellorsville, south of the Rappahannock, from whence he could advance against the rear of the enemy. But his advantage of position was neutralized by the difficulties of the ground. He was in the dense and tangled forest known as the Wilderness, and the decision and energy of his brilliant and successful advance were suddenly succeeded by a spirit of hesitation and delay in which the evident and acknowledged chances of victory were gradually lost. The enemy found time to rally from his surprise and astonishment, to gather a strong line of defense, and finally to organize a counterflank movement under Stonewall Jackson, which fell upon the rear of the Union right and created a panic in the Eleventh Corps. Sedgwick's force had crossed below and taken Fredericksburg, but the divided Union army could not effect a junction, and the fighting from May 1 to May 4 finally ended by the withdrawal of both sections of the Union army north of the Rappahannock. The losses suffered by the Union and the Confederate forces were about equal, but the prestige of another brilliant victory fell to General Lee, seriously balanced, however, by the death of Stonewall Jackson, who was accidentally killed by the fire of his own men. In the addition of his evident very unusual diminution of vigor and will, Hooker had received a personal injury on the third, which, which for some hours rendered him incapable of command, and he said in his testimony before the Committee on the Conduct of the War, quote, When I returned from Chancellorsville, I felt that I had fought no battle. In fact, I had more men than I could use, and I fought no general battle for the reason that I could not get my men in position to do so, probably not more than three or three and a half corps on the right were engaged in the fight. End of quote. Hooker's defeat at Chancellorsville had not been so great a disaster as that of Burnside at Fredericksburg, and while his influence was greatly impaired, his usefulness did not immediately cease. The President and Secretary of War still had faith in him. The average opinion of his qualities has been tersely expressed by one of his critics, who wrote, As an inferior, he planned badly and fought well. As a chief, he planned well and fought badly. The course of war soon changed, so that he was obliged to follow, rather than permitted to lead the developments of a new campaign. The brilliant victories gained by Lee inspired the Confederate authorities and leaders with a greatly exaggerated hope of the ultimate success of the rebellion. It was during the summer of 1863 that the Confederate armies reached, perhaps, their highest numerical strength and greatest degree of efficiency. Both the long-dreamed-of possibility of achieving Southern independence and the newly flushed military ardor of officers and men, elated by what seemed to them an unbroken record of successes on the Virginia battlefields, moved General Lee to the bold hazard of a second invasion of the North. Early in June, Hooker gave it as his opinion that Lee intended to move against Washington, and asked whether in that case he should attack the Confederate rear. To this Lincoln answered on the 5th of that month, quote, in case you find Lee coming to the north of the Rappahannock, I would by no means cross to the south of it. If he should leave a rear force at Fredericksburg tempting you to fall upon it, it would fight in entrenchments and have you at disadvantage, and so, man for man, worst you at that point. 
while his main force would in some way be getting an advantage of you northward. In one word, I would not take any risk of being entangled upon the river, like an ox jumped half over a fence and liable to be torn by dogs front and rear, without a fair chance to gore one way or kick the other. End of quote. Five days later, Hooker, having become convinced that a large part of Lee's army was in motion toward the Shenandoah Valley, proposed the daring plan of a quick and direct march to capture Richmond. But the President immediately telegraphed him a convincing objection. Quote, if left to me, I would not go south to the Rappahannock upon Lee's moving north of it. If you had Richmond invested today, you would not be able to take it in twenty days. Meanwhile, your communications, and with them your army, would be ruined. I think Lee's army, and not Richmond, is your true objective point. If he comes toward the upper Potomac, follow on his flank and on his inside track, shortening your lines while he lengthens his. Fight him, too, when opportunity offers. If he stays where he is, fret him and fret him. End of quote. The movement north of Lee's army, effectually masked for some days by frequent cavalry skirmishes, now became evident to the Washington authorities. On June 14, Lincoln telegraphed Hooker, quote, So far as we can make out here, the enemy have Milroy surrounded at Winchester and Tyler at Martinsburg. If they could hold out a few days, could you help them? If the head of Lee's army is at Martinsburg, and the tail of it on the plank road between Fredericksburg and Chancellorsville, the animal must be very slim somewhere. Could you not break him? End of quote. While Lee, without halting, crossed the Potomac above Harper's Ferry, and continued his northward march into Maryland and Pennsylvania, Hooker prudently followed on the inside track, as Mr. Lincoln had suggested, interposing the Union Army effectually to guard Washington and Baltimore. But at this point a long-standing irritation and jealousy between Hooker and Halleck became so acute that on the General-in-Chief's refusing a comparatively minor request, Hooker asked to be relieved from command. The President, deeming divided counsel at so critical a juncture more hazardous than a change of command, took Hooker at his word, and appointed General George G. Meade as his successor. Meade had, since Chancellorsville, been as caustic a critic of Hooker as Hooker was of Burnside at and after Fredericksburg. But all spirit of insubordination vanished in the exciting stress of a pursuing campaign, and the new and retiring leaders of the Army of the Potomac exchanged compliments and general orders with high chivalric courtesy while the army continued its northward march with undiminished ardor and unbroken step. When Meade crossed the Pennsylvania line, Lee was already far ahead, threatening Harrisburg. The Confederate invasion spread terror and loss among farms and villages, and created almost a panic in the great cities. Under the President's call for 100,000 six-months militia, six of the adjoining states were sending hurried and improvised forces to the banks of the Susquehanna, under the command of General Couch. Lee, finding that stream too well guarded, turned his course directly east, which, with Meade marching to the north, brought the opposing armies into inevitable contact and collision at the town of Gettysburg. Meade had both expected and carefully prepared to receive the attack and fight a defensive battle on the line of Pipe Creek. But when, on the afternoon of July 1, 1863, the advanced detachments of each army met and engaged in a fierce conflict for the possession of the town, Meade, on learning the nature of the fight and the situation of the ground, instantly decided to accept it, and, ordering forward his whole force, made it the principal and most decisive battlefield of the whole war. The Union troops made a violent and stubborn effort to hold the town of Gettysburg, but the early Confederate arrivals, taking position in a half-circle on the west, north, and east, drove them through and out of it. The seeming reverse proved an advantage. Half a mile to the south, it enabled the Union detachments to seize and establish themselves on Cemetery Ridge and Hill. This, with several rocky elevations, and a crest of boulders making a curve to the east at the northern end, was in itself almost a natural fortress, 
and with the entrenchments thrown up by the expert veterans, soon became nearly impregnable. Beyond a wide valley to the west, and parallel with it, lay Seminary Ridge, on which the Confederate Army established itself with equal rapidity. Lee had also hoped to fight a defensive battle, but thus suddenly arrested in his eastward march in a hostile country, could not afford to stand still and wait. On the morning of July 2, both commanding generals were in the field. After careful studies and consultations, Lee ordered an attack on both the extreme right and extreme left of the Union position, meeting some success in the former, but a complete repulse in the latter. That night, Meade's council of war, coinciding with his own judgment, resolved to stand and fight it out, while Lee, against the advice of Longstreet, his ablest general, with equal decision determined to risk the chance of a final and determined attack. It was Meade who began the conflict at dawn on the morning of July 3, but only long enough to retake and hold the entrenchments on his extreme right, which he had lost the evening before. Then, for some hours, an ominous lull and silence fell over the whole battlefield. But these were hours of stern preparation. At midday, a furious cannonade began from 130 Confederate guns on Seminary Ridge, which was answered with promptness and spirit by about 70 Union guns from the crests and among the boulders of Cemetery Ridge, and the deafening roar of artillery lasted for about an hour, at the end of which time the Union guns ceased firing and were allowed to cool, and to be made ready to meet the assault that was sure to come. There followed a period of waiting almost painful to officers and men in its intense expectancy, and then, across the broad, undulating, and highly cultivated valley, swept the long attacking line of seventeen thousand rebel infantry, the very flower of the Confederate army. But it was a hopeless charge. Thinned, almost mowed down by the grape-shot of the Union batteries and the deadly aim of the Union riflemen behind their rocks and entrenchments, the Confederate assault wavered, hesitated, struggled on, and finally melted away before the destructive fire. A few rebel battle-flags reached the crest, only, however, to fall, and their bearers and supporters to be made prisoners. The Confederate dream of taking Philadelphia and dictating peace and separation in Independence Hall was over forever. It is doubtful whether Lee immediately realized the full measure of his defeat, or meed the magnitude of his victory. The terrible losses of the Battle of Gettysburg, over 3,000 killed, 14,000 wounded, and 5,000 captured or missing of the Union Army, and 2,600 killed, 12,000 wounded, and 5,000 missing of the Confederates, largely occupied the thoughts and labors of both sides during the national holiday which followed. It was a surprise to Meade that on the morning of July 5 the Confederate Army had disappeared retreating as rapidly as might be to the neighborhood of Harper's Ferry. Unable immediately to cross because the Potomac was swollen by heavy rains, and Meade, having followed and arrived in Lee's front on July 10, President Lincoln had the liveliest hopes that Meade would again attack and capture or destroy the Confederate Army. Generous praise for his victory, and repeated and urgent suggestions to renew his attack and end the rebellion, had gone to Meade from the President and General Halleck. But Meade hesitated, and his council of war objected, and on the night of July 13 Lee recrossed the Potomac in retreat. When he heard the news, Mr. Lincoln sat down and wrote a letter of criticism and disappointment, which reflects the intensity of his feeling at the escape of Lee. Quote, the case, summarily stated, is this. You fought and beat the enemy at Gettysburg, and of course, to say the least, his loss was as great as yours. He retreated, and you did not, as it seemed to me, pressingly pursue him. But a flood in the river detained him till, by slow degrees, you were again upon him. You had at least twenty thousand veteran troops directly with you, and as many more raw ones within supporting distance, all in addition to those who fought with you at Gettysburg while it was not possible that he had received a single recruit, and yet you stood and let the flood run down, bridges be built, and the enemy move away at his leisure without attacking him. 
Again, my dear general, I do not believe you appreciate the magnitude of the misfortune involved in Lee's escape. He was within your easy grasp, and to have closed upon him would, in connection with our other late successes, have ended the war. As it is, the war will be prolonged indefinitely. If you could not safely attack Lee last Monday, how can you possibly do so south of the river, when you can take with you very few more than two-thirds of the force you then had in hand? It would be unreasonable to expect, and I do not expect, that you can now effect much. Your golden opportunity is gone, and I am distressed immeasurably because of it. End of quote. Clearly as Mr. Lincoln had sketched, and deeply as he felt Meade's fault of omission, so quick was the President's spirit of forgiveness, and so thankful was he for the measure of success which had been gained, that he never signed or sent the letter. Two memorable events are forever linked with the Gettysburg victory. The surrender of Vicksburg to Grant on the same 4th of July, described in the next chapter, and the dedication of the Gettysburg battlefield as a national cemetery for Union soldiers on November 19, 1863, on which occasion President Lincoln crowned that imposing ceremonial with an address of such literary force, brevity, and beauty that critics have assigned it a high rank among the world's historic orations. He said, Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation, or any nation so conceived and so dedicated, can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Having safely crossed the Potomac, the Confederate army continued its retreat without halting to the familiar camps in central Virginia it had so long and valiantly defended. Meade followed with alert but prudent vigilance, but did not again find such chances as he lost on the 4th of July, or while the swollen waters of the Potomac held his enemy as in a trap. During the ensuing autumn months there went on between the opposing generals an unceasing game of strategy, a succession of moves and counter-moves in which the opposing commanders handled their great armies with the same consummate skill with which the expert fencing-master uses his foil, but in which neither could break through the other's guard. Repeated minor encounters took place which, in other wars, would have rated as heavy battles. But the weeks lengthened into months without decisive results, and when the opposing armies finally went into winter quarters in December 1863, they again confronted each other across the Rapidan in Virginia, not very far south of where they lay in the winter of 1861. End of chapter 26 Recording by John Leader, Bloomington, Illinois.